We are introduced to Song Jai Zion. She is on a plane that is crashing. Song Jai Zion really does not want to die as she has only started to create a better life for herself. She is a top surgeon who is a genius that is respected all over the world. We see that at her work she is always the best surgeon to call if there is an emergency during an operation. All her colleagues admire her as she is a true prodigy. But Song Jai Zion has a massive secret. While in the present she is a genius surgeon, she actually has a very complex past. Hundreds of years ago she was Alistair Rowland, a part of the royal family. As Alice she committed a great crime against her people and was sentenced to death. This sentence was to be carried out by Alice being burned alive. Alice lived a very comfortable life with her royal family and she had everything. For some reason Alice managed to retain her memories in her new life and now as Song Jai Zion she is trying to redeem herself. That is the main reason Song does not want to die in this current plane crash. She is not yet ready to leave this world as she is only now starting to fix her mistakes. The plane starts to catch on fire as it falls to the ground. Suddenly Song wakes up in a totally different place. She is in a familiar room, wearing a formal dress. Suddenly a maid arrives at her door. Song also looks totally different. She looks like she did when she was Alistair Rowland. Song has now once again returned to her previous life. She is now again Alistair Rowland. This time she is a lot younger so she still did not commit that grave crime. Her maids are all scared of her as she has always been terrified. Alice remembers how she was in this life. She was cruel to the maids and all of them called her the female monster. Still now Alice is young enough to change her ways and fix her reality. She has flashes of a horrible memory. It seems to be her great crime. She remembers her injured father begging for mercy. Ten days pass since Alice has returned to her royal life in the past. She has been getting used to her old home and old life. Alice still feels pretty strange being back at her old home and living that royal life. She is certain that this is her true second chance and she decides to truly change and not commit the same mistakes as she did before. Alice talks to her maid called Mary and asks her about the punishment being over. The past 10 days Alice has been grounded because of something naughty she did. Alice does not remember what she did but she knows that she was always a troublemaker. Mary informs Alice that tonight her father, stepmother and her brothers will have a formal dinner and they want her to be there. Only the first prince will not attend as he is busy doing his work as a knight of the royal guard. Alice enters the dining hall and there she spots her family. It has been many years since she last saw them. Alice gets emotional and starts crying. These are tears of joy. She is hugged by her brother called Grace. Grace is the second son of the royal family. He scolds his father for punishing Alice for 10 days. Alice apologizes to her family and thanks them for always being there for her. Alice is really happy that she is reunited with her family and she also knows that she has not yet committed that great crime. She wants to change that this time around. The following morning Alice is talking with Mary. She decides to help Mary with the chores around the house. Mary is totally surprised as Alice never acted like this before. Still the night before Alice also apologized to the maids for being cruel in the past. She also offered to help Hans and his sick mother. While some think that Alice is not right in her mind, Mary thinks that Alice has truly changed for the better. Alice decides to do some work as she gets used to her old life. That same day she goes to visit her father while he works. Alice brings him tea and greets him with a smile. Her father is still getting used to her new personality, and he does not know what to do. Still Alice makes amazing tea and he is just happy to be sharing time with his daughter. Alice then remembers her new life that she had after originally dying. She was an orphan and everyone disliked her. She had all the best grades but she wanted to spend time with her family from the past. Now she has that second chance. Alice then goes to do some research about the timeline. She has another 10 years until she is executed and now she has to change the timeline but first she must remember all the major events. During an event called the Klin Expedition her second brother dies. Then the Klin War starts and multiple kingdoms get dragged into the conflict. After some time during the war infection starts to hit the kingdom. Her stepmother died soon after that from the sickness. Soon after her father and brother are all executed. Alice basically loses everything. Alice decides that she will have to use her medical knowledge to try and save her family and the kingdom from the sickness. Suddenly Alice also remembers a giant event coming up. She is to be engaged to Prince Link in two months. Alice starts to panic as the engagement is coming up. She remembers that after the engagement is announced things turn for the worse. She feels guilty for causing so much pain to Prince Link in the original timeline. While she is in love with him she does not want to hurt him or her family. During a family dinner, the first son joins the table. His name is Lan and he decides to speak up against the engagement. 
Len is very cold and he often has a lot of harsh words for Alice. This time Len talks to his father and tells him that Alice is not ready to be an empress and she should not marry Prince Link as she is still immature and childish. Len thinks that Prince Link is too mature for Alice and that they will not be a good match at all. Grace tries to calm down his brother as he is being too harsh to Alice. Everyone at the table thinks that Alice will get into an argument with Len but she just smiles. Alice remembers that in her original life she hated when Len criticized her but now she understands him. She also thinks that she is not ready. For that reason Alice also decides to stop the engagement by any means necessary. Len goes back to the battlefield as he has a lot of obligations towards the other knights. Before he leaves he talks with Grace and orders him to take care of the family. Grace tries to explain that Alice is now totally different but Len does not believe it at all. Alice decides that she will personally meet with the Emperor and try to break the engagement. This is the only way to save herself and the Prince as well. Alice will meet with the Emperor in just three days so she has to be ready. Mary is concerned with her dress while Alice focuses on what she will say to the Emperor. Alice is not really worried about dressing fancy. She wants to create the perfect speech for the Emperor so that she can break off the engagement. Mary shows Alice many dresses and Alice cannot choose any. In her life as a surgeon she did not care about fashion at all so now she feels strange wearing strange dresses. After an hour Alice decides to switch her style. She picks a more simple dress that even surprises Mary. Alice also does not wear a lot of makeup as she does not want to be overly flashy. Mary is impressed with how beautiful Alice looks. Suddenly her father arrives and he is totally amazed at his daughter. She looks mature and sophisticated. Soon after they travel to meet the Emperor. When they arrive at the palace Alice remembers her life there. She was originally the Empress for six years and everything was ruined pretty quickly. She only cared about the palace and her rich life. Now Alice is totally different and she truly wants to change things. Her father is worried and he tells her that if she is too scared they can leave. Alice is brave and she wants to move forward with her plan. Alice and her father will soon meet with the Emperor. Her father is a bit nervous but he trusts his daughter. Alice on the other hand is preparing for a bold move. She knows that she will surely disappoint her father and the Emperor, but this is the best decision for all. She must break off her engagement to the prince. Finally Alice and her father arrive at the palace and they are informed that the Emperor is waiting for them in the Rose Garden. When they arrive in the garden Alice spots the Emperor. He is sitting there among the flowers, reading his favorite book. The Emperor greets both of them with a warm smile. He is very happy to see Alice and her father. Alice then remembers that in her original life the Emperor was exactly the same, a kind and gentle person. When she first arrived to live in this palace he was always there to help her with a kind word or advice. Then soon after he died, Alice was on his deathbed and he made her promise to be a good empress. Alice failed that mission the first time but now she wants to redeem herself. Alice also remembers that the Emperor died from a chronic illness so she thinks about possibly healing him this time so that he does not die. Alice notices that the Emperor is tired. It's obvious to a trained eye that the Emperor is already suffering from his illness. Alice thinks about the first time he fell ill and she thinks about a possible solution. She just needs to find out what this illness is exactly. The Emperor spends some time with Alice and her father. He learns about her making a great tea so Alice also makes him a cup. Finally Alice tries to find her courage and tell the Emperor what is on her mind. At that moment Prince Linden arrives and it ruins the entire plan that Alice had. Prince Linden has arrived to talk with his father. Alice greets him and she thinks about him in the original timeline. She was crazy in love with him, with his cold gaze and his entire persona. He did not feel the same at all. When they married Alice tried to be the perfect wife. She tried to make him tea but Prince Linden was cold towards her. He told her that he only married her because that is what his father ordered. Alice was so furious, she wanted to make the prince love her any way possible. Now things are different, Alice does not feel that flutter in her heart. She is indifferent to the prince and she knows that they must never marry as they are not a good fit at all. Prince Linden informs his father that he had important meetings with the war council. It's revealed that the prince and the emperor are involved in a very difficult war. They have a lot of planning to do as the war is getting more intense every day. Alice is there to hear their conversation about the army numbers and the battle strategy. Alice remembers how horrible the war was in the original timeline. Her brother Chris died in the war and also all the attempts by the Empire failed. She is now much smarter and knows that the war has to be stopped before it starts to become very bad. The Emperor notices that Alice is there and he asks for her opinion. Alice is at first nervous but she finally speaks up as this might be her chance to save some life. 
she would like to save the life of her brother Chris and many other innocent soldiers. Alice finally tells the Emperor that the war has two major problems. The first one is the Monsell Kingdom on the east. Alice explains that while at this moment this kingdom has no reason to enter the war at some point they will. The current leader is a count called Agrant and his rule is not yet certain. This Count Agrant will try to win over favor and join with the other kingdoms that are at war with the Empire. The Emperor finds this theory very interesting and Prince Linden has noticed that Alice has crazy knowledge about the war. He still thinks that her theory is not good enough as the Monsell Kingdom does not have enough soldiers to be a problem. That is when Alice reveals the second problem. What if soldiers are not that important in battle? What if the Monsell Kingdom has another way of winning the war? Alice then reveals a really important part of her presentation. The war will fail because of the locations of the battles. The Monsell Kingdom could easily use a very different approach from a side that the Empire would not expect. If the Empire sends in their expedition of soldiers and the Monsell Kingdom cuts them off from their supplies all those soldiers could die. The Monsell Kingdom has access to unknown terrain in the forest area, and they could use a different path of attack. The Emperor is totally impressed, he never expected Alice to have so much strategic knowledge. He is impressed that she is able to know the politics of the other countries as well as their army plans. He orders that a special meeting is organized where they will talk about this information. He tells Prince Linden to get ready and to use all this information that Alice revealed in the next meeting. The Emperor notices that Alice is now totally different, she is no longer that little girl he remembered. Alice then reveals that there is another giant problem in this war plan. The Emperor is very curious as he wants to know her ideas. Alice then reveals that sickness and disease could cause massive problems for the war effort. The soldiers would be going in a very different environment where the climate is extreme. This could cause illness and could render the soldiers totally useless and sick. Alice says this from experience, in the original timeline this is what happened. All the soldiers got sick and died very shortly after. Alice comes up with a few solutions to this problem. The soldiers would need to carry extra medical supplies and also focus on personal hygiene. Alice is aware that not washing your hands and following basic hygienic advice can develop into illness further down the road. The Emperor is very impressed and he tells Alice that they will use all of this information. And if this information turns out to be true Alice will get a medal. Alice then reveals that she has brought a gift to the Emperor. By accident the Emperor reveals some of the symptoms of his illness. Soon Alice starts to analyze his symptoms and asks questions. Very quickly she realizes what his illness is, the Emperor has diabetes. It's such a simple illness and because it was not treated the Emperor died. The Emperor is surprised and he cannot believe all the knowledge that Alice has. She reveals that lately she has been reading a lot of interesting books. Soon she tells the Emperor about his illness. She reveals that he has too much sugar in his blood and he has to control that. The Emperor takes her very seriously and tells her that he will talk with his doctor. Alice is happy because it seems that she has solved many problems. Still she has to tell the Emperor that she will not marry his son in the future. Finally Alice finds her courage and reveals the truth. She tells the Emperor and her father that she will not be able to marry the prince. Everyone at the table is surprised by this. Her father is furious and he wants to know why she is doing this. Alice explains that she is not fit to be an empress. She is still too young and she could ruin the entire empire. That is why she does not want to marry the prince, he deserves someone capable. The emperor likes her honesty and admires Alice. He tells Alice that he is very proud of her and that today she proved that in the future she could be a great empress. Alice did not expect this, the emperor is not only calm but he is proud of her. Then finally time comes for Alice to reveal the truth, there is another reason she does not want to marry the prince. The emperor is once again curious and that is when Alice reveals that she cannot be an empress because she wants to become a doctor. Her father once more loses his mind but the emperor is very interested. He thinks that this journey will be difficult but he will allow Alice to become a doctor but only if she accepts a bet with him. Alice is confused but still she might have a chance to become a doctor in the future. The Emperor wants to make a bet with Alice. Alice is a bit confused by this but she is willing to accept anything if it means she will be a doctor in the future. The Emperor is very impressed with the fact that she has interest in being a doctor. He asks her father if he knew anything about her dreams. The father confirms that he knew nothing about Alice and her plans. The Emperor then tells Alice that being a doctor is a very challenging profession and he asks her if she knows what it will include. Alice just nods her head. She knows that she cannot reveal the truth to the Emperor. She not only knows what being a doctor means but she is top in her field. She could literally change the world with her doctor skills. Alice has 30 years of experience in being a top-level surgeon. She is probably the best doctor in this new timeline at this moment. 
The Emperor then asks Alice if this is the reason she has been reading all those medical books. Alice confirms that this was the reason and she also tells the Emperor that she is well aware of the fact that being a doctor is hard. Also she tells the Emperor that there are no laws in the land that stop women from being a doctor. Alice thinks that she has the right to follow her dreams. Alice actually brings up the daughter of a famous leader, his daughter became a doctor as well. The Emperor then has more questions for Alice. He wants to know if she is confident that she can truly pass the doctor's test. The emperor reveals that to become a doctor it's not an easy process. One must pass a doctor's test and in that test experts examine everything. Also nobles and rich people do not get special treatment, everyone is equal. Alice stops for a moment to think about it. She knows that the doctor profession is one of the most famous and respected jobs that people can have. It's also incredibly difficult to become a doctor in this time as it's only reserved for rich people and nobles. Still Alice is confident that she can pass all the tests because of her many years of experience. Alice tells the Emperor that she wants to save people and protect them. The Emperor has now noticed her true passion but he still wants to test her. Originally he really wanted her to marry his son and become his family. Now he proposes a new deal for Alice. The Emperor will give Alice a chance to follow her dreams. If she is able to prove that she has the skills to become a doctor, the Emperor will allow this to happen. She will become a doctor and she will not have to marry the prince. If she is not able to pass her tests and she fails, then she will do what the Emperor says. He gives Alice six months to achieve this goal and after that it will be up to him what happens. Alice thinks that six months is just not enough time but she has no choice. She knows that the Emperor is trying to scare her so that she marries the prince. Alice realizes that the Emperor has high expectations. She does not only have to pass her tests as a doctor, but she also has to prove that she is worthy of being a doctor. This means to really show off her skills. Alice has no choice so she accepts this proposal. She thanks the Emperor for the opportunity. The Emperor thinks that Alice does not stand a chance. She is a daughter of a nobleman and she has had an easy life. He thinks that she will soon give up. The Emperor has no idea who he is dealing with. At that moment the Emperor tells Prince Linden to take Alice for a quick walk. On their walk Alice thinks about her past with the prince. He was the one who ordered her execution but she does not blame him at all. Alice then apologizes to the prince. She tells him that she is sorry for all the trouble she has caused him. She also apologizes to the prince because he is being forced to marry her. That is when the prince reveals that he is not being forced. This surprises Alice as she always thought he hated her. Prince Linden tells Alice that he is not being forced to do anything and he does not know who told her that. While that is happening the Emperor and Alice's father talk. They talk about the war and soon Alice's father apologizes for her behavior. The Emperor does not think that there is any need to apologize. He likes that Alice is trying to make something out of her life. The Emperor tells Alice's father that she reminds him of her mother. Her mother was also a strong woman and she demanded to become a nurse. This shocked the entire family as it never happened before. The Emperor will give her a chance to work at a hospital. He knows that Alice will give up after a few hard days. He is still thinking about which hospital to send her. He cannot send her to other royal hospitals as those only accept students with the best medical qualifications. The Emperor will send Alice to a very special hospital to train there. We then return to Prince Linden and Alice. Alice is a bit surprised but she tells the prince that it's obvious that he hates her so she is sorry for the entire marriage situation. The prince is obviously angry but Alice does not understand why. He storms off and leaves Alice behind. In her mind Alice is happy. She will stop this marriage that nobody wants and this will give her and Prince Linden a chance to live happily and find true love. After that Alice starts to prepare for her training in the hospital. She has another week before she goes to work in the hospital. She asks her brother Chris to take her to a library. She wants to read as many books as possible. She must learn all the medical words so that she can properly give patients a diagnosis. Alice is so happy that she will once more work in a hospital. This is her true calling in life. Alice thinks about all the information she has to learn so that she ill will be a good doctor in the empire. There are various different methods of treatment and she has to know all of them. She then remembers that the person who will revolutionize medicine in the empire is the great alchemist Fleming. Alice goes to the library and she starts to write all the new information. She also discovers various cures that are not used in the empire because they do not know that the medicine can work. Alice is able to find a possible cure to a heart disease and many other illnesses. Many hours pass and Alice is still in the library. Her brother Chris is worried about her. The servants arrive and tell Chris that his sister has not eaten anything the entire day, and she is still in the library even if it's dark outside. 
Chris is worried and he goes to talk with his sister Alice. She has totally immersed herself in the world of her medical books. Chris is surprised to see that she is so interested in this subject. He also sees that she is taking numerous notes. Chris cannot believe that his sister is a medical genius. Chris then tells Alice that it's time to go back home and take some rest. Alice then asks her brother if she can stay a bit longer. Chris is totally amazed and confused by his sister. She is like a totally new person. Alice talks to her brother Chris and her father. They are both worried that she has been studying too much. It's a lot of work and she has been getting barely any rest these past few days. Also her father is worried because Alice will do her training in the Teresa Hospital. This is not a fancy hospital, it's a relief shelter for the homeless. This is something that might be challenging for a daughter of a noble who has been living an easy life. Her father is worried about Alice. He actually does not want to send her to that hospital as it is a horrible place. He wants to keep his daughter safe at all times. He asks Alice once more if this medical stuff is actually her interest or is she just trying to get out of the marriage with the prince. Alice nods her head and confirms that this is her dream. Her father tells her that he will speak with the emperor and get her out of the marriage but she does not have to torture herself with the medical training. Alice rejects this offer as she wants to go through with this as this is her life goal. Alice tells her father that she will make him proud and that she will not fail. Final arrangements are made for Alice coming to the hospital. The person in charge of her training will be Viscount Kate. Alice wants to hide the fact that he is the daughter of a nobleman. This way the people training her will treat Alice like a normal person. Alice knows that if they found out about her origin they will reject her. Chris is worried about his sister and he does not want Alice to get too tired and to push herself too hard. After two days pass Alice finally arrives at the hospital. This will be the place where she will learn everything about the medical field in the Empire. Alice is excited and ready for the new challenge. That is when we meet a son of a failed baron. His name is Graham Fallen. He is a genius doctor and he will train Alice. Graham hates that he will have to deal with some random girl and train her. This is a waste of time in his opinion. Graham just wants this new girl to be gone so he promises to get her kicked out as fast as possible. That is when Alice arrives. She uses the fake name of Rose so that nobody knows who she really is. Graham is surprised by her beauty but he is certain that she has no idea how to be a doctor. He asks Alice a couple of questions and her answers are surprising. Graham learns that Alice did not go to any school and she learned all the medical information by herself. Also he learns that Alice has seen someone die before. This surprises Graham but he wants to test Alice. Alice then tells him that when a patient dies a real doctor has to bury the patient in their heart. This is something only true doctors know so this surprises Graham. Graham then comes up with a plan to make sure that Alice gives up as soon as possible. He offers to lead her to her working station. Graham brings Alice to her new job. She will be working with beggars. These are the patients that have no hope to recover and they are just dying. Alice is a bit surprised by this and Graham hopes that this will make her give up fast. Graham explains that these patients are not here to be treated or to get better. They are here to die but they have to be taken care of. This was the wish of the owner of this hospital and now the hospital staff has to help these people. Alice wants to know if there is anything she can do for these people. Maybe she could find a cure for their condition and save them. Graham is surprised and confused by this. He does not understand why Alice is so eager to help the patients. Alice explains that she will do anything to help the patients and that includes the disgusting work. Graham thinks that Alice is strange. He leaves and he is still certain that she will give up in a few days. Alice realizes that Graham just wants to get rid of her. Still she is here to help people and save them if she can. Alice prepares to work hard and deal with anything. In her life on earth she dealt with more brutal patients and she has seen everything. The other nurses are surprised at Alice and how she acts. Alice starts to work on the patients and there is blood everywhere. Later Alice and the other nurses clean the entire medical room. Alice knows that the most important thing in a hospital is that everything is clean. This will prevent any other illness from being created. Later Alice starts to help one of the patients. He has broken his back in a fall and now he cannot feel his legs. Alice has to clean his wounds and legs. She will have to use a scalpel. The nurses cannot believe that she is doing all of it alone. Alice prepares to do her first operation in this hospital. She gets her gear and mask, then she grabs her scalpel and starts. Alice is working at the hospital and she wants to prove how amazing she is at being a surgeon. 
With the help of the other nurses he prepares a man for surgery. This man has infected wounds and his skin is really bad. There is a very critical injury that Alice has to treat. She prepares everything for a surgical operation. She will use a scalpel and cut off the infected tissue, and that way she will give the man a chance to heal and get better. The other nurses are nervous as they have never seen a woman do this type of surgical maneuver. It is something only done by very educated doctors and not by young girl. Alice puts on a mask and takes the bandages of the man. She then starts to cut in and take off the infection area. The other nurses watch and they are amazed. They notice how precise and calm Alice is. Alice does not want to become an empress. Her life goal is to be a doctor and that is exactly what she is going to do. The man starts to feel much better right away. Alice is proud of herself but she knows there is a lot more work to do. For a week she works at that department. This is the department with the most sick patients. Alice and the other nurses help every single patient to get better. We then meet up with Graham. He has to have a meeting with his boss. His boss is furious when he learned that Graham has just left Alice alone and has not been teaching her anything. Graham apologizes to his boss and promises to do better. When he leaves Graham is frustrated as he does not have time to waste on a noble girl who will leave soon. He does not want to train anybody. Finally Graham goes to check on Alice and the patients. He is surprised to find that the other patients are now doing much better. The entire room is clean and a lot of the patients have recovered. Most of them are talking and even having a laugh. Graham does not understand what happened as most of the patients were in a pretty bad condition. Graham sees that Alice is sleeping and he goes to wake her up. The patients and the nurses stop him. They all explain that Alice has saved many of their lives in the past week and she deserves a break. The nurses explain that Alice did a lot of surgery on the patients. Graham cannot believe this as Alice does not have the knowledge to be a surgeon. He decides to go check on a patient to see if Alice has messed up something in the operation. Graham checks on the patient and finds that his wound has healed. He cannot believe that Alice managed to do this alone as nobody was able to help the man before. Graham finally confronts Alice and he yells at her. He does not believe that she managed an operation as complicated as this. Graham is convinced that someone came to help her. Alice and the other nurses try to convince him that it was all their own work. Alice does not know how to explain her skills. The Emperor is getting treated by his doctor. The Emperor still feels sick and tired. He wakes up every morning feeling tired. His doctor is the best in the country but they have still not found a solution to the Emperor's condition. The Emperor tells his doctor that it's no problem as this might be his time to die. That is when Prince Linden joins in. He tells the doctor that maybe his father has an issue with the sugar in his blood. The doctor is totally surprised and he cannot believe that the prince had mentioned something like that. This condition is a very new illness in the medical field and only 20 doctors know about it. It is still being explored as a possibility. The doctor asks Prince Linden who gave him this idea, as they must be a medical genius to have come up with something like that. Prince Linden is surprised. He cannot believe that Alice might have cracked the entire situation. The Emperor does not want Linden to share that secret so the doctor leaves and he promises to find out more. The doctor then goes back to his office and starts to think about the illness. It is an illness called diabetes and not many doctors know about it. The doctor thinks that the Emperor might be hiding an even more brilliant doctor in his service. Prince Linden talks to his father. Linden hopes that his condition will improve and that he will be fully healed. The Emperor explains that he did not want the doctor knowing about Alice as he does not want her to become a doctor. He wants her to marry Linden. The Emperor and Linden then talk about the situation with the war. The Emperor finds out that Alice was also correct and that their enemy was planning an ambush all along. The Emperor then sends Linden to visit Alice and see how she is doing at the Teresa Hospital. Meanwhile at the hospital Graham wants to know how Alice managed to pull off something so complicated as this surgery. She tells him that she read a lot of books and that gave her the skills. Graham cannot believe this is something as this type of surgery is very difficult and requires a lot of practical experience. That is when Graham decides that Alice will be his apprentice. He will become her master and teach her everything he knows. Graham is only doing this to learn if Alice is lying or she is really skilled as a surgeon. Graham has finally accepted Alice as a student starting from tomorrow. The two start to treat patients and Graham wants to test Alice and her knowledge. He soon realizes that she is brilliant and know a lot more than even professional doctors. Graham still cannot believe that she is this experienced and brilliant. That is when Graham tries to play a medical trick question to Alice but it does not work. She knows all the answers. Finally he tells her that starting from tomorrow they will be working in a very intense ward of the hospital, the emergency room. Alice goes back home and there her father is worried about Alice. He does not want her to work so hard and also he is worried that she has been working with infected people. 
Alice explains to her father that this is what she wants to be doing. Her father also gets furious at Graham when he learns that he plans to put Alice in the most intense situations in the hospital. Finally Alice calms him down and promises that she will stay out of trouble for his sake. Alice arrives at her new position in the hospital. This is where the most intense medical situations happen. It's usually people that are being rushed to operations. In her previous life Alice has experience with situations like this so she is ready. The people there are confused. They think that she is a noble daughter and not a doctor. Alice tries to explain that she has come to treat patients there. Soon Graham arrives and introduces himself as her teacher and all the other doctors fall silent from respect. They all fear Graham and think that he is a badass. Alice starts her first day in this part of the hospital and Graham really wants to test what she has. Alice has now arrived at this special part of the hospital. In this part of the hospital only the most critically injured patients are treated. Graham has arrived and explained the situation to everyone. Alice will be his apprentice and learn from him. Graham also introduces Alice to another doctor. This doctor is called Hansen. Graham orders Hansen to show Alice around the hospital so that she learns a bit more. Graham has important meetings so he cannot be there for her the entire day. When Graham leaves, Hansen and Alice take a walk in the hospital wing. Alice is still using her fake name Rose so that nobody knows who she is. Hansen already suspects that Alice is part of a noble family. They talk about the hospital and what happens here. Hansen tries to explain everything and he is quite charmed by Alice and her kind nature. Finally they arrive in a hospital room with a lot of surgeon tools. Hansen tries to explain a lot of them. Suddenly their meeting is interrupted by a new patient. Several nurses call the doctor and they all rush over. Graham is not available at the moment so Hansen tries to treat the patient. The patient is screaming on the bed as they cannot breathe at all. Hansen orders an EKG so that they can test what is happening to the patient and his heart. Alice then realizes that the issue is not the heart but the lung. The patient has a collapsed lung that is putting pressure on his heart. He will surely die before the EKG is done. Alice then decides to take matters in her own hands. She orders the nurse to bring her several tools. She checks the patient's breathing and confirms her suspicions. Finally, the nurse arrives with a tube and a needle. Hansen has no idea what Alice is doing but he is not trying to stop her. Finally, Alice stabs the patient in the chest and relieves the pressure from the lung. Graham and other nurses arrive and they do not know what just happened. In her quick thinking, Alice has saved another patient. Graham and the other doctors are confused. They see blood everywhere but the man is breathing normally now. Also his wound is patched up. Graham wants to know who did this. Everyone points out Alice and she is a bit shy. Graham wants to understand why she used the syringe and stabbed the patient. Alice explains that the patient had a collapsed lung and she had to relive the pressure in his chest. Graham wants to know how Alice figured out something like this. Alice reveals that she checked his breathing and noticed that she could not hear his heart and that his artery was blocked. It was obvious to her that the lung was not working so she had to punch a hole through it. Graham finally realizes that Alice is a pure genius. While a good student could learn a lot from books there is no way that they could know how to apply this knowledge in intense situations. Alice had the calm of an experienced surgeon. What Graham does not know is that Alice is in fact a very experienced surgeon and has been for many years. Graham realizes that she is a genius who will change history, maybe even more than Fleming. Graham then thinks about his journey in life. He was the son born in a noble family and he always wanted to make his family proud. To truly achieve his goals, Graham studied for hours and days, even years. He made himself the perfect doctor but it never came easy. Now he is looking at Alice and she is only a young girl but she has the knowledge and the skills of experienced doctors. Graham cannot imagine what she will become in the future. He wants to celebrate as he is excited because he is her teacher. Later in the day everyone in the hospital starts to talk about Alice. She has now almost become a celebrity as they all think that she is a genius. Alice is a bit worried that she showed off her skills skills but she had to save the patient. She can never reject a patient in need. Also while Alice has only been in the hospital for a month she is already brilliant. We also see Hansen talking with another doctor outside. They are talking about Alice and it's obvious that Hansen likes Alice. He explains that he liked her from the moment he saw her but when he saw her saving the patient he fell in love. Hansen knows that he does not stand a chance being with Alice in a romantic relationship. At that moment Alice's brother arrives in the hospital. This is the brother that always causes Alice problems. Prince Lyndon and his friend Randall are walking the city. The prince is now undercover. He has a blonde wig and he has changed his appearance totally. Randall is totally impressed that the prince can just change his appearance like this. This is a specific ability that members of the Empire bloodline have. Lyndon warns Randall to keep his cool so that nobody notices them. 
Randall is also a knight, and he is very powerful in combat. Still, he very much admires Prince Lyndon, and he serves him on missions. The two are in the town exploring, and Lyndon has a very specific task. While there are some important tasks regarding the war, he has to visit Alice and see how she is doing. Lyndon remembers that his father, the Emperor, is very determined so Alice never had a chance to get out of the engagement. She has no way to truly win this bet. Lyndon then thinks about the engagement. He does not care who he marries, but still Alice has been creating too much trouble for him and his father. Randall and Prince Lyndon talk about Lyndon and his dreams. Lyndon has had trouble sleeping, and it's a condition that has followed him for 15 years. Randall is worried about the prince and asks him if he ever got medical attention. Lyndon confirms that he has seen many doctors but none have managed to help him. Since that horrible day 15 years ago, he has been having nightmares all the time. Lyndon and Randall then decide to take a carriage out of the city. Randall admires Prince Lyndon very much as he is a war hero. Not even two years ago Prince Lyndon led his country in a massive war, and he saved many people. In the present, Lyndon and Randall are attacked in an alley. A drug addict has shown up, and he wants their money. Randall takes out his sword and prepares to go and attack. Lyndon stands back as he knows that Randall is a skilled fighter. Randall attacks the drug addict and disarms him. Suddenly Randall is shot in his stomach. He has been shot by the drug addict who seemed to have a hidden gun. Lyndon is totally shocked to see his friend shot in front of him in this way. Randall cannot believe that he has been shot, and he is bleeding. Still, he keeps attacking the drug addict who tries to fire another shot. Randall takes his sword and slashes the throat of the drug dealer. He then falls to the ground, and Prince Lyndon tries to help his comrade. Randall realizes that he does not have a lot of time left. He thanks the prince for everything, and then falls unconscious. Prince Lyndon is now panicking, but he realizes that Randall still has a heartbeat. Still, if Lyndon does not get Randall some help soon, he will surely die. Lyndon realizes that there are no close hospitals, besides one. He finally remembers that the Teresa Hospital is near, so he tries to carry his friend to the hospital. While that is happening, Alice has completed another workday. Graham has questions for her approach in treating a patient. Alice explains her methods, and Graham is once again impressed. He realizes that Alice has knowledge far above any normal human. Still, there is something odd with her. It's almost like she had all her experience in another life, and now she knows everything. Graham is so close to the truth, but he does not figure it out. He asks Alice if she is tired, but she just seems cheerful as always and ready to work. Graham starts to blush and realizes that he has a crush on Alice as well. Alice notices that her teacher is acting odd, but he covers up his emotions. At that moment a nurse arrives and informs them that there is a new patient. They both run out to see Lyndon and Randall. Alice notices Lyndon, but she does not recognize him. He's a bit familiar, so she stares for a bit. Lyndon explains the situation and Graham examines the patient to see what the damage is. Soon Graham realizes that the bullet has hit the spleen so he cannot help Randall. The blood is everywhere, and there is no way to operate something so sensitive. Graham informs Lyndon that he could never do a procedure like this, even with his experience. Lyndon then offers a very expensive medal from his royal family. He will give anything just to see his friend survive this. Graham just thinks that there is no hope for Randall, and no amount of money can change that. At that moment, Alice speaks up. She offers her help as she thinks she can save Randall. Graham wants to know how she plans to make such a complicated surgical operation. Alice explains that she will remove the spleen and stop the bleeding. Graham starts to think about that idea, and he thinks that it's brilliant. It is a bit advanced, but Alice just keeps coming up with these advanced medical methods. Lyndon is surprised, but he wants to trust Alice. He tells her that he will not accept failure in this situation. Alice promises that she will save Randall, as she is certain that she can do it. Graham finally trusts Alice and decides to agree to the operation. The operation will not be easy, and Alice will need help. Prince Lyndon offers to help at least with stopping the blood during the operation. They all prepare for this complicated operation. Alice gets her surgical mask on, and she gets ready to treat the patient. She will need absolute quiet and also assistance. As soon as she cuts in, there will be a loot of blood. The process starts, and Linda is also in the operation room. He has to use a gaze to stop the bleeding. Alice realizes that she must be fast as there will be too much blood, and she will soon not be able to see anything. Graham is really impressed with his apprentice. He cannot believe how fast and precise she is. Alice announces that she will soon start the removal of the spleen.
Prince Linden is also using a fake name so that nobody knows about his identity. He is being called Ron, and now he is helping Alice save Randall. Alice tells Linden to keep pressure with the bandages. This is the best way to stop the bleeding while she removes the spleen. Graham watches with pure wonder as Alice manages to pull off this extremely difficult procedure. Graham remembers his childhood and how hard he worked. He has always wanted to change medicine and change how people are treated. His goal has been since day one to change people's lives for the better and to create surgeries that are perfect. Now watching Alice, he is finally seeing something like that happen. Alec manages to remove the spleen and then she ties the organs. This is a process that stops everything from bleeding. She also patches up the wound. Randall has stabilized and she has stopped the problem. Graham asks Alice if she is tired after the surgery, but she denies it. Graham is as always amazed by his star pupil. After the surgery is over, Lyndon awaits the results. He thinks about Alice and finally realizes that she was not lying. Originally, Prince Lyndon was sure that Alice just did not want to get married, so she made up a story about being a doctor. Now he is certain that this was not true. She truly has a passion for this. This procedure was not just luck. She is a master at this. Alice then arrives to tell the good news to Lyndon. She informs him that his friend Lyndon is now stable, and he is recovering. While his wound is patched up and the bleeding has stopped, his recovery will be long and hard. Lyndon then informs Alice that Randall will be transported to another hospital to recover. Alice then confirms that she will write a detailed recovery plan, so that the other doctors don't get confused by the operation. Alice thinks to herself that this surgery is pretty new for this timeline, so the other doctors will be for sure freaked out. She also informs Lyndon that this hospital is free for poor people, but nobles have to pay a lot. She tells him that he will probably get a huge bill. Lyndon is not worried about this, as he is the prince of an empire. Lyndon then tries to leave, but he starts to feel dizzy. Alice tries to help him, but he does not want any medical attention. Lyndon also blushes when Alice tries to help. Several days later, the doctors of the other hospital lose their mind when they see what Alice managed to pull off in that operation. They have never seen something like this. The operation on Randall has ended, and the man has been saved. Everyone is shocked by the operation as something like that has never been achieved in this timeline. The doctors have all gathered, and they want to talk about the amazing operation. Baron Sven, who is the royal doctor, has brought a reporter to one of his other doctors. The report talks about the spleen being removed. The other doctor thinks that this is all a fantasy, as an operation like this is not possible. Sven tries to convince the other doctor that the operation really happened. Sven tells him that the patient Randall had a bullet wound near his spleen, so there is proof. Now the other doctor is totally surprised. They now have to find out who did this amazing operation. The two of them start to figure out who was in the hospital that day. They finally realize that Graham was there. He has always been a brilliant doctor, so they are certain that he has managed to pull off something that amazing. They want to find Graham and talk to him, but the only problem is that he has been missing for a while. Since that operation was completed, he has not been in the hospital. In the meantime, we see that Alice is now a bit nervous. The first days when Graham did not show up, she did not think that nothing was wrong. But now several days have gone by, and she is worried that something has happened to him. Alice is also worried that she made a mistake, and that is why he is not coming to work. Alice finally decides to take matters in her own hands, and she goes to visit Graham at his house. She takes a night with her and they travel a few days. Finally, they arrive at the giant mansion and Alice prepares to enter the house. She really wants to find out what has been happening with Graham as he is her mentor. Alice enters the house that belongs to Graham. His housekeeper welcomes Alice into the house. She also informs Alice that Graham will not be coming out of his room as he is deep in his research. Alice explains that she wanted to visit to see when he is returning to the hospital to work again. The housekeeper explains that the past few days, her Lord Graham has been deep in research as he is looking for new medical clues. He has told her that he saw a medical miracle in an operation, and since that day, he has just been reading books. Alice realizes that maybe the operation that she pulled off was the reason that Graham is now acting so strange. The housekeeper explains that Graham and her are the only survivors of a very old sickness called the Londo epidemic. This illness killed all members of the Graham family. And since that day, Graham has been focused on becoming the greatest doctor ever. Graham actually promised when he was only 10 years old that he would become the best doctor and cure every sickness that exists. Alice finds this story really sad, and now she better understands Graham and his focus on medicine. 
The housekeeper tells Alice that she does not need to worry as Graham will return to work tomorrow. When Alice leaves, we can see Graham looking at her through the window. The following day, Graham returns to work, and Alice is happy to see him. She still thinks that maybe he is upset about the operation and what she did. Graham tells Alice that they need to talk, and he leads her to a room with other doctors. That is when Alice spots Dr. Sven in the office. She starts to panic as he was her doctor when she was really young. Sven might blow her entire cover as he knows her family story. For a moment Sven is really surprised. He recognizes Alice, but then he remembers the girl he treated. That Alice was mean and brash, she could never become a doctor and work at the hospital. Sven convinces himself that he is mistaken. Now the two doctors want to talk with Graham and congratulate him for the operation. They start to praise him for the operation he did on the spleen. That is when Graham stops them and tells them that he did not operate. It was Alice who did the operation. Graham tells the doctors that they should talk with Alice, as she is the one who is in charge of the whole operation. He did not have anything to do with the operation. The doctors cannot believe what they are hearing. Alice is this young girl standing in front of them, and now Graham is telling them that she performed the most insane operation of their age. Graham tells the doctors that they should talk with Alice as she is the one who was in charge of the whole operation. He did not have anything to do with the operation. The doctors cannot believe what they are hearing. Alice is this young girl standing in front of them, and now Graham is telling them that she performed the most insane operation of their age. The doctors still do not believe that this is true even after Graham has told them. They ask Alice personally if this is the truth. Alice now freezes from the fear for a moment. She does not know what to answer and she realizes that she has put herself into a bit of a troubled situation. It has barely been a month and she has just started her work at the hospital and yet she has performed such a complicated surgery. It's no wonder that nobody believes her. Still if she lies she will cover her talent. Alice has made a promise to not hide her skills so that she can save as many people as possible. She finally speaks up and tells the doctors that she was the one who performed the surgery. Still they do not believe her at all. One of the doctors explains that there is no way a girl so young could pull off something that complicated. They cannot trust her, maybe she made it all up. The doctors now demand that Alice explains the entire operation in detail to see if she truly knows what she is talking about. Alice then starts to explain the entire process of taking out the spleen. She starts to talk about how the operation starts, what she did and how she cut into the spleen and removed it. She also explains how she repaired the tissues around the injury. She talks for quite a while and the doctors are totally surprised. They have no words. Sven realizes that this sounds like all the lectures legendary doctors gave. This girl did not just make this up, she knows all the details. Still the doctors do not understand how she was able to teach herself this. Alice then thinks about telling them the truth, to tell them that she was a doctor in her past life. Alice knows that nobody would believe her so she chooses a different story. She tells the doctors that she read many medical books and started to figure out different versions of the operation. Finally she figured out a way to do the operation with removing the spleen and then repairing the tissue. The doctors are now even more impressed. This means that this young girl read a couple of books and managed to create a complicated solution for an operation she never did. The doctors are now convinced that Alice is a pure genius who will change medicine. She is on the level of legendary doctors who have made medicine possible the way it is today. Graham then joins in and comments on Alice. He tells the doctors that she is the best doctor he has ever worked with. She is perfect and calm and she is already a better doctor than Graham will ever be. The doctors truly are amazed that someone like Graham would give this praise. Finally Dr. Sven offers Alice a job at his elite hospital. He wants to use her genius right away. Sven thinks that there is no point in Alice wasting her talents in a poor hospital. He has offered her a job with him at the Royal Cross Hospital which may be the most important hospital in the land. Alice is also excited about this as that would be the greatest honor to work for that hospital. The other doctor thinks that this is a silly idea as Alice does not have any qualifications. Sven thinks that there is no problems. They talk about all the parts of the process. Alice still does not have a license to practice medicine and the Royal Cross Hospital does not accept apprentices. Also there is a very limited list of people who can work there. Sven is surprised that Alice still does not have her license. She explains that she still has to take the medical test to get her license. Sven then comes up with a plan that Alice takes the test as soon as possible. She should practice medicine for at least a year before she enters the test but Sven is confident that Alice will pass the test without a problem. Then they start to talk about the test. It seems that the emperor has given very clear orders about this year's test. 
He wants the test to be extra difficult so that not a lot of people can pass the test. He has ordered everyone to make the test almost impossible so that only the best doctors can pass it. Many people are worried that this year nobody will pass the test. Sven is curious how Alice will do on the test. Also before she goes to take the test she has to have recommendations from three professors. Sven and the other doctor offer and also they order Graham to give his sign off. In a few days Alice will participate in the medical test and try to pass it and become a real doctor. Alice then leaves the meeting and she is really happy. She never believed that this could happen so fast. While she wanted to train herself for a year she always knew that she was ready to take the test at any time. Also Alice realizes that the Emperor made the test extra hard this year. She thinks about the fact that maybe he wants her to fail the test so that she would marry his son. Alice then starts to plan how she will learn for the test. At that moment she spots the noble called Ron. This is actually Prince Linden but using a disguise to cover his identity. Alice is now worried that maybe Ron has found out about her true identity. Ron has come to talk with Alice. She is pretty nervous as she thinks that he might expose her identity. She has no idea that Prince Linden already knows everything about her. Ron leaves in a hurry as he is also awkward around Alice. Alice then grabs his hand and tells him to stay as she needs to examine him. Ron has told Alice that he has been feeling really tired the past few months and that he does not sleep at all. Alice forces Ron to get examined in her office. She asks him about his symptoms and Ron tells her about everything. Still Ron thinks that all of this is pretty strange. He cannot help himself but to listen to Alice. Prince Linden was already examined by Dr. Sven numerous times so he is convinced that Alice will be unable to find anything wrong with him. Finally Alice starts to examine his face, his neck and to take his temperature. Ron feels a bit awkward as Alice is really close to his face. He blushes a bit. Finally Alice starts to think about the problem and she figures it out pretty fast. She tells Ron that his thyroid gland is inflamed. He previously told her that he was sick two months ago. The thyroid gland was activated at that moment and it did not recover. For that reason Ron now feels tired all the time as his body is not getting rid of the toxins. Ron has never heard about this gland. Alice realizes that in this timeline there is not much information about this gland but she knows all about it. She tells Ron that he will have to take some medicine but he will get better. He can visit his own doctor after three days for new medicine. This entire process will last for two months until he is totally back to normal. The father of Alice meets with Baron Goth and they talk about her progress. Her father cannot reveal who she truly is but she wants to know about this girl Rose who is working at the hospital. Rose is the name Alice has been using to keep her identity hidden. Baron Goth has nothing but praise for Alice. He talks about her miracle work with the patients. He claims that she is a genius doctor and she was fated to work at a hospital. The father cannot believe what he is hearing. His daughter used to have such a bad temper. There is no way that she is now ultra nice and a great doctor. Baron Goth confirms that she is a pure genius. After he leaves Alice's father is alone and thinks about the situation. He is so proud of his young daughter and she reminds him of her mother Teresa. She was also a brilliant doctor and now Alice is walking that same path. In the meantime Baron Goth finds it strange that everyone is asking about this Rose girl but he has still not figured out her true identity. Later we see that Prince Linden is still meeting with Alice as her patient. He is using his secret identity of Ron so that she does not know who he is. Ron talks with Alice about his condition and she explains that he is doing much better and soon he won't be needing any more medication. Ron is a bit sad that he won't be able to visit Alice and talk with her. Later in the day Baron Goth also goes to meet with the Emperor. He is very nervous but he tells the Emperor all his wants to know. Baron Goth is surprised that even the Emperor wants to know about Rose and her work at the hospital. She must be really important. Baron Goth tells him the same thing and explains that she is a pure genius. The Emperor is not certain that any of this is true as it seems insane. He is certain that Alice is a smart girl but these stories sound too wild. Finally the Emperor asks Baron Goth about the medical exam for this year. He wants the test to be almost impossible to pass. Baron Goth confirms that he will make the test super hard. After he leaves the Emperor is left alone to prepare for the birthday party. He plans to announce that his son Linden will be married to Alice on that day. Even if they have their bet he will still announce this news no matter what. People in the kingdom are really curious who will be the wife of the prince. They hope that she is going to be a smart and kind person. They have faith in the emperor and prince Linden to choose the best wife. Also they are happy that the emperor is organizing a giant party for the birthday. Prince Linden is very curious how he can spend more time with Alice without revealing his true identity. 
he wants to get her a gift to show he cares for her. That is when he has a meeting with one of Alice's brothers, Len. Lyndon and Len talk about Alice and Lyndon asks about gifts she likes to get. Len is surprised by this question but he tells the prince that she likes strawberry cakes and various other sweets. Lyndon then finally reveals his intentions. He asks what kind of gift she would like for someone confessing their feelings to her. Len explains that probably the best idea is to get her some expensive jewelry as that is something she always liked. Prince Lyndon now finally has an idea what to buy for Alice as a gift. He then once again puts on his Ron disguise and goes to meet with her at the hospital. He gives her a giant diamond but Alice rejects this gift. She is very thankful but she does not accept gifts for her medical work. She explains that since Ron is a noble he is already paying his bills so no gifts are necessary. Ron is a bit confused. In the past he remembers that Alice only cared about expensive things but now it seems that she has totally changed. Finally he asks her what kind of gift she would like. Alice tells Ron that she would like some strawberry cake. Ron then smiles and reveals that he will buy her all the cakes she wants next time. Ron then leaves and Alice is a bit flustered. The day of the birthday has finally arrived and Alice and her family are getting ready. Alice is already in her dress but she is only focused on her medical studies. Her brother tries to get her to have some fun but Alice is laser focused. That is when her brother notices that she is getting a bit sick. Alice tries to deny this but at the end she ends up in bed with a high fever and she cannot go to the celebration. Alice has a high fever and she is not feeling well at all. She is in bed and sad that she is so weak. Her brother Chris arrives in the room and he gets really worried. He calls the doctor to come and examine Alice. Chris and Alice's father are very worried about her. Alice is such a great doctor that she is able to realize what type of sickness she has before the doctor figures it out. Alice realizes that she has a common cold and she just needs some rest, the doctor also confirms this. Her father does not want Alice going to the hospital anymore as he is getting too tired. Alice then begs him to understand. She promises to get better but she has to return to the hospital as that is something she loves. Chris and their father find Alice too cute so they cannot stop her from doing anything. They have to get ready for the celebration that the Emperor is organizing and Alice demands to go. Sign she is not that sick and she won't need to do anything at the celebration she has to show up. She then decides to leave and go home after the Emperor is done with his speech. The entire family goes to the celebration. Alice is in a fancy dress but she is barely walking. Alice is bored pretty fast and since she is really tired she decides to sit down and rest. She thinks about this celebration and how she misses her friend Michael. It seems they were great friends in this past life but he is not here at all. Alice then spots that her other brother Len and Prince Lyndon have arrived at the event. Prince Lyndon looks distracted and it seems he is looking for Alice. At that moment an old childhood rival shows up. She is called Lady Yulian and she and Alice have always had arguments in the past. Lady Yulian and Alice have had a long-term rivalry between them. They have been childhood rivals and often played pranks on each other. Lady Yulian remembers that Alice has always been really mean to her and that she tortured her with cruel pranks. One time she actually throw water at Lady Yulian and then laughed at her. Alice remembers how cruel she was in the original timeline and she truly feels really sorry. She apologizes to Lady Yulian and tells her that she will never do something like that again. Lady Yulian has no idea what is happening and she is confused by the way Alice is acting. At the same time Alice remembers that Lady Yulian also liked Prince Lyndon and wanted to marry him but that is impossible because of her family and politics. Alice now feels bad for Lady Yulian and she actually hopes that she would become the Empress. Lady Yulian and Alice talk about the announcement that will be made by the Emperor. Yulian is certain that Alice will be announced as the new wife of Prince Lyndon but Alice does not think so at all. Lady Yulian asks Alice if she would like to join her for tea at some point and Alice is really happy about this. She does not want to be enemies with Lady Yulian. At the same time we see that Prince Lyndon is not loving this entire event. He hates that people are looking at him all over the place. Also he is really worried about Alice. He realizes that Alice is sick and is having a hard time. He talks with her brother Len about this but Len does not seem interested at all. Alice is now left alone and suddenly another noble approaches her to dance. This noble is called Louis and he is a very scary figure. Not only that but Alice knows who he will become. Soon when the war really gets going Louis will be a brilliant and evil commander who will kill many people Fa Alice loves and cares for. Louis will also lead the armies and make sure that her brother Chris dies. Alice cannot forgive this at all. Louis then comments how Alice actually ruined his military plan. 
Alice is surprised that Louis already found this out so soon. Still Louis has an evil smile on his face and he asks Alice for a dance. Alice cannot reject this as it would be considered rude and but she still hopes that someone stops this dance. Suddenly Prince Lyndon arrives and tells Louis to get away from Alice. Louis is very mean and he starts to insult Prince Lyndon right away. It seems that they are also rivals but they actually hate each other. They were actually in war recently so they are mortal enemies. Louis makes fun of the prince and calls him the empty prince. Lyndon then tells him to move away from Alice as it's obvious she doesn't want to dance with him. Loyus stops for a moment and apologizes to Alice for being so forward. He still promises to dance with her one day. Louis then leaves and Alice tells Prince Lyndon that she really did not want to dance with Louis. Alice has never seen the prince this upset. She is very thankful for Prince Lyndon for stepping in but he does not want to take any credit. He then asks Alice for a dance and she is really surprised as he has never acted this way towards her. The two of them start to dance and everyone is amazed by their dance skills. Alice remembers that in the original timeline their dance did not go so well. She was not able to follow the prince and his lead so they got into a fight. Lyndon notices through the dance that something is not right with Alice. He still does not know that she has a high fever. Finally he stops the dance to ask her if she is okay but Alice does not reveal anything. Prince Lyndon then takes off his gloves and checks her face. It's obvious now that she has a high fever. He then takes her to a royal room to rest. Alice feels a bit awkward but Prince Lyndon tells her to sit and get some rest. He is also very sorry for asking her to dance because she was so tired and sick. Alice does not understand why the prince is not nice to her. In the original timeline he hated her and never spoke to her in this kind way. In the original timeline he hated her and soon enough Alice started to hate him and she became really cruel. This all ended with the prince ordering Alice to be killed. Prince Lyndon tells Alice to take some rest until the emperor is ready to do his speech. Alice asks the prince why he is being this nice to her. Prince Lyndon is surprised by this question but he just tells her to rest, and then he leaves. Prince Lyndon orders many strawberry cakes and sends them all to Alice so that she has something to eat. Alice is sick but she can still enjoy some cake. She is very happy and realizes that this cake is the same as a baker she used to love. The maid reveals that this baker was hired by the empire to work for them. Alice is a bit sad as now the common people will not be able to taste these delicious cakes. After a while Alice starts to fall asleep as she is really tired. Finally she is woken up by Duchess Harbour. She is a nice old lady and she helps Alice to get up. It seems that the Emperor is ready to deliver his speech. Alice can barely stand and Duchess Harbour helps her. Alice very soon realizes that the Duchess is also sick but her condition is more serious. It seems that Duchess Harbour has Parkinson's which is very serious sickness. In the original timeline Alice remembers that Harbour choked on some food because of this sickness. As there is no cure for this sickness Alice just has to be there to help the Duchess if something happens. Finally it's time for the Emperor to give his speech. Alice is barely awake but she is happy that she will finally be able to go home and rest. The Emperor starts his speech and then goes to his announcement. He is supposed to announce the future wife of his son Prince Lyndon but he then says that he will have to delay this announcement. He tells everyone that he has to wait until Alice reaches a more mature age. Alice is now furious. The Emperor basically revealed that she will be the one to marry Prince Lyndon but he did in a sneaky kind of way. This was not their deal. He was supposed to keep that a secret until she passed her medical exams. Alice has a dream. In her dreams she has visions of the past. She remembers Prince Lyndon and her execution. In her past life she hated him and he hated her even more. He told her to burn in hell before he killed her. In the present Alice wakes up and she is really scared. She has not had this dream in a while. She hates that memory. While she has yet to recover from her sickness Alice gets up and takes some medicine. These painkillers will help her walk normally and will help with her sickness. She goes outside and there everyone is talking about her engagement to Prince Lyndon. Alice does not like that the Emperor announced something like this as it goes against their bet. Alice is humble and she tells the people that the engagement is not official so the Emperor could change his mind. The people are amazed how humble she is as they do not believe her. Alice later meets with the Duchess that has Parkinson's. They talk and the Duchess talks about Lyndon and how sweet he was as a boy. The Duchess is very happy that Alice might marry the Prince in the future. The Duchess takes a sip of her drink and starts to choke. Alice has to help her but she knows that this is because of her condition. Alice then goes to meet the Emperor who wants to talk with her. The Emperor has missed Alice and he wants her to make him the special tea she makes. Alice goes to make the tea and she wonders what the Emperor will do. 
She thinks that maybe he will stop their bet and force her to marry the prince. Finally, Alice confronts the emperor about their bet. She hopes that she can still have a chance to become a doctor. The emperor explains that the bet is still happening as agreed. He made an announcement that was not official. He really got excited about the fact that Alice could be his daughter in the future and he really wants her to be part of the royal family. The emperor is certain that she would be a great wife and would help the empire. Also he can take back the announcement if Alice manages to fulfill her dream. Alice has to achieve something as a doctor that will be greater than her being the empress of the entire land. At that moment they suddenly hear noise outside. It seems that the duchess has fallen down and she is dying. Alice now has to be the doctor and save her life. The duchess is dying and everyone is calling for a doctor. Alice rushes over to the duchess and sees what is happening. The duchess is already turning blue and it seems that she does not have enough time to live. Alice will have to act fast if she wants to save the duchess. The people around them do not know what to do. Some people try to stop Alice but she tells them to leave her alone as he does not have enough time. Alice realizes that she only has about 30 seconds and then the duchess is dead. She will have to perform an operation with a knife. She has to free up the airway and that is the only way the duchess will survive. Alice takes the knife and prepares to slice open the throat. She has to be careful. If she even misses by a few inches she will cut an artery and kill the duchess. Alice breathes in and finally does the cut. She manages to free the airway and then she puts the duchess down. She has saved her life and she performed a medical operation that has not been discovered in this timeline. Alice realizes that she will now be in giant trouble as nobody knows what she did. The guards arrive and pull out their swords on Alice. They take her away as all the people are left shocked about what just happened. Alice's father goes to talk with the Emperor. Some people are saying that Alice tried to kill the Duchess but he has to explain to the Emperor that this is not what happened. The Emperor understands and he thinks that Alice is innocent. Still she performed a medical operation that seems to be unknown. For that reason she is in custody. The Emperor did not put her in prison but in another castle. He will now send the best doctors to check what happened. The Duchess is actually doing much better but the doctors have to examine what Alice did. If it's proven she saved the life of the Duchess she will be rewarded, if not she will be punished. The Emperor is hoping that Alice will be punished so that she does not go to the hospital ever again. He hopes that she will lose the bet. We then see Alice alone sleeping in the faraway castle. Prince Linden has sneaked past the guards. He wanted to see Alice as he misses her and cannot stop thinking about her. The prince notices that Alice is struggling in her sleep trying to save someone. The prince realizes that he has real feelings for her. Lean and Chris arrive to talk with Alice. They have brought her some medical books so that she does not get bored while she is alone. Chris is a bit angry as he thinks that Alice acted too fast and she got into so much trouble. On the other hand Len is very calm and he praises Alice. He tells her that she did the correct thing and that he is sure this will all get cleared out soon. Alice realizes that this is the first time her brother Len praised her in this way. He is always so cold and mean towards her. She does not know what happened. Finally the Emperor has a meeting with the top doctors in the land. They have all gathered around to talk about the medical surgery that Alice did. The Emperor is excited as he is sure that the doctors have found major flaws in the operations and he will win the bet. The doctors then suddenly start talking about the operation being the work of a genius. The Emperor is totally shocked, he cannot believe it. The doctors are totally amazed by Alice and they think she is a genius. She did the operation in only 10 seconds which is an insane time. They talk about the fact that the doctor's society has been talking about an operation like this for a while, but nobody was ever brave enough to perform it. Alice did an amazing job and she did not make any mistakes, it was all perfect. Then they start talking about her notes. She wrote a detailed description of the operation which means she knew what she was doing. This was no accident as she described every single detail in this note. The doctors want to publish her notes in medical journals. They think she is the next genius doctor. The emperor hates this development. This means Alice will become famous and she will win the bet. He did not want this to happen but he believes the doctors and their opinions. In the meantime Alice is still alone. She thinks about Len and Chris. While Len will be very successful as a commander in the upcoming war, Chris will die. Alice is still determined to stop this from happening. At that moment a mysterious young man arrives in her chambers. This man has blonde hair and is very handsome. He starts to tease Alice and introduces himself as Michael, the long lost brother of Prince Linden. Alice starts to cry as she was great friends with Michael in her original life. She stops herself as she does not want Michael to realize that she knows him. Michael is totally surprised as he has never met Lady Alice before. Alice tells him that she just has dust in her eyes as she does not want him knowing she got emotional. 
Michael thinks that this girl is strange but he wants to spend time with her. Alice remembers the original timeline. There she was great friends with Michael. He was always getting into trouble so they would hang out. Michael always wondered why Alice was so in love with Prince Lyndon and they would make fun of the prince. For Alice he was the only friend she ever truly had while she was the empress. Michael has a very tragic future in this timeline. He will go to war and die as well. There are also some mysterious reasons why he dies in the future and Alice does not know how to stop this. Alice and Michael start talking about life and Michael reveals that he is also trapped in this castle. Alice is surprised but he reveals that he is getting out soon and he will be traveling far away. They decide to hang out and talk. Alice and Michael start to laugh and talk about their life. It's obvious that we are fast becoming friends. Mikahol continues to visit Alice every day while she is in the castle. They spend more and more time together and truly become friends even in this reality. Alice tells him that she does not plan to marry Lyndon and that she wants to become a doctor. Michael has a hard time understanding why a noble woman would become a doctor. Alice explains that it's the same reason he uses a sword even if he has special emperor bloodline powers. Michael likes to use his sword and he is very good at it. That is the same reason Alice wants to be a doctor, she truly loves it. She also explains that if she did not become a doctor she would not live a happy life. Later in the day Michael decides that they should drink and celebrate. Alice knows that in the morning she has a meeting with the doctor council to talk about her verdict. Still Michael convinces her to drink at least a bit. They both talk and have fun while drinking the entire night. Alice then remembers that in the original timeline Michael wanted to tell her something but he died before he could have. Michael also really likes Alice and he might have deeper feelings than he's letting on. Alice falls asleep and Michael leaves and hopes to see her one day in the future. In the morning Alice is woken up by the doctors. When she opens the door she is shocked to find the same doctors that she has been working for as Rose. It seems that her cover has been blown. The doctors are all shocked that Alice is the same person as Rose. Alice realizes that she has been caught and there is no point in keeping up the lie. She bows down and reveals to the doctors that she is in fact Lady Alice from the noble family. The doctors are all surprised, some angry but also one doctor thinks that he realized it before because of her strange behavior. Alice now wants to know what will happen with her. The doctors surprise her with the news that she has been cleared of all charges and she can return to her normal life. But that is not all, she is going to be given a royal reward and she will become the first woman to become a dame. The title of dame is very important and basically it's the closest thing to a knight. Also Alice gets to talk with Tay Count whose wife she saved. This Count is very famous in the land and he is grateful for her help. He thanks her for giving him and his wife more years together. Alice is happy that she was able to save someone important. Now she realizes that while she will be getting a royal reward the medical test is coming up soon. She has to manage her time and use it all for studying. Still the Emperor is playing his games. He really wants Alice to fail their bet. He organizes the ceremony for her award during the last days of her preparation for the exam. Alice arrives at the ceremony and pretends that everything is okay. She knows that she has a lot of work to do but she is ready. Alice remembers her life on Earth in the modern timeline. She remembers being an orphan and also studying for medical school all the time. That was her entire life so she is ready for this test no matter what. The day of the test arrives and Alice goes into the classroom with the other students. The test starts and all the other students start to freak out. They can't believe these questions as they are all very hard. Alice takes one look at the test and realizes something really amazing. The test is the same as the one she did in Korea during the modern timeline. It has the same type of questions. Alice is now even more certain that she can nail this test. Alice has finally finished writing her test and she is pretty tired. Still she is happy that it's over. Part of her thinks that she did great on the test but the other part is not so sure. She gave very complex answers and many of the medical problems were not from this time. She is worried that the doctors will not accept her answers. While she is happy it's over, she is nervous as she does not want to marry Lyndon. While Alice is certain that this time she would not be so unhappy in that marriage she just does not want to repeat that same life. She truly hoped to become a doctor. In that moment Ron shows up. This is Prince Lyndon when he transforms to hide his appearance. Ron is very charming and he has come to see Alice after her test. Alice is disappointed as she is not certain that she will pass. Lyndon gets a bit angry as it seems she really does not want to marry him. Still she wants to celebrate with her so he asks her to come and eat something with him. Alice is happy to join Sir Ron for a meal. The two go to a bakery where Alice can order whatever cake she wants. At first she does not want to spend a lot but Ron tells her to buy whatever she wants. The two sit down and have a nice meal. Alice is happy that she can enjoy some cake. 
Later in the day they ride in a carriage. There is a bit of awkward silence but Alice likes it. She feels very safe and comfortable with Ron and he feels familiar. Alice starts to think about who he reminds her of. She is almost there, very soon she could figure out that he is actually Prince Linden. As the day finishes Ron does not want to leave Alice. He comes up with an idea to go and see a theater play. Alice is surprised that Ron is being so charming but she does not want to reject him. Ron invites Alice to go and see a theater play. Alice is a bit nervous but she accepts his invitation. He expresses that he likes plays but he wants to see one with her badly. Alice gets all flustered and thinks that maybe Ron really does like her. Still Alice cannot believe this as they only meet in her medical office. The two spend the entire day together and watch the play. After the day is over Ron returns to his castle. Now he can return to his original Prince Linden form. Linden is confused about his feelings for Alice. He really likes her but also he has been pretending to be this Ron person so she probably does not like Linden. Also Linden cannot keep using his powers of changing his appearance for long. He has a special device and it takes his life force when he changes his appearance. His servant warns Linden that he has to be careful with his powers and he has to rest. Linden realizes that he will not be able to visit Alice in this form for a while. He has to recover his health. Still he cannot stop thinking about her and how happy he feels. He has not felt this happy since the cursed day that changed him forever. The test results of the medical exam are now being graded. Soon horrible news hit all the students that went to the test. Most of them have failed. The teachers are surprised and they think about giving another test so that more people can pass the test. Still there is one person that passed the test with flying colors. It's Alice of course. It seems that her score is 99, which is insane. The doctors were totally surprised. Most of the medical questions were about problems that have not been solved yet. That is why most of the students failed. Still Alice was able to answer all these questions without a problem. It's so insane that the doctors at first did not believe but she answered most of the questions perfectly. Out of 200 questions she only got two wrong, and those are only wrong because her handwriting was so horrible in those answers. Basically she answered everything which means she passed the test. Soon the news breaks and the people in the kingdom are surprised that the future empress is going to be a doctor. They all think that she is just going to marry Prince Linden so they do not understand why she is going through so much trouble. Still people are very happy for her great results in the empire. The emperor on the other hand is not. He cannot believe that she managed to pass the test after he made it extra difficult. Still he cannot stop her from starting to be a doctor. But the bet is still not over. There are four more months until Alice has her growing up celebration. Until then she has to achieve something incredible in the medical field. Not just incredible but something more important than being the empress. Still the emperor is not certain that he will win this bet as Alice has proven time and time again that she is way too brilliant. Everyone is now celebrating at Alice's house. Her father is super proud of her and her brother Chris is also super happy. Alice once more thinks about Chris and him dying in the future war. She wants to stop this and hopes that now the timeline has shifted a bit so he will survive. Even her stern and cold brother Len praises her for achieving something so great. Also he has some strange questions for her. Len wants to know what Alice likes, what her favorite color is and a bunch more. This is not Len asking. Basically Prince Linden ordered him to find this out. Prince Linden is really trying to find a way to be romantic towards Alice. Alice tells her brother that she will tell him everything later. Alice is super happy about everything and she is relieved that she can finally become a doctor like she always wanted. Still there is more time for the emperor to change his mind so she has to be really great. Alice starts to work at the hospital and she is great. She works all day every day with many patients. She is working super hard and basically does not have time for anything else. Soon a few weeks fly by and very soon two months go by. Alice has been working at all times. She even got sick and still tries to go to the hospital and work. This always worries her father and brothers but they have to let her go. Alice thinks back at her life in modern Korea and how people there always thought she was obsessed with work. Every other doctor thought she was crazy because she would spend every moment in the hospital. They just didn't get how much Alice loves this job. While that is happening problems are hitting the empire. The emperor is shocked that the enemy has created an army with over 400 zero soldiers. The emperor is now afraid that this was will go out of control. Prince Linden is also there during the meeting in the war room and he realizes that a giant conflict is starting. No kingdom or empire is now safe. The emperor is now really worried. The armies of the enemy are too great. They can only gather about 150 zero soldiers in the coming weeks. This will not be enough for a direct battle. To gather any more soldiers it would take time as the empire is big and it takes time for people to get ready and arrive.
Linden is going to the front lines and he is getting ready for battle. The Emperor is worried about his son. He tells him to be careful. Even if he has some powers he cannot dodge bullets. Linden promises his father that he will be careful, and then he leaves. The Emperor remembers the last war that happened years ago. In this war his three sons went into battle. His oldest son was brave and strong but he died in battle. His body was never recovered. The Emperor was broken by grief. He does not want to lose anyone else from his family. He cannot forget how his son was before all this tragedy came his way. Linden was once a smiling boy that was happy but now he is just sad all the time. The Emperor truly hoped to see Linden and Alice marry before the war started. Now that will probably never happen. In the meantime it's agreed that now a lot of the noble families will have to send their sons in battle. This means that Chris and Len are going to war. This is something that Alice wanted to prevent. We see that Alice is still working hard in the hospital. There has been a strange occurrence of deaths in old people lately. This is the fourth person who died from diarrhea in the last couple of days. That means there is a connectivity between all these victims. Alice starts to figure out this pretty quickly. She realizes that maybe there is something connecting the victims. Maybe this is a start to an epidemic. The nurses and all the doctors get scared as this means that things are going to get very dangerous. Alice is still not sure so she orders the nurses to find information if there have been deaths that are similar to this in recent days. Alice later gets really worried as the epidemic is now happening earlier in the timeline. She hopes that she is wrong but if this truly is an epidemic it could kill thousands. Alice remembers that in the original timeline the epidemic killed over 100 zero people. She now has to find a way to stop this epidemic from spreading so that people are safe. Alice goes to meet with Sir Ron for what might be their final meeting. Lyndon can no longer use his powers of changing his appearance and also he is going to war. Alice and Ron walk during the night and talk. Ron wants to tell her something. Finally he gets enough courage and tells her that he is going to war. Alice is really emotional. She did not even notice but she started to care for Sir Ron. These past few months they have spent a lot of time together. Even if he is a bit cold and distant he is always nice. She is now sad as him going to war means he will be in danger. He might never come back. Ron tries to explain that he has to do this and they will not meet for a long time. Alice is sad but Ron tries to make her feel better. He promises that he will be okay and that he will come back to her. He truly has feelings for her and hopes to see her again. Ron prepares to leave but Alice has to give him something. She gives him an emblem that her mother gave to her. This is a very rare and nice gesture. She is giving him this and tells him that he has to return it when he gets back. Alice tells him that she will be really angry if he does not come back. Ron is moved by this gesture and promises to return the emblem to Alice. When Ron enters the carriage his powers turn off and he is back to being Lyndon. Lyndon knows that he had to do this and say goodbye to Alice. He feels bad for tricking her this entire time. When Alice returns home she gets some really bad news. Chris and Len are going to war as well. Everyone in the family is now crying and Alice is very emotional. She knows what will happen to both of them and especially Chris. She does not want to lose her brother all over again. When Chris enters her room Alice starts to cry and begs him to stay. Chris assures her that everything will be okay. He then asks her if he could have the emblem that mother gave to her. That same emblem Tha Alice gave to Ron not hours ago. Alice is furious with Chris. She does not want to give him an emblem as that means she will probably never see him again. She has been hurt so much by Ron leaving and she already has trauma from Chur's dying in the original timeline. Alice screams at him and leaves. She goes back to her room and cries there. She is so sad that she cannot change the timeline. She does not want to lose her brother again. She does not get any sleep and basically cries the entire night. The following morning she has a meeting with one of the doctors that is working with her. He even notices that Alice does not look very good as she is very tired. Alice wants to know what is happening with the epidemic. There is news about this and it's not really good. It seems that there has already been 80 people that have died and those numbers are rising by the day. Also it's not certain that there are more people in beds every day, they are getting sick all the time. These numbers will blow up in the coming days which means the epidemic is just starting. At this moment Alice realizes that this is the epidemic that hit in the original timeline. The second great epidemic in this kingdom. The last epidemic hit 20 years ago when many people died. Alice knows from her knowledge of the timeline that in this epidemic even more people die, about 100 zero. In the meantime the Emperor has a meeting with various doctors. He even talks with Gallic, the chief of public health. Gallic has a theory about this epidemic. He thinks it's caused by the dirty air, and that they have to change this to stop Tay sickness. Linden is also there during this meeting. 
He remembers a time where he talked with Alice about these types of illnesses. She mentioned that diarrhea cannot be caused by air. It can only be caused by water in the food supply. Lyndon says this during the meeting and surprises everyone with his knowledge. Gallic is still trying to convince people that it's the dirty air and that they might have a solution for it. While that is happening Alice figures Otto that contaminated water and foods is causing this illness. She has to solve this problem but then she remembers that there is a way for her to save the people of the city and her brother Chris. She has to meet with the Emperor right away. Alice goes to meet with the Emperor. He is very surprised to see her as she has not come to visit in many months since she has been working as a doctor. Alice explains to the Emperor that she knows the cause of the illness and she can cure it. The Emperor is really surprised but he wants to listen to her because she is the brilliant Dame Alice who has already performed many medical miracles. Alice explains that the toxic air has nothing to do with the illness and she needs three days to cure it. She already knows the method to use and she will stop the spread fast enough. Alice is aware that this will be a super hard process, but she is certain that she can do it. The Emperor decides to accept her request and he will give her all she requires to stop this epidemic. At that point Alice notes that if she stops this, she would achieve something great as a doctor. This means she will win the bet. The Emperor is disappointed. He realizes that this is possible and it would be fair. He cannot hold Alice back anymore and he accepts her terms. She explains that this illness is called cholera and its origins come from far away. It gets into the human system by a bad water supply and bad water. Alice has a plan to stop it but she will need help. She then tells the Emperor that she has changed the terms of their bet. She will indeed marry Prince Linden but the Emperor will then have to give her some favors. The Emperor is shocked by this new change. Alice has changed her mind. While her marriage with Linden will be without love she will not ruin everything like before. She tells the Emperor that there are some terms to this. First her and Prince Linden should not marry until the war is over. The Emperor accepts this as he also does not want a royal wedding at this moment. Also if Prince Linden does not want to marry Alice the Emperor will allow him to back out. The Emperor accepts all these terms as he is happy with this new deal. Alice then mentions that there is another favor. She will not hurt the Empire in any way but if she cures all these people the Emperor has to do something else. He will have to do a giant favor. The Emperor accepts this and promises to honor his word. Alice now leaves the palace and prepares for her new mission. She thinks about her entire situation. She will not be able to be a doctor because she will have a duty as an empress. Her marriage will not turn out to be horrible but she will try to not get Prince Linden into any trouble. Hopefully now she can save her brother Chris from certain death. At this moment Alice feels trapped and she starts to cry once more. Suddenly Prince Linden shows up and Alice thinks that he is Ron by his voice. She was just thinking about Ron and how she misses him. At that moment Prince Linden comes to talk with Alice. Alice is very emotional but she tries to hide her tears. Linden asks her what is wrong but she does not want to talk about it. Alice and Linden talk about the situation and it's obvious that Linden is worried about her. Still now it's time to get to work and try to stop this epidemic from destroying the city. Alice now joins the special council where she will be working on figuring out what is happening in the city. Some people are very shocked when she joins in the meeting as she is very young and is not experienced in this sort of thing. The public health leader thinks that Alice should not be in the meetings. He is certain that air is causing the toxic illness to spread. Alice very confidently explains that this is not what is happening and it's actually being spread by toxic water and food. There are some people who do not agree and start to get into arguments with Alice. After a while Prince Linden stops this. He does not want anyone to disagree with Alice and they all need to let her do her job. Alice is surprised that Prince Linden stepped up for her. She thanks him but he is still cold towards her and basically tells her that it was the right thing to do. Alice explains that she needs the map to the city and about 30 patients from all over the city. Soon they start their research and find that there are some places that all the infected people have visited. Alice now has to figure out which part of the city is causing the problem and the epidemic. She now has to go there and survive the area herself. Linden is nervous about letting her go totally alone. Alice is confused about why he is so worried about her. Prince Linden is still hiding his true feelings and the fact that he was wrong the entire time. Alice is confused. She does not understand why Prince Linden is so worried about her. Linden does not want her to go where the toxins are the highest. He really cares about her and does not want Alice to get hurt. Finally Linden realizes that Alice will go no matter what so he decides to join her in the mission. They now go to explore the city, they have to find what is causing the epidemic. They have to find where the people are getting sick. The prince has hired a carriage and there are some soldiers with them. Alice can now focus on finding the solution and soon she realizes something. 
there is a place where a company releases toxins. This might be a place where the sickness has started. Alice and Lyndon arrive to this location and there they find a lot of the water totally toxic. It seems that the entire water system has been infected and has been stuck with horrible dirty objects. This is where the illness started and now Alice finally has a way to stop this from happening. Lyndon orders the water supply to be shut off. Some of the people in the council get mad at this and they think this is a horrible idea. Lyndon orders them to shut off the water supply and he decides to take responsibility if something goes wrong. Lyndon tells Alice that he believes in her and that he is sure that she is right. Alice is totally confused as he has never been this nice to her. In the meantime they manage to stop the water from Ty's river from infecting the city. This river was filled with various toxins and has been causing the illness. Alice now goes to take care of the patients. In just two days there is a lot less patients and it's obvious that the illness is stopping. There have only been a few deaths and the people are getting a lot better. The difference between this epidemic and what happened 20 years ago is insane. Alice is happy that she was right and managed to stop this from spreading. Finally after three days the entire cholera epidemic seems to have ended. The people are now celebrating and they know that Dame Alice saved all of them. She is now the main hero in the town and Alice is happy that she managed to prevent any more people from dying without reason. Now there is only one thing left to do. She has to talk with the Emperor about their terms and their bet. Alice talks with the Emperor and Prince Linden. They are happy that she was able to save all the people. Alice explains that now the illness is over but there is still work to be done in the city. They have to change the entire water supply. The town is big and it will only grow. If they want to avoid any future epidemic like this from happening the Empire has to put up 5 million of their own money to fix the system of water supply. The Emperor loses his mind because of this amount. Still he respects Alice so he'll listen to her. Finally it's time to talk about the final term. The reason why Alice did all this. The Emperor once more agrees that he will give her anything she wants unless it harms the Empire. Now it's time for Alice to say her terms. She explains that she wants to go to war instead of her brother Chris. She will be a medic soldier and she will go on the front lines. That is her wish for the Empire but honor. The Emperor loses his mind and he is truly angry at Alice. Prince Linden is shocked and he cannot believe that she would do something like this. Alice knows that she made the Emperor angry but she is happy that she prevented her brother from dying. She will now become a soldier and help many people in the front lines. At that moment Prince Linden comes to confront Alice. He is angry that she did something so dangerous. He cannot believe it but Alice explains that she has her reasons. She wants to protect her empire and also finish her duty. Also Alice comments that there is nothing between her and the prince so he should not be worried. Prince Linden returns to his office and finally realizes that he loves Alice. He hopes that she will be safe and he promises to make sure she is protected while in the army. Alice's father is angry at her for wanting to go to war instead of her brother and says he shouldn't have let her go to the hospital before and he fires her from the hospital. Alice apologizes and says she wants to treat the wounded on the battlefield that's why she asked the emperor to let her fight. Alice's father disowns and sends her out of the house and asks her not to come back unless she changes her mind. Alice wonders where to go while sitting on a bench. Suddenly it starts raining. Yulian walks up to Alice and asks her what she's doing there while it's raining hard and asks her to go home but Alice tells her she got kicked out so she can't go home. Yulian wonders how a renowned lady like Alice got kicked out and asks her if she has a place to go. Yulian asks Alice to come to her house if she has nowhere to go and says before the birthday party they agreed to have a cup of tea together so she asks Alice to join her for a cup of tea. Alice thinks about how she has never wanted to visit the child of family since there. Families don't have a good relationship. Alice says as the family that mastered the lifeblood of the western continent's economy she thought the childes would have adorned their house with gold but she didn't expect it to be simple. Yulian asks Alice if she has finished washing. Alice thanks her for taking care of her and Yulian tells her she would catch a cold if she didn't take a bath since she was in the rain and she heard she gets sick quite easily. Alice asks her how she knew she caught a cold easily and Yulian tells her she's very popular and everything she does is reported in magazines and she reads magazines often so it's only natural she knows. Yulian tells Alice the cloth she's wearing is big and she feels like she has a little sister and tells her to drink some warm tea that will make her feel better. Yulian asks Alice if there's a problem with her immunity since she catches a cold easily but Alice says she's just weak. Alice is surprised. Yulian knows the word immunity but she says she studied medicine for a while because she envied her since she has everything in the world so she thought if she studied medicine for a 
While she might get lucky, Alice thinks that there is no way Yulian can marry the crown prince, since the child of family has a hostile relationship with the royal family but she thinks she will be a good crown princess and empress for the prince. Yulian asks Alice to rest if she's not feeling well and she has asked for a room to be prepared for her but Alice says there's no need in. Yulian tells her unless she wants to go out in the rain and freeze she should hurry up and get some rest. Alice thanks her and Yulian tells her to rest well. The next day Alice says she should go and apologizes for giving Yulian so much trouble. Yulian thinks that Alice really does catch a cold easily and asks her to get well soon. Yulian asks a servant to go and find the chief professor of the Rosary Hospital. The professor tells Alice she must take her medicine on time and tells her she would be fine in two to three weeks. The professor can't believe he came to treat Lady Clarence for a cold in the child a household. Yulian tells Alice she has prepared some soup and she must take her medicine after eating it. Alice thanks her, but she says if she really wants to thank her she should invite her for dinner next time. Yulian asks her how's her cold and she says she thinks she will be fine in a few days. Yulian tells Alice her father wants her to join them for dinner after she has recovered and Alice wonders why. Marquis Ansel of the child of family is looking for her. At the dinner Marquis Ansel asks Alice if her father's well and also asks if she's feeling better since Professor Keller told him her cold was quite serious but Alice told him she's much better and thanks him for his kindness. Marquis Ansel tells Alice that as a doctor she already knows she must take care of her body. Now or she will suffer later just like him he's been coughing so much lately it has been like torture and he nags Yulian after. Alice wonders if that is really the child a household since it's strange to think the Marquess would nag his daughter. A servant speaks into the Marquess ear and he apologizes for having to leave during dinner since something has come up but Alice says it's okay. The Marquess tells Alice his son will be joining the war as well and asks her to take care of him if he gets hurt but Albert says he's not going to accept help from the Clorence family but his father says there's no telling what will happen in war a skilled doctor could save his life. Alice wonders if she saw Albert in her past life. After the crim wore the heir to the child of family was Yulian and that can only mean one thing. Either he died in the Crim War or he was severely wounded that he was incapable of succeeding. Alice asks the Marquis not to worry, and says that she's a doctor even if he hadn't made such a request she would have done her best. The Marquis tells her if she helps him, him and the child of family will never forget her. Kindness. A maid tells Alice someone from the Clarence household wants to see her. Alice wonders if it's her second brother or her father who wants to see her to forgive her or try to stop her. Alice sees her big brother and says he's not one to come out for such a small matter and wonders why he has come. Alice's brother says he thought she will stay out of trouble but it seems like she hasn't changed and asks her how long she intends on staying. Alice's brother asks her to follow him and that he's going to teach her how to protect herself. Alice's brother takes her to a shooting ground and Alice asks him why he brought her there and he tells her he's going to teach her to shoot but Alice says she's going to war as a doctor. He tells her that if the front lines don't reach the field hospital she will be safe but there are no guarantees in a war. So she should learn quickly. He says they should get started and asks her if she knows how to load and shoot a gun. Alice's brother shows her the cartridge where the bullets are loaded since it's the latest model it can be pulled out from the side. He tells her to pull the pin back, load the bullet and pull the trigger to shoot and he shoots two bullets that hit the mark. He tells her he does not expect her to do that as a doctor and all. But he tells her she has to hit the target 15 meters away. He says, it seems simple but she can't leave until she hits the target and he sits down with his legs. Crossed, Alice thinks that she has performed many difficult surgeries that require precision. Alice shoots lots of bullets but they all miss and the gunfire is so loud that it hurts her ears. He shouts at her that when she pulls the trigger her wrists tremble. She needs to concentrate. Her eyes, shoulder and gun should be aligned properly or else her shots would be inaccurate. He screams at her to practice more since she can't land a single shot. Alice says she can't do it and how is she supposed to hit the target? It's been two hours in her hands, shoulder and waist all ache. And since she's going to war as a doctor she doesn't need to know how to shoot. Alice's brother says she hope doesn't need a gun but what if she's in danger and the gun saves her life so if she feels even the slightest bit of remorse for worrying her family, she should pick up the gun. Alice realizes her big brother is forcing her because if she ends up in the worst case scenario, he wants her to have the largest chance at survival and she apologizes to him. He tells her he also has to prepare for the war so he has no time to look after her. She has to focus a little bit more. Alice says she must come back alive no matter what if she wants to see her father, mother and both of her brothers again. 
This time she'll and to tell them sorry for making them. Worry and that she loves them. Alice finally hits three shots in the evening and she tells her brother and asks him if she did well but he says she only made three shots out of 100. Rounds, Alice wonders if it will hurt him to compliment her but he touches her head and tells her. She made some progress though she still has a lot to learn. Alice says that was praise but he says it is nowhere close to praise and tells her to keep on practicing by herself since he needs to go back to the palace. Alice's brother asks her when she will be going back home but Alice says her father and second brother might still be angry. He tells her not to say that and that their father, mother and Chris are all worried about her and have no idea of her whereabouts and he asks her to go back and apologize before she goes to war. Alice goes back home and her father hugs her and says he loves her so she must be careful. Time went by in the preparation for the second expedition of the Britia Empire was successfully completed. Chris asks Alice to be careful and says he should also be going with her but Alice tells him doesn't he remember what happened when he decided to go and got scolded by their mother and she tells him not to worry much about her. Chris says the leaving ceremony is the next day and that her coming of age ceremony will be on the battlefield but she tells him not to worry. Chris says she will take part in the departure ceremony and make a speech right and she says yes she has practiced many times. The people are chanting long live the Britia Empire and Alice says they are finally departing. The emperor addresses the people and after him Prince Linden also addresses the people and says when they return they'll have a feast to celebrate. It's Alice's turn to give her speech and she's nervous. She also wonders if she's qualified to give a speech but she finally addresses the people. After her speech the prince holds her hand and Alice wonders if it's for the soldiers to see. Prince Linden thinks that in the end he couldn't stop Alice from going to war, even if he tries to rush her back in the middle of the war he's sure she won't listen so all he can do is protect her. A servant asks Prince Michael what he's doing and he says he came to see his mother and the servant says isn't there a ceremony? But Prince Michael says he would have to listen to his father chatter if you went so he sent the head deputy first. The servant says he has to go back. But Prince Michael says what's the big deal? If he doesn't see her he will have to wait for the war. To end he just wants a glance. Prince Michael enters the room and his mother throws a glass cup at him which breaks. Prince Michael asks the servant to go and get her medicine and he tells his mother he's going to the Krim Peninsula where their people are killed in the war. He will bring happiness then ascend to the throne and make her empress so she must get better. Prince Michael says regardless of the throne he really wants to travel, and it would be fun to go. With Alice, she would study medicine and he would be her guard. Regardless of whether he becomes the emperor or not he'd ask her to travel with him but he says who's he kidding? Across the Britia Empire, at the Krim Peninsula in the eastern part of the western continent, Louis Nicholas is reading a newspaper from the Britia Empire, and he says his father is too strict with the media that the Republic's newspaper couldn't write anything. He reads that the crown princess is going to war and he says Alice is beautiful and he wants to have her, he says if defeats the Imperial Army he could take her and she will be a trophy for his victory. Whether it's her or the battle between the Republic or the Empire, the war is certainly interesting. Prince Michael asks Alice if she has ever been on a boat like the one they are on and Alice says, no it's really big. He tells her they haven't left the empire and he asks her if she's still seasick but Alice says the wind is really nice so she's alright. Michael tells Alice they are headed to the port of Samborough in Romanoff Ridge, which is the private property of royalty and when they get there, they will have to travel by land so she should make sure she's ready. He tells her if she doesn't know how to ride a horse she can ride with him but she tells him to forget it because if she rides with him the ladies who are waiting for him in Londo will hate her and Michael says that going too far. Prince Linden wonders since when Michael and Alice had a good relationship and he wonders what they're talking about that's making Alice laugh so happily whereas her expression was completely different when he was with her. Linden thinks about how to make Alice feel comfortable around him and wonders if she should ask someone. Alice's older brother asks Linden if there's anything he can help him with but Linden has a flashback and says it's nothing. Prince Linden looks at a file and says it is bad. Soldier reports to him that they've lost half of the second legion of the expedition and the local support army of 150,000 that started in Romanov is struggling in the northern part of the Krim Peninsula and it is presumably due to Louis. Nicholas the Scorpion of the Desert. Prince Linden says they've got to adjust their strength first. 
the support army and the remnants of their army combined total up to 320,000 and there are around 430,000 zero enemy troops, which puts them at a numerical disadvantage. They have lost over a 100,000 soldiers but Lyndon says fighting will be worth it and Marshal Miguel says after. All they're the great imperial army of Britia but the scorpion of the desert is quite irritating they are not sure what tricks he will use next. Prince Lyndon says dealing with a sly scheme is simple and that they don't need to resort to underhanded methods. They won't be fooled by their tricks. They will attack head on. Lyndon thinks that he and Louis Nicholas didn't settle their score in the Angeli War two years ago, but they will definitely settle it this time. Alice and a soldier arrive at the hospital and Alice asks if it's really a hospital and the soldier says it's the rear field hospital and it's under the control of headquarters. Alice says that the wards are filthy and the patients. Wounds are poorly damaged and she thinks it will do nothing for the soldiers or even less than nothing. Normally they won't get infected but here the wounded soldiers are going to infect one, another and die. Alice says it's not a problem that can be solved by treating one or two people. Everything must be rectified. She has to meet the person in charge. A drunk man introduces himself to Alice as Lieutenant Haynes, the head of the field hospital. Alice tells him she has something to say about the patients in the hospital and she tells him in order for them to be treated properly, the environment needs to be improved immediately. Haynes says the ward's environment is not good so the patients are ill and he says Alice might not know it but they are in the middle of a war and those are the circumstances. Alice says she also knows that the environment of the battlefield is bad but at the very least they should make an effort to give the wounded soldiers the best treatment possible right. Haynes says that's true but it's outside of his control. He has only been told to run the hospital. If she wants to improve the hospital she will have to talk with the command logistics office who are in charge of supplying the hospital with materials. Alice says Haynes is clearly neglecting his responsibilities. At the headquarters a soldier asks Alice to come inside and introduces himself as John in charge of supplies. John asks if she's there to talk about the field hospital to which Alice says yes and explains that if they want to treat the wounded soldiers they must rectify the ward. John says he understands and now that she has brought it up he will find a chance to discuss it with the boss and he asks Alice to leave. Alice thinks about how she is not taken seriously and about how even with outstanding medical abilities she won't be able to solve it easily. She needs some political power. Alice says her medical achievements may be outstanding but she doesn't have a formal position. So she's only able to suggest things and not make decisions. The title of crown princess is respectable but it doesn't carry much power. The imperial army is also a century old army even if she did have power as the crown princess. She won't be able to use it at will and she thinks of how to save the wounded soldiers. Prince Lyndon calls Alice's name and asks her what she's doing at the headquarters. Alice greets the prince and he asks her if she's there for something. Alice wonders if she should talk to him about it and the prince tells her if she has something to say she can tell him. Alice says it's about the field hospital and the prince asks if they're supporting her but Alice says no Major John said he'd discuss it with the boss but he didn't give her a definite answer. The prince says he is John's superior so he will listen to what she has to say and he tells her they should get a room and discuss it in more detail. In the room Lyndon pours Alice a cup of tea to which he sees she is uncomfortable about this. Lyndon tells her if she doesn't like this tea he's going to get her a new cup but Alice says she's just flattered and that she's going to drink it but she finds it a little hard to drink. Lyndon says he feels terrible that Alice looks so uncomfortable. Prince Lyndon asks Alice if she's trying to say what's necessary to rectify the environment of the field hospital and she says she will. She says that with the current state of the hospital, a healthy person could get sick, let alone an injured person trying to get treated. Lyndon asks what the Imperial Army has to gain from improving the environment and what will they be investing in. Lyndon thinks that regardless of what Alice asks he will agree but he still has to consider the specifics in mind. Alice tells him the benefit of fixing the hospital environment is that the death rate of the soldiers will be 10 times lower than it is now. Lyndon asks if she's certain and Alice says yes, but rectifying the environment will include treating the sewage properly as well as obtaining adequate medical supplies and the necessary manpower. Alice remembers that after the environmental reform of military hospitals in Europe during the middle half of the 19th century, the death rate of soldiers was reduced by 20 times and the death rate went from 42% down to 2%. The mortality rate of 42% is consistent with the current mortality in their field hospital. Lyndon thinks that the amount of support Alice can get is minimal, 
and he also hopes that her plan can be implemented. Lyndon says he understands and he'd like to help but he can't decide how to implement the plan on his own. In the case of an emergency, he is the commander, in chief can make a decision but not at the moment. Lyndon asks Alice to come to the headquarters in two days time and convince everyone with her plan at the meeting. If her words are able to persuade them he promises to carry out the rectification of the hospital. Alice thanks the prince for talking to her and he asks if that helped and she says yes. Prince Lyndon says since he has helped her she should be able to do something in return for him. Alice asks him if he has any wishes and he says she should smile for him. Alice smiles. Awkwardly, Lyndon tells her to smile again and this time be happier about it. Lyndon walks up to Alice touches her face and tells her she's beautiful. Alice tells him she's going to take her leave, and rushes out and stands in front of the door. Lyndon says he will have to ask Marshal Miguel for some alternative method even if he isn't particularly trustworthy. Lyndon says he's going crazy and asks himself why he likes Alice. Alice remembers what the prince told her and she shakes her head not to think about it and she says there are only two days left so it doesn't matter what the prince said she has to arrange the information. Two days later at the headquarters meeting a soldier reads that the Democratic Army has stopped attacking the Western Army and the Putt Castle has been attacked in the East, however. The enemies pushed back after the Royal Highness's soldiers started attacking. The prince asks if that is all and says in that case Alice has something to say so they should listen to her. Alice introduces herself, says she's a doctor at the medic army and for the improvement of the survival rate of soldiers, she has something to say. The generals are not paying attention but Alice tells them that the death rate of the soldiers at the field hospital is more than 40% which means more than half of them are going to die if they are able to make the death rate a lot less. That would be a key to winning the war and she can lower the death rate 10 times the original state. The generals are surprised when one of them says he knows she saved Londo from the plague but isn't she exaggerating to think she can cut it down 10 times. Alice tells them to have a look at the information she has gathered. The information is about the cause of death for the past four months. The generals say how is that possible and ask if the information is correct. Alice says 80% of the injuries lead to death and she says when she started medicine at the medical university she was surprised by that information too. In her mind she remembers even with modern medicine. In the US Army there were more than 80% death rates from disease. As long as they can fix the environment in the field hospital they can protect themselves from infectious diseases and as a result the death rate will go down rapidly. The prince says he agrees they should do it. The prince says that if they can lower the death rate 10 times its original state why the hesitation. The prince then asks if anyone objects and they all say no. The prince says to fix the problem he will appoint Alice temporarily as the commander of the medical army but the generals say there's no such position in the emperor's army. The prince says they can just make it now and asks if that's a problem and continues wondering why there never was a position for taking care of soldiers medical needs. The prince says every war has tens of thousands of injured soldiers and that this new position does not conflict with military laws so there should be no problem giving her the position. The generals say the position is excessive since it's the highest rank below general before the prince questions them for calling it excessive and says this is a project that can lower the death rate almost completely and asks them who would be a better candidate. The prince says to be clear there's no one better than Alice for the position and they all kept quiet and the prince says it seems like they all agree. The prince tells Alice he has one condition and that she will be the commander. Alice asks him to say it and says to herself that she only wanted to ask for political help and now she's going to be the medical commander and also the first medical commander in history. The prince tells Alice she must achieve what she promised in three months then he will acknowledge her abilities and she will become the official medical commander but if she fails she will be held responsible for it all. Then they will consider her unqualified to participate in the war and she'll be resigned. The prince thinks that if Alice wants support, he will support her fully. For her to be able to do those things she has to hold a high position and he totally supports her. Even if she fails he can send her back home where she can be safe but he doesn't want Alice to be far away but he also doesn't want her to be in the middle of the war. The generals discuss among themselves after the meeting. They question about how even though Alice is the crown princess, can she handle the commander position and how can the death rate be reduced by that much? They say that, although it's the prince's decision some decisions can be wrong, with one guy mentioning that. The prince is still an ordinary person after all. One man said then when he was next to the 
Commander at the Angeli War, the commander was near perfection, especially when they were about to lose and the commander then turned the tables around and made them win against the Scorpion. The other general cuts him off and says they will see what will happen and his highness already said that if Alice fails to achieve what she promised, he's going to resign her from her position. Alice says her proposal has been accepted and that there's available space for temporary expansion. Because of his highness granting her the title, things have become faster and smoother. Alice sees that they are lacking some medical supplies and says it's weird because the budget shouldn't be so low and she asks a soldier to go and investigate. The soldier comes back with the results of the investigation and tells her the person in charge is Lieutenant Hayes and it looks like Lieutenant Haynes isn't properly managing the supplies or his duties and they've also acquired evidence of embezzlement. Alice asks the soldier to dismiss him and make sure he's punished and starting henceforth she will be in charge of the military hospital. Alice thinks that they don't have enough supplies since there are other items that require military. Funds like bullets, weapons, clothing and foods and she can't blindly ask for their budget to be raised. Alice writes a letter to her father and she says though they might not be as rich as the child of family but they should be able to handle this much at least. She also remembers how her father always told her their family accumulated their wealth for over 300 years as loyal subjects of the empire, and it's only right for them to return it to the people and she says she's sure her father will accept her request. The workers say the hospital rooms are noticeably cleaner now, and there are less cases of contagious diseases too. Of course, patients still come in since the war is raging on but it's all thanks to the lady with the lamp that everything has improved in such a short time. Alice sits by a patient's bed with a lamp and she tells him to be strong. He thanks her and asks if he will be fine and Alice tells him she will make sure he returns to his family. He thanks her with tears in his eyes and the soldiers that saw her call her the lady with the lamp. The mutterings of one soldier soon spread amongst the troops of the empire. Those who recovered spoke of her when they returned to the battlefront and many were touched by her deeds. Soon her story spread even to Britia Island. The people say House Clorence paid for the medical supplies of their soldiers and the people say they should join them since it's for their families. Alice sees the supplies sent from her families along with donations from people of the empire and she says with that much they won't be running out of supplies anytime soon. Dr. Fallen arrives at the hospital and he apologizes for being late and says they wanted to come earlier but they had things they had to take care of. Alice thanks Dr. Fallen for coming and says she's relieved so many volunteered to help. Two months passed by and the Empire's troops advanced under the command of Prince Linden. The war raged back and forth between the Empire's troops and the Army of the Republic, led by Louis Nicholas. However, thanks to Prince Linden's wise orders, the battle seemed to favor the Empire's side. Forces in the east were able to conquer the enemy's major forts and continued to march south. Meanwhile, Alice continued to improve the army's medical conditions. With everyone's help and support, they worked together to treat the injured according to their ailments and three months later the report on Alice's project to lower the death rate is submitted to the prince and he sees 2% instead of 20%. The prince says he couldn't believe it either but a lot of the injured were able to return to the battlefront. The prince says from 42% to 2% the death rate fell 20-fold in just three months. The generals say if the death rate is only 2% it means most of the injured survived and they say Alice's medical knowledge is God sent. And the soldier's morale is also high. As expected of the prince, he went ahead with such a shocking project because he knew she could do it. At the Krim Peninsula the generals say the enemy's defenses are quite strong. He is the Iron Prince after all they can't just break through and their master swordsman is also troublesome. When they are in close quarters, he and his sword knights use an aura charge to break down their formations in an instant. The generals say they're in an age of guns and cannons, yet they can't even fend off some soldiers using swords and another general says the aura knights are a relic from an old age but they still can block bullets. Louis Nicholas says the Aura Knights are frightening, but so is Romanoff's metamorphosis power. The Iron Prince hasn't joined the fight yet, but they need to have a backup plan for when he does. One of the generals hits his hand on the table and says they must go for an all-out attack since their troops outnumber them if they attack. All at once, even the Empire's army won't be able to stop them. Everyone suddenly keeps quiet and they tell Louis Nicholas what he thinks. Louis Nicholas asks his generals if they have heard of the lady with the lamp and they say doesn't that refer to the future fiancé of the prince and they said they heard she's at a military hospital near the Empire's headquarters. Louis Nicholas says that it has to Kofsk and he asks where the enemy's three forces are located. They tell him 
The western forces are in Vitran, and the main army is in Kofsk. In the east their troops have come all the way down to Fort Vakni. Louis says that's perfect they will hit all three forces at once focusing their soldiers on both the east and the west and this will be called the anvil. Operation, the generals say yes that they understand. Louis says he has waited three months, purposely weakening the fort's defenses so that the enemy would take it. But a simple all-out attack won't work. They have to keep in mind who they are up against and he says he will be able to see Alice once the operation is over, the lady with the lamp. Alice tells them to stop the bleeding and disinfect the wound. Alice says it's worthwhile but it's tiring and she hopes her father, mother and Chris are all doing well and she hopes she can see them after the war is over. There are several major battles until the end of war at least. But she's not sure if everything in the past will happen again. And there are many details she doesn't know since she didn't join the army in person back then. All she did was look up records of the war because of Chris. She wonders if Sir Ron is alright and she hopes nothing happened. She hasn't seen him at the hospital. If he had gotten hurt he would have been there so he must be. Alright. She then wonders if he was too injured to be sent to the hospital or if he had died in battle but she reassures herself that he should be fine and come back to return her mother's keepsake. Alice wonders why she's worried about Sir Ron when they are not in any kind of relationship. Prince Linden asks Alice why she's sighing and she mistakes his voice for that of Sir Ron. Alice wonders why she's mistaking Linden for Sir Ron when their voice and appearance are different and she wonders if it's because they have the same air about them. Alice asks Linden if he has come to visit the injured. He says yes and she thanks him for making the time. Alice thinks that it's all thanks to Linden that they were able to improve the military hospital and the people are amazed that he comes by so often to check on everyone. She then wonders if he was like that two years ago. Lyndon tells Alice he has something to tell her and she asks what it is. He hesitates at first and then brings out a bouquet of roses and greets Alice happy birthday. Lyndon says he was unable to take care of her during the last ceremony and this is her first birthday as an adult and he apologizes for not being able to celebrate it properly right now but he promises to do so once they are out of the war but Alice says it's quite alright and Lyndon asks if she does not like the flowers and she says roses are her favorite flowers and she thanks him. Lyndon says he's off and he asks Alice to visit the headquarters more often and make sure to come by his office to make her reports and also there's an advisory meeting the next day regarding the enemy's movements she should attend and Alice says yes she understands. Alice thinks about how the prince gave her roses in her past life even though she was his wife for nine years. He never once gave her flowers and he never gave her anything for her birthday. A lady asks Alice if the prince gave her the flowers. She says they're beautiful and to think he got her roses in winter. That means the prince really cares about her. Alice says it's not like that but the lady says he visits her every day even when he's busy but Alice says he's there to see the soldiers and definitely not her but the lady says that's odd since he always looks at her. Alice says she's sure the birthday present is from Len and he must have asked the prince to deliver. It's since he couldn't come in person but she remembers her brother doesn't even know when what month or what season her birthday is in. The next day Alice is greeted by soldiers at the headquarters and they ask her if there's something she needs and she says she's there for the advisory meeting but she came to see the prince before that. The soldier tells her an urgent message came from the front lines, so it will be difficult to meet him at the moment. Alice says there is a lot of time before the meeting so she guesses she should go check on the medical supplies for now. Major John greets Alice and she says she's there to discuss the disinfectants she talked about last time. John says that will be supplied through the Dukedom of Proushen and he says he will go and double check. It might take some time so she should wait there. Alice pulls out the casualty records and says sir. Ron couldn't be dead but maybe it will be better to know for sure. John asks Alice if there's something she needs to confirm so he can check it right away if necessary. Alice asks if it could be possible to look up a name and he says it's possible even with the first name and she tells him his name is Ron. Alice questions about what if she's unable to see Sir Ron again but she says no she's sure he would be alright. John tells her his name is not there and since his name is not on the list of casualties that means he's probably safe and Alice says she's relieved. John asks if she knows him personally and what unit he's in and she says she's not sure she just heard he will be joining the expedition. John asks Alice if she wants him to find him for her since he also manages the full list of officers so he could look up his name. Alice asks if that would take a long time but he says it won't and even if it did he would still do it regardless since she's their lady. With the lamp after all, Alice asks if he could please do that for him and he says of course she 
should wait a moment. Alice wonders if it's really alright and she says it's not like she's going to go see him she's just looking out for a friend. John asks Alice if she's sure Sir Ron is in the current expedition because he couldn't find his name anywhere and he looked through it three times but he couldn't find anyone named Ron. Alice while thinking about why Ron's name is not listed bumps into Albert and falls. She apologizes to him and he tells her she should be careful and she shouldn't be waiting around with her head in the clouds and he stretches his hand to help her up and he tells her to pay more attention from now on. Alice says of course he'd be hostile since she's from House Clorin's their rival and she says most aristocrats don't have a favorable opinion of her. Lyndon says the enemy is preparing an all-out assault and according to their informants they're calling it the anvil operation and they begin their emergency meeting. Alice says in the past the anvil operation was the enemy tactic that killed her brother not only was her brother killed the empire suffered a great deal from the damage. The council says 400 thousand soldiers from the Republic are marching in three groups towards their bases. Their eastern and western bound troops are more in number. It looks like they plan to hit their bases to the east and west harder since less soldiers are stationed there. The good news is that the 100,000 headed towards the central base is a mixed group of Moor and Krim soldiers. So then the 150,000 headed towards the other bases are elite soldiers, while the less trained are headed towards the central base. That means they plan to keep their central troops occupied while they hit their other bases. One of the generals says they may be a mixed group, but soldiers from Moor are laughable. It would be best to leave 50,000 to guard the headquarters and then send the rest to the east and the west and they say it's a good thing they noticed early. It won't be a problem as long as they send back up and the scorpion must be feeling anxious or why else would he plan a hasty attack. Alice thinks that it will be all over if they divide their troops since that's what the scorpion wants and she wonders what she should do. Nicholas thinks it's odd why would Louis go for such an obvious plan and he wonders what he's missing. Alice stands and asks if she could add her opinion and they ask what she has to say. Alice first apologizes for voicing her opinions in front of such experienced generals. She says in her opinion it is not an anvil operation but rather a chisel and hammer tactic which makes Lyndon wonder if she's thinking the same thing as him. Alice says while the anvil is a metaphor for an overall attack, the chisel and hammer symbolizes a focused attack. A force focused on one spot like a chisel and a hammer could break a boulder and she says in her opinion the scorpion wants them to divide their soldiers at the central base and use them as backup for each sides in other words he wants them to weaken the central base by decreasing the number of troops and the attacks headed to the east and west are a guise. Alice says the Republic troops on either side will turn and head for the center when their soldiers leave they will be vastly outnumbered. The council says if what she says is true they will surely be defeated but what proof does she have? Prince Lyndon chimes in saying he's suggesting this because of geographical factors and the distribution of our soldiers. Lyndon says their soldiers are stationed in a triangle around the central base and thanks to General Wright their troops too. The East have reached Fort Vakni. As for the Republic's troops, their first squad is headed to Femps in the West and their second to Coral in the East. Lyndon says Femps and Coral are. Both locations are connected to a fork in the road that leads to Kofsk, where the central base is, and it is easy for them to make a turn and march towards their base and Alice says yes and that they will be upon them before their troops from the East and West are able to react. But the council says how can she be sure that's the enemy's goal? and what will happen if the enemy doesn't take a turn. Alice contemplates if she should tell them something as she doesn't know if they will accept but she has to try. Alice says this her assumption but perhaps the scorpion of the desert wanted their troops in the east to march towards Fort Vakni. The council asks what she's implying and she says if their troops march towards Fort Vakni, they will be far from the central base. That means they will be unable to support them in an emergency. A general says Alice's assumption is quite ridiculous and says she's implying that their troops and general Wright were able to conquer Fort Vakni because it was a trap. Alice realizes that as she thought, they don't believe her and she wonders what to do because if they don't listen it might lead to more casualties. Albert stands up and asks if he may be allowed to say a few words. He starts by introducing himself as Lieutenant Colonel Albert de Childa, an advisor of the intelligence division and he'd like to add his opinion. Alice thinks that if Albert objects the discussion it will be over but he says he partially supports her and he says the intelligence division found many suspicious details about the takeover of Fort Vakni. To put it simply the Republic wasn't careful enough despite that fort being an important strategic point. The council asks him if he's saying 
the Republic purposely let them take Fort Vokny, and Albert says it's hard to say they are unable to collect definitive proof, however it's something to keep in mind and one thing is for certain. Their troops in the east are far from the central base, as Alice said they won't be able to help in a timely manner if there's an emergency. Alice is surprised Albert is helping her even though he's part of the aristocrats' party. Prince Linden says it's enough and that he has listened to all. They all have to say and here is his conclusion. 50,000 soldiers each will march from the central base to the east and west and that will be their guys. The generals ask Linden what he means and he says those group of soldiers will each leave towards the east and west and then hide and stand by near the central base so when the scorpion attacks the center they will be there. Back up. Linden asks Marshal Miguel to send a message to the western base and he asks him what the message will be. Linden says they should make a detour and follow the Republic's troops so that when their army is surprised by their three-sided attack, the west will hit their rear. One of the generals asks Linden what if the enemy doesn't hit the center and Linden says, if their troops lose he will take responsibility. Prince Linden says of course he's not betting on a gamble. He thought the enemy's attack was suspicious to begin with and he agrees with Colonel. Alice, Linden thanks Alice and tells her that her opinion was a great help in their decision and if they win the battle she's the one who should take credit. Prince Linden tells his generals that this time they will hunt the scorpion of the desert so they should prepare themselves. Alice calls Sir Albert and he asks what is it and Alice thanks him for helping her during the meeting but he says her thanks is unnecessary and that he must correct her because he didn't help her. They just happened to share the same opinion so she should not misunderstand the situation. Alice laughs because Albert is objecting so strongly which could also mean strong agreement. Albert asks her why she's laughing and she says nothing. He says he's leaving and Alice says alright. He should take care but he says no need because his room is there. Albert tells Alice his sister. Yulian sends her regards. She wrote it in her numerous letters to him but she should just send a letter to her directly. Alice thanks him for telling her and he tells her it's okay and she should hurry and go back. Alice asks Sir Albert to be careful in the field and he tells her to also be careful. Prince Linden is told the scout sent word the enemy is approaching their center near Kofsk, and they've about 300,000 enemy soldiers. The generals say Alice's words came true and ask themselves how she predicted it and the other general says if they hadn't listened they would have faced 300,000 enemies with only 50,000 soldiers. Linden thinks that the battle is near and their preparations are impeccable but the outcome is still unclear. A soldier tells Linden everyone is awaiting his orders and he says all right he's on his way. He says, the enemies are marching towards them, they have 300,000 soldiers, two times. Their own at the central base but they are prepared. Tonight they will celebrate in front of the head of the scorpion. Lady J asks Alice if their prince will win and Alice tells her of course so. She shouldn't worry. Alice thinks that luckily they were prepared but the outcome is still unknown. If all the troops fall the enemy will reach the hospital. In that case she will be taken hostage since she's the future fiancé of the Romanov prince. No, before that she may die from a gunshot or cannon fire. Alice slaps herself and thinks that nothing will change even if she's frightened. Everyone's doing their best so she has to trust them and she must do her job there. Alice tells the workers that the battle has begun and the wounded will be there soon. A huge battle will be raging outside, but their job there remains the same, they must help their patients. Their mission is to help as many as they can and they will do their job regardless of the outcome. At the battlefield Louis says that everything is going according to plan. A soldier brings him a message and tells him, the Empire's troops that were headed to the east and west half come back to attack their flanks. He then wonders how can that be and he tells his men to stay in formation and not panic. A soldier tells Louis their soldiers can't hold their position. He asks him what he means and he says it's the master swordsman. Louis says no way and he wonders who it was who saw through his strategy. He thinks that the Iron Prince might have been suspicious but he has always been careful. He wouldn't risk abandoning his soldiers in the east and west. He then says he won't forget this humiliation. Whoever it is he's going to make sure they pay. Louis then tells his army to retreat, fall back and fall into position but he suddenly gets scratched by a bullet to the head and he says they should just wait until he gets his revenge. Afterwards on Prince Linden's command, the 70,000 from the west attack the Republic's troops from the rear. The front, the flanks and the rear, the Republic's crumbled under the full siege. The battle that began in the morning finally came to an end the following day. The Empire's army marched towards the central area and expanded their territory. Simferpal, the capital of the peninsula was now under the influence of the Empire, and so the tides of war favored the Empire once again. 
The men shout honor to the emperor, honor to the prince and honor to our future empress. The workers scream that they need some painkillers and Alice tells them to use the gauze to stop the bleeding. Alice says thank god the damage wasn't that bad. And she says that she knows it's only wishful thinking but it would be nice if no one got hurt. She knows that she has to do the best since that's the only way she can help and then more people will be able to return to their families. Five days after the Battle of Kofsk a soldier tells Alice there will be a banquet to celebrate their recent victory. The soldiers will join and food and drinks will be provided and he says he hopes she can join them for dinner but Alice says she's sorry but she doesn't think she can go. Alice says there are too many patients at the hospital but he should please send her thanks but the soldier insists that it's only for a day. Alice says they don't have enough people to help at the hospital. Patients are dying even now because there's the one to treat them. If she leaves that means more people will die because there will be one less doctor so he should please send her. Regards, Lady J says shouldn't Alice attend the banquet since the prince personally invited her but Alice says it's alright. Someone comes to call Alice that there's a patient wounded by a grenade blast so she should hurry and she says she's coming. At the party the men are singing. Cheers to the Emperor, to Britia and to Dame Alice. Lyndon asks if Alice is not coming and the soldier says yes that there are too many patients she has to take care of, so she sends her. Apologies. The generals say what a pity, she's the one who should be acknowledged for their victory, yet she can't be there and the other general says isn't she working too hard and he heard that she barely sleeps and he's worried that she might be pushing herself too much, she won't even rest on a day like this. Lyndon thinks that he purposely invited her today so she could rest. In situations like this one must take care of their health first. She really doesn't listen which he finds bothersome. Alice tells the patient to cheer up a bit more and he will get better soon and he thanks her and says on days like this she doesn't even rest because of them. Alice says if he's really thankful, he should hurry up and get better and if the battle has ended he can go back to his family. Lady J asks Alice to follow her urgently and Alice thinks it's an emergency patient but Lady J takes Alice to a surprise dinner thrown by the prince in honor of Alice and he also sends a letter telling Alice to rest which causes her to blush. Alice then says they should all just celebrate since they've all worked hard. Alice says the ginger ale also tastes good even though she notes it would taste better if there's alcohol. Lady J says she could bring some from the barracks but Alice says a patient could come in at any time so she's got to stay sober. Lady J asks Alice if she drinks alcohol and she says she likes it which shocked everyone. She tells them she is a surgeon after all, and recalls going out for drinks after operations back in Korea. A girl mentions how the doctors in Rosedale Hospital also like alcohol and then Lady J asks Alice how she decided to be a doctor and she says it's because she likes it. They then tell her not to lie to them and ask if she is doing it because she wants to save people's lives or did she get a calling to do it while praying but Alice says it's just because she likes to be one that's why she chose to be one. Alice thinks that she's not that amazing because she just likes the job but she also knows she won't be a doctor for much longer. Alice then asks Dr. Fallen if there's something he wants to say and just then Prince Linden enters through the door and everyone greets him. They ask him what he needs in the field hospital and he says he came to see if they rested well. And he asks if the food matches their taste and they say yes and thank him for his attention. He says he's glad then and that they should not care about him and just enjoy their food and drinks. With comfort, Lyndon tells Alice she has to rest as well since she's always working so hard and Alice says no she's not. Alice wonders what reasons Lyndon came for if he wanted to encourage the people. Shouldn't he be checking up on the soldiers and not the people at the hospital? The doctor says it looks like he has to go to see the patients and Lady J asks to go with him and they all say they have to go. There's only one guy remaining and Lyndon asks him who he is and he says he's Baron Graham de Fallen and the prince questions him saying. Doesn't he have any patience to take care of? Fallen grits his teeth saying it looks like the others. Need his help and he also leaves. Lyndon is angry, wondering about Fallen. Alice then thinks about how there are only the two of them remaining so she says she has to leave also and she stands up to leave but Lyndon draws her back and tells her to stay so he won't be alone. Alice asks him what he means. He then questions her if she has to leave now due to a patient in urgent care. She tells him no there is not and asks if there is something he'd like to discuss with her. Lyndon who has managed to get Alice to stay with him now has no clue what to say. He thinks about what to say to make her happy and then remembers an old man telling him to speak eloquently and with humor to get her to like him. Lyndon thinks to himself about how humor and eloquence is not his forte. He then wonders how his brother is able to so effortlessly talk to girls. He then decides to tell her a joke Marshall Miguel told him about a bird flying over a gunshot. 
as he mutters the word gun Alice questions what he means by gun. Lyndon then shuts up as he knows this joke would end in an embarrassing disaster with Alice. To his dismay someone is now knocking at the door to which Alice tells them to come in. It turns out to be Lyndon's brother who asks if he is interrupting. Lyndon questions Michael on what he is doing here before Alice asks Michael if he has been doing all right. Michael responds only to Alice which makes Lyndon assertively re-ask Michael what he is doing here. It turns out Michael came to ask Alice how to be a surgeon. They question him why to which he tells that he wants to treat a patient that he thinks Alice cannot treat. He asks what to do if something is lodged in a person's waist area. Alice knows this is near the kidney and adrenal gland making it a very difficult operation. She tells him she will do it herself and asks where the patient is. Michael tells her near this hospital to which Alice tells Michael to bring him here. Michael says the guy cannot be brought here and starts to wonder if they should just let the man die off even if it is a relative. Alice then realizes the guy cannot be from the Romanoff family before Michael tells her it is Albert. She then shouts at Michael to bring Albert here immediately for the operation. Michael lets out a sigh and asks to talk to Elise privately outside. Alice agrees before Michael asks his brother for approval to which Lyndon says to make it quick. Michael tells her it is too risky to bring him here as a rifle grenade is lodged within Albert. Alice lets out a shout in shock before Michael continues that it was done by one of the Republic's men since this empire does not use that specific weapon. It is currently wedged in Albert's belly like a bullet but the problem is that it may explode upon impact. Michael tells her that one wrong move will take out everyone here. Michael tells her that they should have just abandoned him but he cannot bring himself to do that. So he wants Alice to teach him to be a surgeon so he can take all the risk. Alice in her mind knows that it's impossible for Michael to do this surgery, and that she might be the only one on the peninsula who can do this. She also knows that even with aura powers Michael could not survive such a close-range explosion. She gulps before asking Michael to take her to him. He yells at her for asking this but she insists that she will decide what to do after checking up on Albert. At nighttime the two travel through the forest before they find Albert who has also lost one of his legs. Alice stares in sadness before two men call her Dame Alice. It is Sir Carmen and Laos who are both from hostile aristocratic families but at this moment they beg her to save Albert. They swear on their family's name to never forget this deed if she helps Albert. Alice thinks to herself about how even if Albert survives this he can never go back to politics yet two aristocrats continue to beg for his life. This causes her to realize how highly respected Albert must be. Michael tells the two to get up and stop begging as he believes he is the one who will be doing this operation. They question this before Michael gets angry about how they want Alice to be put at risk. The two get silent as Michael reassures them he can use his aura in case anything happens. Alice tells him to let her see his wounds beforehand. As she removes the bandages she wonders if this really is a grenade wound as it looks completely different from the papers. Michael tells her a scientist has modified grenades to be tiny enough to act as bullets. The adjustments essentially made the bullets very hard to control. Sometimes the bullets would be unresponsive while other times they would be very sensitive. It could be lodged in someone's body and never go off until the moment someone touches it. She tells him that this is dangerous to which he tells her to just teach him already. She then lets out a chuckle saying he never could have pulled this off. He tells her all he thought he had to do was just cut around. She then goes off telling him he had to sever liver ligaments, lift the liver, and staunch the flow of blood. She continues that the surrounding soft tissue has to then be removed by a scalpel before separating the adrenal gland from the kidney. After saying everything she asks if he can do all that while avoiding the grenade. She tells him that it's not just about cutting someone up and a surgeon has to be prepared for all situations. She tells Michael he would just end up agitating the grenade taking Albert out. Michael asks her if there is anything they can do to which Alice tells him there is a way but it won't be 100% guaranteed to work. He asks her what that is to which she thinks to herself for a moment about how she wishes there was another option. She tells him she will do the operation and cut off the adrenal gland and kidney near the wound. She notes to herself that the grenade will be tricky but there is no one else who can handle this operation. Michael then tells her she can't risk her life and that they should just forget this. She tells him this operation will not be that difficult and that it only requires severing surrounding organs without touching the grenade and removing the damaged glands. She tells herself to just think about this as a fiacromocytoma operation which is a rare tumor that develops in the adrenal gland which if overstimulated will lead to excessive hormone secretion putting the patient in danger. She tells Michael that she will stop the operation midway if it gets too dangerous, and that if she doesn't at least try Albert will for sure not make it. Michael tells her he will allow this only under the condition that he is there with her. He continues that she must agree to this term and that she will need someone to assist her anyways so she might as well accept him. 
Alice nods in agreement before Michael tells her that in the worst-case scenario he will protect her from the explosion even if he has to sacrifice himself, to which Alice tells him she'll make sure that won't happen. This causes Michael to let out a smile before Alice tells the two aristocrats to notify the hospital to prepare for a surgery before evacuating everyone in the building. Two aristocrats call Alice Dame and tell her they understand before heading off in the forest. Alice and Michael then both decide to hurry and move Albert. A rustle can be heard in the bush before someone questions them asking if they plan on actually carrying out such a dangerous operation. This person turns out to be Prince Lyndon. Alice asks what he is doing here before Lyndon calls this all nonsense and tells Alice she is risking her life. Alice tells Lyndon that she must complete this operation immediately as Albert's life is in danger and since she is the only one capable of carrying it out. Michael chimes saying he'll make sure to protect Alice as Lyndon continues to look frustrated. He then shouts at his brother asking what if something goes wrong. He then shouts at Alice asking what if she gets hurt and if she does heal. Lyndon stops, mid-sentence to which Alice questions what he'll do. Lyndon then turns to Michael to shout something again, before Michael grabs him by the neck telling him to calm down. This completely angers Lyndon whose eyes start to flash. Their powers clash as Alice turns away. Michael then karate chops Lyndon's neck causing him to pass out to Alice's dismay. She asks what Michael was thinking as an attack to the neck is dangerous and could have gone wrong. Michael jokingly says the prince looked agitated so he lightly gave Lyndon an 8-hour nap. He then tells Alice that they should be getting to the hospital to which she agrees. As Alice stares at Lyndon who lays on her lap she wonders what he would have done if she got hurt. She then decides for now to just focus on the operation at hand. Michael then wonders if he's going to jail again for hitting his commander brother to which Alice tells him to just beg for forgiveness when his brother wakes up. Alice tells Michael to put on gloves to avoid spreading germs to the abdominal cavity. As he puts them on he asks if Alice is afraid. She tells him of course as they could die if things go wrong. He tells her it's not too late to change her mind and that Albert would understand if she did. To which Alice tells Michael she chose this profession and that she is a doctor. She tells him she does not want to do this operation but cannot turn away since she might be able to save Albert's life. She continues that she's the only one who can do this. She thinks to herself that she wishes there was another option but as a doctor she must take risks despite knowing the dangers. Doctors can get infected or get into accidents trying to transport patients but despite all that they must be willing to take these risks as it is their job to save people. She tells Michael they've delayed long enough and tells him to follow her instructions as they begin. She raises her blade and tells him she is opening the abdominal cavity. As she does this Michael stares at her in shock. He thinks to himself about how he's finally seeing why his brother fell for her. He thinks that this feeling is getting bad and that he might get greedy if this continues. A news can be heard as the scalpel moves across the body. Michael sweats as Alice tells him to hold the liver in position. She tells him to lift it up carefully so she can cut the ligaments attached to the liver. She notes to herself that she'll have to take extreme caution but it was fortunate the grenade missed the liver. She then asks Michael how much force is needed to activate the grenade. He tells her he is unsure as it is a failed invention that may go off easily or not explode at all and that they should assume it only takes the slightest touch. A cut causes Albert's body to flinch, alarming both Alice and Michael. Silence then ensues as nothing happens before Michael sighs and says this is nerve-wracking. Alice tells herself that this is fine since she has done a fiacromacetoma operation before and that she should just focus on stopping the bleeding. Alice then proceeds to continue to cut ligaments. As Michael asks what they will do now Alice thinks to herself that she must delicately go deeper in and tie them using a thread. She tells him she will tie the vessels with a thread into a not so tight knot so that it won't be dangerous. Michael then grabs Alice's hand and tells her that she'll only need her right hand to do this and that he will hold her left one so that he can protect her in case something happens. Narrator interjection here but this dude needs to back off of Alice. She pulls her hand away before telling him she'll be alright. She then carries on to tie the vessels using the thread. After she finishes, she tells herself the next step is to tie the vessels above the kidney and remove the adrenal gland from the abdomen. She also notes that doing this will require a scalpel and other tools as well and that she must avoid the grenade at all costs. She then tells herself to forget that there is a grenade as it will only make her more nervous. She then grabs the scissors and continues to make cuts as Michael calls her amazing. He wonders how she can handle such an operation before a tool slips out of her hand. Michael shouts her name as she stands in dismay. Silence then ensues again. Michael then asks her if she's alright to which she tells him she made a mistake and that she's alright. She stares at her hand as she thinks about the mistake. 
She notes to herself that maintaining focus is not the issue since she's done 10-hour operations before. It's the grenade which can explode at any moment that is getting to her. She shakes her head trying to relax and believe in herself. She then calms down to tell Michael she will continue to which Michael promises to himself that he will protect her at all costs. Alice continues to make clips with her scissors before she finally finishes severing all connections. She then stares in shock as the weapon finally becomes visible. The grenade penetrated the gland into the retroperitoneal space which is the space behind the large membrane of the abdominal cavity that supports and connects internal organs. Basically this means she cannot remove the grenade without touching it which causes her to freak wondering what she should do. She thinks to herself about scraping a portion of the retroperitoneal space from behind the gland but notes that this is too complicated. She wonders what she should do before realizing that it is logical to stop here. She then remembers back to when her father told her to be careful and to not even get scratched. She squeezes her hand and then wonders what to do as she remembers her whole family. This has turned out to be even more dangerous and more likely to take her life and she wonders what would happen to her waiting family if it did. She then thinks back to Albert's kind father who told her to take good care of Albert if he ever got hurt. She then remembers how Eulian would send her regards to Alice through Albert. Alice then gulps before telling everyone in her mind she's sorry as she raises her tool. She continues to squeeze her hand as she tells her family she cannot give up despite it being dangerous and to never conduct another dangerous operation again if she succeeds. She calls upon her family and the Lord to guide her through this. She then hunches down and begins to start scraping. This carries on for a while before Alice tells herself only a little more. However, as she moves her tool, it hits directly on the grenade with a clunk. The pair get shocked as Alice internally shouts that it is going to explode. She tells her family she loves them and begs them to forgive her. She also thinks of Sir Ron and then Lyndon as well before wondering why. Michael shouts for Alice and then grabs her to protect her. She shouts your highness before he tells her he will not let her get hurt and will use all the aura he can to do so. Silence again ensues for the pair. As silence continues Michael then calls Alice's name. She then says yes your highness before he asks if they are still alive. Michael then sighs as he realizes the grenade was inactive but Alice continues to tremble. She is in tears and cannot properly speak before she apologizes and says that she was just surprised. Michael rubs her head to reassure her as he tells her that it must have been scary for her and that she should let it all out now. As he holds her she tells him she really does not want to die as he continues to tell her it is okay. She apologizes again as she says this is an improper way to act to which Michael tells her to cry as much as she wants. She then nervously asks Michael to move as he starts to get confused. She then gives him a shove telling him to let go. He then chuckles asking if she got hurt when she fell to which she says she is fine and will be needing new gloves so that they can continue. She then tells him they will finish quickly and in her mind notes there is no need to hold back anymore since the grenade is inactive. As she continues to scrap, Michael asks her if they can travel together if they get the chance later. She questions this before he tells her it will be a fun medical volunteering service tour as Alice can go around treating people with him as her guard. She then chuckles as she says yes since that does sound fun. He asks if she really means it to which she continues to chuckle saying only if they get the chance and who knows. As she continues the operation she asks where he would go before he says he does not know as he has not traveled much out of this place. She then asks about possibly Ryo in the east to which Michael talks about how the east is too hot but he does recall liking the culture of Ching in the east. He then says he's never been there Ryo but heard that it is pretty and quiet before wondering if they should go there. He then asks how about the new lands with large lakes and waterfalls to which Alice says she's never been there, and that they should go. Michael then asks Alice if she can call him Mill which causes Alice to get shocked. She then thinks back to a flashback before telling him yes Mill. He then says to call him that from now on. The grenade with surrounding tissue is now fully removed. Alice places the tools back on the tray before sighing and saying that it is done and that no one has died. Michael groans in exhaustion before saying they should head back now. Michael wonders what will happen to Albert to which Alice tells him that Albert will need to be treated for a while before being taken back to the mainland as he cannot fight anymore. She then thinks to herself about how Albert's battle has only begun as he still has to rehabilitate but since the surgery went well his abdomen at least won't be an issue for him anymore. She notes that the ankle injury will still be an issue though and make it difficult for him to be the next heir to his house. Michael then tells Alice to go rest which causes her to say yes your highness. This causes him to lecture her again saying that they agreed on calling him Mill from now on. She then smiles as she says alright Mill. He then leaves telling her goodnight and to dream about him as he blows a kiss. Alice snorts as she asks why she would do that. 
A stomp then can be heard in the hall which causes Michael to turn and wonder who's there as this building should be evacuated. A man then tells Michael that they meet again. Michael notes that this is Brigadier General and knows what this means to which the man tells Michael he did not want to meet him again like this. Michael then tells him to pretend this did not happen as he does not want to go to jail again. The general tells him that he must follow orders and asks if Michael already knows his crimes. The man then tells Michael his crime is assaulting the commander to which Michael is shocked his brother is awake already. Michael then whines saying he doesn't want to go and thinks to himself about how petty his older brother is and that he was going to apologize later anyways. With his arms tied up the man tells Michael to just think of it as a short break to which Michael complains about the roaches and the man replies that they are harmless. The man then calls for Alice and says the commander asked if the surgery went well to which Alice says it was a success. The man tells another guy to report this immediately before telling Alice to come with them as well. He tells her that she disobeyed a superior's order and should come quietly with them. At Simferpol, the capital of the Krim Peninsula, someone asks the ruler what to do now as the enemy is right in front of the capital. The man continues saying he's sure the ruler has a plan but the citizens are currently in fear. Louis then asks the count if he's the one that's afraid and if the count trusts them to handle the situation. He then asks Louis why he would be afraid as no one including the Iron Prince is as great as Louis to which Louis tells the man to leave then. He says he will take care of the war and tells the Count to tuck his tails between his legs and leave. This embarrasses the Count who then apologizes and runs off. An aide asks Louis if he was too harsh since the Count still has influence over the people. Louis then says that man will get pushed off to the side once the war is over and that after defeating the Empire they will set up a puppet government anyways. He then hears that the Lady of the Lamp was the one who saw through the plan anvil. He then covers his face in anger as he notes she ruined two of his plans and must get her back for this. Louis then asks his aide Fabian about when the gift from the Dark Lands will arrive to which Fabian says in a few days. Louis then asks about the Sword Knight hostages they will use as sacrifice to which Fabian says they are being treated as royal hostages with Morian servants as Louis asked for. Louis says to make sure they don't suspect anything to which Fabian asks if they must resort to methods like this to win. He continues calling it inhumane and it would cause uproar if the Republic's media found out to which Louis says it is war, and they must win no matter what. Fabian continues asking what if it fails and that Alice is a part of the Empire before Louis interrupts saying he will not listen to this anymore and tells Fabian to just go check up on the hostages. Fabian then sweats before saying that he understands. Later at another building, Alice is told she is on residential probation here. The man tells Elise she will be confined here until further notice but some legal problems may arise since the pair are not married yet but it should be fine since this is a royal order. Alice then asks the man if the room is too nice to which the man tells her that it was a direct order from Lyndon for her to be confined in this room. She asks if she is on standby to which the man tells her yes and that soldiers will deliver her meals and that there is a bathroom with a tub inside as well. Someone else then whispers to Brigadier General something as Alice continues to wonder if this is too luxurious for a probation. The Brigadier General then calls Alice before telling her the commander wanted him to pass her a message. The message Lyndon passed on was telling Alice she did a good job. The man also says personally that he admires Alice as well. He tells her that Lyndon was the angriest he's ever seen but something like this won't rock such a strong couple to which Alice says they aren't that close yet. The Brigadier General then pleads with Alice to make up with Lyndon and says that the commander is cute sometimes especially when he was a child during which the Brigadier General served as his guard. Alice questions this but the General insists it is true before saying he must leave now. Alice then flops in bed and wonders what is going on before remembering when Lyndon told her to rest as she works all the time. She then wonders if he purposely left her in this room so she could rest. She then thinks about the message he just sent and wonders if he was always this nice. She continues to wonder why he is worried about her before deciding to get some sleep first. As she lays peacefully she thinks about how relaxed she finally feels. In the morning someone brings Dame Alice her meal. She notes that it is steak again and wonders why she can't just go get it herself instead of having it delivered. She thanks the soldier for bringing her the meal as he gleefully tells her no worries. He says the honor is all his as a bunch of other soldiers glare enviously. As he goes outside all the men argue about who will get to bring Alice her meal tomorrow. The sun shines brightly in the room as Alice stares outside wondering how the hospital and Albert are doing. Sir Laus and Carmen had visited her in secret at one point to inform her Albert was doing fine. She starts going through the closet and wonders why only men's clothes are here, noting that they are all well made and probably for royalty. She tilts her head wondering who these could belong to. At nighttime Alice takes a shower and afterwards notes that it was refreshing. 
She then reaches to open the door but as it creaks open Alice sees a figure in the room. She then lets out a scream before the guy turns around to see her. She shouts asking who it is to which the person says it's me. She then calms down and looks out the door to see Lyndon who apologizes for not realizing she was bathing. She asks why he is here to which he tells her this is his room. He continues that he ordered her probation to be in his room. She is in shock as Lyndon blushes while telling her to change as she might catch a cold. Moments later we see Alice thinking about how she has to wear pajamas in front of the prince as her uniform is getting washed up. She then decides to question why he ordered her probation here to which he says no other rooms were available. He then says she will soon be a part of the royal family so she cannot be kept in any normal room and mentions that he's hardly ever here anyways since he's busy with the army. Alice notes to herself that his statement actually is quite reasonable before saying goodnight and that she will take her leave now since he's returned here. Her hand then gets pinned at the door as Lyndon asks her why she is leaving. She tells him because he has returned to which he tells her she can just stay and rest here wondering where she would even go in pajamas. Alice's heart beats louder and she wonders why he is doing this before thinking Lyndon might want her body. She then thinks that this is nothing like him since in the past he did not want her nor did she seek another woman. She continues to hold her face before Lyndon tells her that this is the most comfortable room and that she should rest for a couple days after overworking herself. She then questions him if she can just rest only to which Lyndon asks her what else she would even do. Alice breathes a sigh of relief as she knows the prince was never into those things. She then starts to lay on the couch thinking she can rest comfortably now and about how he's not upset. As she lies she wonders why he got so mad earlier before Lyndon asks her what she's doing. He asks her if the couch is uncomfortable and tells her to just lay in the bed. She tells him no need to which he asks if she hates him that much. She tries to tell him of course not before she awkwardly makes the excuse the king-size bed is too small. She then tries to say the sofa is more comfortable than the bed to Lyndon's disbelief. He finally lets out a sigh and asks if she's worried he'll do something to her. She tells him not at all to which he tells her they have duties before marriage and to not worry as he will not touch her till then. He then steps up as he has no choice and to Alice's shock stands right over her. He calls him your highness before he grabs her and lifts her off the couch. He tells her to stay still as he won't lay a hand on her to which she covers her face thinking he has already done so. She gently places her on the bed and tells her the bed is wide enough so she can just sleep here. He then apologizes for getting upset with her earlier and then says he just got worried since he thought she might get hurt. She then tells him she was terrified which causes him to ask what before she tells him she was terrified of dying during that operation and that she felt exhausted after it. She then says she felt much better after hearing the message that he sent her. She then abruptly turns around and tells him to sleep well. He continues to stare at her before nighttime ensues and Alice lies in silence. She thinks about how he is a different person from her past life because he is caring and warm. As she thinks about Prince Lyndon for a while she decides to stop thinking about it so she can finally fall asleep. Night continues but then Lyndon calls for Alice and asks if she is still awake. He notices that she is fast asleep and wonders if she sees him as a man at all. He tells her that he planned on just checking up on her, but he couldn't stop himself from wanting to be with her even if it was only for a short moment like this. He sighs as he wonders if she was surprised and about why he cannot control himself around her. He thinks about how as long as she looks and smiles at him, he is willing to give up everything. She then starts to make strange noises which causes Lyndon to wonder if she has a nightmare as she continues to mutter telling someone to not die. He stares in silence as she continues calling for help as she does not want to die herself. He wonders if this is the same dream from before as Lyndon whispers to her that he does not want to see her suffer. He then hugs her and pleads with her not to be in pain even in her dreams. In the morning someone asks about the prisoners to which someone replies nothing out of the ordinary. Fabian mentions that they are Aura Knights and asks if they showed any aggressive behavior to which the other man says they have not due to their hands being tied. Fabians thinks to himself about how much of a hassle Aura Knights are even though their Aura energy is not that special. He notes that Aura is energy that flows in nature and that Knights incorporated special breathing techniques from the East to control this energy. He also mentions how there is a mysterious power handed down in the Romanov family that is almost like magic and that only Britia's royals can use it. He then wonders to himself if it's alright to carry out Louis's plan as he believes there must be a limit even at war. Fabian inquires about who is taking care of the Aura Knights since the Knights' hands are tied to which the guard mentions it is the Morians and the original group were switched with the new batch of Morians a few days ago. Fabian then asks if their own soldiers are keeping their distance from the new Morians to which the man says yes. The guard then asks Fabian why they are to keep away as the Morians just look ill and even bleeding. 
Fabian tells the guard to just make sure no one leaves prison and not to get close to the Morians. He then tells the guard that they will release the prisoners to the Empire in a few days which shocks the soldier as they are releasing sword knights. Fabian continues that the prisoners will be exchanged for some of their own men who are imprisoned. In the beautiful forest, Michael yells at Mac and Jack as they must have been clumsy to get caught as prisoners. The two are shocked Michael came out to get them before Michael says of course he came and asks if the Republic troops harass them. They tell him they were treated well despite having their hands tied as they were given Morian servants and then question why Michael looks unwell. Michael says he suffered due to someone being petty and that no way he's going to prison again and would even be a deserter to avoid it. He then tells the boys to just head back for now as Louis stares with binoculars in the distance. Louis notes this is going well and hopes the prince gets tangled up in this as well. Louis notes that the knights will stay in a small city named Pravu in Simferpol which will likely be the base of the new empire. He thinks to himself that he will just wait for the empire's army to fall apart and thinks about how Alice has ruined two of his plans. He hopes she won't die from this as they have to meet soon. Lady J calls Alice an amazing director before Dr. Fallen tells Alice her operation was too rash and wonders why she took the risk alone. She apologizes before Dr. Fallen tells her to alert them next time to which Alice agrees. Lady J reminds her how dangerous that was and mentions how angry Lyndon was. She recalls seeing Lyndon wanting to angrily rush in the operating room but was worried it would startle Alice who was at work. Alice is surprised to hear about this before letting out a sigh. She then decides to just go see the patients now and asks if any new ones have arrived. Alice is still in a daze about all this and walks right into the wall alarming Lady J. Lady J asks if Alice is alright and mentions how Alice has been overworking herself lately. Alice says she's alright which prompts Lady J to wonder what Alice is thinking about. Lady J thinks Alice is overworking and exhausting herself on purpose to run away from something on her mind. Someone then alerts Alice that His Majesty is here. Alice asks if he is here to visit the patients to which the girl says yes. Alice then tells the girl to have Dr. Fallen guide Lyndon around the facility which prompts the girl to ask if Alice does not plan to go with the prince. Alice nervously dashes away saying she has patients to check up on. As Alice begins to sweat she starts to recall memories she has with Lyndon. When he said her smile was nice, telling her happy birthday, and worrying if she got hurt. She covers her mouth and blushes as she remembers the night he hugged her. She recalls him being so warm and gentle that she could not push him away. She then wonders about how they are not married and he promised not to touch. So she should have pushed him away that night but wonders why she could not bring herself to do it. She then realizes it was because she did not hate it. She then starts to feel gloomy remembering how Lyndon hated Alice in her past life. It eventually leads to her burning on a stake yet she does not hate Lyndon and really does not know why he is so kind to her now. She then tells herself no and that she's been ignoring the truth. She is shaken by his presence just like before and wonders if the same fate will repeat in this life as well which makes her afraid. The next day Michael comes in to greet Alice and ask if his brother has been nagging her. She asks Mill what he is doing here to which he says it's not serious and that he caught a cold. She is surprised that he of all people caught a cold to which he tells her he's got a chills and has been coughing a bit. Alice is surprised because Aura Knights are generally much more healthy than regular people. Michael thinks this is due to the peninsula's longer winters and decided to come by here to get some pills. Alice thinks something is off and tells him he should get a proper examination. It turns out Michael's temperature is 39.3 degrees Celsius which prompts him to ask if this is correct. Alice tells him he must be hospitalized to which he says it's just a cold and that he is a master swordsman. She tells him it does not matter what he is, he has to be hospitalized at least until his fever drops. Michael then asks if this is because she is worried about him to which she says yes as someone else calls for Alice. Lady J is asking if she can take care of his highness. Lady J says Alice is always busy and that Lady J can handle it if it is just a cold. Alice realizes Lady J is a fan of Mill and then says okay. Lady J thanks her before Alice tells Lady J to report anything unexpected to her immediately. Mill is actually famous for his three-year trek through the country of Chunk. He was so amazing the people there called him one of the five greatest masters of the East with the Imperial family even sending the Britia Empire a gift in appreciation. Mill's adventures inspired many plays popular in Londo meaning he is favored among the people and young ladies. Mill tells Lady J to please take care of him as she fangirls and says she'll do her best. He playfully asks Lady J where to go which causes Alice to remind him that she is still young. He asks her what the issue is and why she is looking at him like that to which Alice tells him she is just saying. Later at night we hear Alice yell 38.5 degrees Celsius. Alice then asks when Jay got this fever and if she feels alright. 
Lady J tells Alice this morning and assumes it is just a cough telling Alice not to worry about it. Alice is in shock that it happened this morning and that Lady J has a high fever and cough. Alice thinks she is missing something important. Alice has now decided to re-examine Lady J using radiography this time. Alice looks at the results noting that her lungs look normal so it is not pneumonia, and then wonders if it is just a cold. She wonders if she had been overacting as all things point to it being a common cold. Jay then covers her mouth which shocks Alice and then blood drips on the floor. Now Lady Jay is in shock as well with blood on her lips. Alice shouts for someone to bring a saline injection and antacids quickly. The doctors surround Lady Jay asking if she is alright and reassuring her. Later in the day a doctor tells Lady Jay that things are stable now and asks if she has been stressed lately as things point to her having a stomach bleeding ulcer. Dr. Fallen asks Alice if she agrees with this assessment to which Alice says there has to be another cause as ulcers don't bring fevers unless peritonitis developed. Dr. Fallen questions if it is both a cold and ulcer to which Alice says that would be too much of a coincidence. She then tells the crew that they should do a platelet count. Alice asks if the number is accurate as she sees 15,000 instead of the normal human 150,000 value to which the hospital worker says she ran the test twice. Another worker starts shouting at Alice to hurry as three more patients have come vomiting blood. This shocks Alice and the other doctors before Alice asks herself if this could be contagious hemorrhagic fever. She then sees the papers and notices all three patients have similar symptoms to Lady J and eliminates an ulcer, and the cold is the cause. She then asks herself why everything happened so suddenly and if there is an endemic disease in the peninsula. She notes that there is no research on that and wonders where this disease is coming from then. She notes that other hemorrhagic fever include Ebola and yellow fever before wondering which one this could be. She decides she needs more evidence. Things got worse as two of the three patients died of fever spikes before ten more came in the next day with three of those dying of lung hemorrhage and then twenty came in the next day. In the army men talk about squad members suffering a high fever and wonder what the disease is. They then talk about rumors of 50 men dying and wonder if they are next. Someone then asks what they are worried about as Dame Alice is on their side. He continues that they should be patient until Alice comes up with a solution. We later see Alice sitting alone as she wonders what disease this could be. She wonders if it is a new illness or one that disappeared way back in Earth's timeline. She notes that this is impossible to diagnose in this time period as she cannot even find what bacteria is involved. Before saying this can no longer be delayed as this epidemic will be controllable. She then wonders if this started naturally before getting a flashback of Louis. She then shakes her head as she does not think he would go this far and decides that the cause will be clear after a treatment is found. She tells herself it is unfortunate that she can't save everyone but for now must stop the spread and keep people from succumbing to the disease. She decides to use that one method noting that it will put some people in danger, but there is no other option. Later we see Louis talk about how the disease is spreading well and ask how the Imperial Army is doing. Fabian says the death toll is 100 with 300 known to be infected to which Louis calls this number low as the death rate in the Dark Lands was 80%. Fabian says this is likely due to Lyndon's fiancé trying numerous types of treatments some of which their own nation's doctors have never heard of. Louis calls this futile as it is an endemic so treating one or two won't matter. Fabian questions if Alice could be able to find a solution to which Louis tells him this epidemic is different from the one in Londo as it spreads through people and their bodily fluids and not water. He continues that this disease is not only scary since it is deadly but also because of its contagiousness. Louis then says we'll see if Lady of the Lamp can come up with a solution. Later we see Lyndon telling Alice it has been a while and asks if she is well since she seems busy lately. She tells him yes before he mentions she looks very pale. She then tells him that she is here now as medical commander and would like to discuss the current epidemic which causes him to quiet down. He then agrees to talk about it and immediately asks how his brother is doing. Alice tells him his brother is at 39 degrees Celsius and in critical condition. Alice thinks to herself about how Mill may have been dead already if he wasn't an Oronite, and she thinks to herself about how she has to investigate how he got infected and where the infection source is. Lyndon asks for Alice's opinion on the epidemic and mentions how he has refrained from talking about it to avoid confusion, but also says the army is in grave condition. He then says he believes in her to find a solution. She tells him there is no perfect solution but only a partial one right now. She tells him this method will cause about maybe 500 deaths but it would prevent a worst-case scenario. Lyndon thinks to himself about how 500 deaths to avoid a worst-case scenario is pretty good and about how he was considering retreating if it didn't stop. 
He asks what they will need to which she tells him a lot of help and a small sacrifice. He then tells him the help would be granting her full control of the army. This stuns Lyndon speechless before he asks what she will do with full authority to the military. She says they will isolate the army based on epidemiological surveys. She tells him the virus seems to be spreading through bodily contact and that she will be investigating patients with hemorrhage symptoms. They will isolate those with a light cold as dormant patients and those in contact with them will also be considered dormant patients. Lyndon then agrees to grant her military authority and says he will assign an intelligence division to help her. He notes to himself that her plan will definitely be effective as she gratefully tells him thank you. He then sternly asks her if the Republic could be behind this. She tells him that it is unclear at the moment but she will be looking for the infection source during this investigation. He tells her to let him know if she finds anything suspicious and says that if they are behind this it will not be ignored. He then asks what the small sacrifice is to which she tells him it will be the medical staff who will join the patients in isolation to treat them. She says it is dangerous so only volunteers will get accepted as Lyndon sits in shock. He clenches his fist wondering how Alice could think of doing something dangerous again right after that operation. She continues that to do this she asks for protective attire to be made to reduce infections. She tells him that it must be bodily fluid proof before Lyndon lets out a sigh and says he'll get that done. He then asks if she is planning on going to the isolated area and that he will not allow that. She tells him she is in charge of the epidemic countermeasure and must be there to examine and treat patients. Lyndon then shouts that he will not allow her to take risks to which Alice says this is her responsibility and that she does not want to accept his subjective remarks. She then says it makes her uncomfortable to his dismay. Alice then feels bad as she realizes she is going too far and realizes that Lyndon got hurt by that statement. Lyndon while staring at the ground then says he understands now and apologizes for being stubborn. She calls for him as he sadly gets up saying that is enough now and that he will make sure to do as she requested. He says he believes in her as she stares at the ground in sadness. He tells her she can leave now and tells her good work today. As she goes he thinks for a moment before grabbing her hand and asks if she can promise him that she won't get hurt. He begs her not to before she just says she is taking her leave now and closes the door. Later in the night Lyndon is holding a pendant and lets out a sigh before someone knocks on the door asking to come in. A man named Lieutenant Colonel Roden of Supplies comes in and Lyndon asks him if he was given instructions yet. He tells him yes and says that everything was carefully recorded and passed to production so protective gear will be distributed once completed. Lyndon tells him to make sure to use all available knowledge to make the best gear possible before telling the man he can leave. Lyndon sits quietly alone as he recalls when he forgot about God that one day he lost everything. However now he sits praying to God to keep Alice safe and bless her with protection. Alice asks someone how many patients they have to which a worker says 750 that are getting treated in the field hospital. Alice then asks about how many in isolation to which the worker says 10,000 and that those with cold symptoms are getting moved to the hospital. As of right now epidemic patients get treated in the field hospital while those who are in contact get monitored. The field hospital itself had been moved to a new front closer to Prague. Alice then tells the worker to make sure no unauthorized personnel enters either zones. With these measures in place the chances of the disease spreading to the whole army is lower and all that's left is to treat the infected. 750 are officially infected but after an incubation period 1000 people will be in danger so there is no way to save everyone. The worker continues that people are dying of bleeding in the lungs and there's not stopping this. Alice tells him they don't necessarily need to stop this to which the worker says they can't just let these people bleed to death. She tells him that they aren't dying due to excessive bleeding but because the lungs are getting full of blood almost like they are drowning so a lack of oxygen is the issue. A doctor then asks how will they save them then to which Alice says oxygen therapy. They will provide highly concentrated oxygen which will treat the hypoxia even when the lungs are full of blood. A worker is confused and asks how they will do this to which Alice says a portable hyperbaric chamber. She notes that the ones in this era are primitive but it's the only way to provide the needed oxygen. There are only 10 in the western continent but the one in Britia is too far away so they will need to find one nearby. She wonders if the dukedom of Prussian will lend theirs and decides that they must borrow it no matter what. She wonders how to go about this before a gift arrives in a carriage for Alice. It is a hyperbaric chamber from the house of Childa and a gift for saving Albert. She thanks the man as he tells her she can have it for as long as she needs. Alice is happy as this will definitely lift everyone's spirits. Later Lady J calls for Alice and talks about how the death rate is down from 70 to 10%. And even Michael is doing better. Alice tells her to rest as well but Lady J is excited as she is cured. 
Alice breathes some relief and calls this great. Lady J says it's all thanks to Alice and the doctors risking their lives and talks about how the kingdom is waiting for news on the disease. Right now the Empire is reporting to the people about the dedication Alice, and the medical staff showed as Lady J then calls Alice amazing. At the Empire the Emperor is telling Alice's dad that he will award Alice with a Medal of Honor after the expedition as he calls her amazing. The Emperor continues wondering about how many more lives would have been lost without Alice around to which Alice's father agrees. Alice's father puts his cup of tea down thinking despite this he still should have not let her go and does not care if she gets rewarded for her deeds and only wants her home safely. Alice takes off the gear and thinks about how the incubation period is almost over so there won't be any more critical condition patients. It pains her that the death toll is 478 but she notes it would have been worse without the child of family. She also notes that the medical staff did not suffer as much due to the uniform. She then tells herself the only problem to address now was if this disease is natural. Dr. Sven diagnosed the illness as contagious fever with pneumorrhagia which was an epidemic in the Dark Lands one year ago. Alice then wonders why this disease was suddenly in the peninsula and the Empire's army. She remembers back to when a soldier told her he was treated by Morian servants from the Darklands while imprisoned. The soldier had told her the Morians looked to be in similar condition to the soldiers now as they coughed and had nosebleeds. This shocked Alice as the soldiers continued that Michael got sick three days after they had symptoms and the sword knights who were in contact got sick as well. The investigation found the sword knights as the first to get ill meaning Sir Mac and Jack were the first infected. She wonders if this was all intentional and the Morians were used to infect their soldiers. She then angrily thinks of the scorpion of the desert. Later we see Michael asking Alice if this is true to which she says she is not 100% sure, but wants this confirmed as soon as possible. Michael tells her he will take care of the rest with a stern look on his face. He tells her the sword knight suffered the most so she should focus on her work and let him handle the rest. He says that if the scorpion is behind this then as the leader of the sword knights he cannot forgive him. Later Lyndon is reading a report asking what it is. Michael tells him he is here because of the scorpion of the desert. Michael asks if Lyndon already knew who was behind all this to which Lyndon asks if Michael has found evidence. Michael says thanks to lies he did to which Lyndon tells him to call her Dame Alice. Michael lets out a comedic stunned face before Lyndon says she is not Michael's friend and he should show respect to the future Empress. Michael is clearly annoyed as he thinks about how Alice has not become Empress yet so the games are not over. Before saying anyways lies did find probable evidence showing the Republic intentionally spread this disease. They then go over it off screen before Michael asks Lyndon what he thinks. He nods saying he understands before saying that is enough to accuse them. Lyndon thinks about how his empire's soldiers were held captive by the Republic and taken care of by the Morian soldiers who gave them an infectious disease. Right afterwards the soldiers were returned through a hostage exchange making it clear that these actions were intentional. Lyndon thinks about how announcing this to the news would create an international issue and cause people to criticize Louis and the Republic making them lose their support within the peninsula. Lyndon then thinks about how Alice has helped his people out once again, and that she truly is amazing. He then thinks back grimly to when she told him that his remarks make her uncomfortable. He clenches his fist as he has not been able to see her since then. Lyndon then tells Michael that they will need more evidence since the Republic would just claim that they did not know the Morians were infected. Michael then says the Morians who cared for Jack and Mac have both died and that Louis forbade anyone from touching the bodies leaving them to rot in an abandoned mansion. This info came from Republic soldiers Michael was able to bribe and Michael tells Lyndon that they can get an autopsy on the corpse. Lyndon tells Michael that this will be dangerous as it is close to the enemy's base to which Michael says that the scorpion of the desert is such an eyesore and that he'd like to punch the guy in the face at least once. This is all despite the fact that Michael is a self-proclaimed pacifist that does not enjoy revenge. Lyndon stands speechless for a moment before Michael says that is all he wanted to report out of duty, and that he is now headed to the outskirts of Simferpol to accomplish his mission. Michael then says he'll be back soon as Lyndon calls for his brother. Lyndon then simply tells Michael to be careful which kind of shocks Michael. Michael then asks if his brother is sure he meant to say that and questions if he is joking to which Lyndon tells him that Lyndon does not hate him. Michael then tells him that may be true but they are also still enemies and one of them has to die. He tells Lyndon that he does not hate him either and in fact really likes him. He tells Lyndon that he remembers how cute and smart Lyndon was as a child. Michael continues that they are in a truce due to the war but still are enemies. Michael then says that if he wins he has no intention of killing Lyndon and believes Lyndon doesn't feel the same way. Lyndon tells him he does not intend to kill Michael either as long as Michael does not try to stop what he's planning. 
Michael then says that Lyndon will definitely try to kill him then in that case before Lyndon asks him if Michael will give up the throne. Lyndon then says if Michael is willing to step away from their field he can rule the Romanov territory and take it as his own independent kingdom. Michael is in shock as Lyndon is offering the Romanov territory as an independent state which is bigger than Britia and has more resources than a lot of other nations. Michael then asks if he gives up the throne will Lyndon give up his plan. Lyndon angrily asks if Michael would abandon it if in Lyndon's position. He then says that on that one day he lost everything he had. Michael then laments as this means neither brother can give up their goals and this battle really is no one's fault as they are each fighting for themselves and their goals. Michael then says he'll be off now. An expert says that the Morians are clearly the source of infection as he does an autopsy. Two men comment on how despicable this is even if they are at war. Lyndon looks at the report and notes that Nicholas must pay for putting Alice's life in danger. He then says he'll show Louis that war isn't just one with weapons. As the crown prince he contacts numerous other kingdoms to spread the news of what happened. Murmur goes on throughout the land of the inhumane methods used by the Republic. His own people then start to say that Nicholas should take responsibility for their losses and step down. They call for him being put on trial and that a government that uses tactics like this should leave the peninsula for good. A cup goes crashing down to the ground. Nicholas is enraged while huffing and puffing. He feels a sting near his scar before a man tells him to stop drinking alcohol as it causes his wound to get infected. Nicholas calls this nonsense as he tells his guards to escort the man out. Louis then screams saying that this is all because of the Clorin's wench and that he will never forgive her. He stops to think for a moment before having come up with a perfect plan that even Alice cannot get away from. He seems to have devised a plan to capture her very soon and watch her beg for her life. Someone announces that public support is on their side now and the Empire should soon be able to take Simferpol. Lyndon then asks if the Scorpion has had any movements to which the man says the Scorpion is holed up in Simferpol. He continues that even the Scorpion can't make a plan to get out of this one to which Lyndon says they should use this opportunity to take Simferpol. Lyndon then wonders if the Scorpion would yield like this and if the Scorpion will pull another unexpected scheme. Lyndon then says this should not matter as Louis isn't the only one planning ahead. Lyndon then asks Marshal Miguel if the plan is proceeding as expected to which the Marshal says it is and that the war will be over soon. Lyndon notes that he is not as good at regional tactics as the Scorpion but wars get decided by people who understand the whole picture, and if this plan works out the war is over. He then thinks that this was all thanks to Alice. He then repeats her name in his mind. Later someone tells Lyndon that Alice is not at the hospital but treating patients in the front line. Lyndon asks if she really is going again. A backstory tells us that doctors now visit camps in the front line to help soldiers who can't be moved to hospitals. This is a new concept that Alice introduced that Alice often partakes in herself. Lyndon gets annoyed noting that he can't see her because she's always out doing this and that she should have just sent someone else. Graham then says that if Lyndon wants to visit patients he will guide him. Lyndon says it's fine and to just send a message to Colonel Alice to which Graham asks what he should tell her. Lyndon says to tell her that he'd like to discuss something with her. Lyndon then wonders if she is avoiding him and if he did something wrong. The marshal asks Lyndon what is wrong to which Lyndon tells him that it is nothing. Out in some forest we see two guys thank Alice for all she has done for them and for coming all the way out here. One even calls her the angel of the lamp. Alice tells them it was nothing and thinks to herself about how she does not deserve all this praise as she is not here for a noble reason. She also notes that continuing to avoid Lyndon won't solve any problems. She notes that this life could always turn out different from the past but still feels scared regardless. This is because she still keeps thinking about what happened at the stake. She is focusing on treating patients to forget the nightmares. She also noted that she already told herself she could never fall for him even if they got married. She however thinks to herself that she may already have started to. She then puts her hand on her chest as it aches. Someone then asks her why she is sighing which startles her. She turns around to see Len standing behind her. She asks him what brings him here to which he says this is his brigade. She asks him how he has been as he never visits her to which he asks why would he since he has been busy fighting. Alice pouts as she reminds him that she is his littler sister and asks why won't he be nicer. He then jokingly says the end is near if they let a child become a colonel to which Alice jokingly agrees. Alice sighs again as she notes this was due to his highness being considerate. Len asks why she keeps sighing despite being young to which Alice starts to respond. She asks Len what he does when something troubles him to which Len asks what kind of trouble. Alice answers by saying it's a problem that one cannot solve no matter what. She asks what Len would do in this situation. Len grabs his chin and thinks for a moment before asking Alice to take out her gun to Alice's shock. 
He then tells her to hurry and grab it as Alice frantically searches for it in her bag. He then reminds her that he once told her that in war guns are your lifeline. He then says that if an enemy appeared right now she'd be done. Alice notes that what he says is true but also wonders why he brought this up instead of answering her question. He then tells Alice to shoot at that one part sticking out of a tree. She then prepares herself as she wonders what this is all about. A loud bang can be heard as the tree gets shot. She shouts that she hit it excitedly at her brother before he tells her that they need to keep going. She asks if he wants her to continue to which he tells her to aim at something over there. Multiple bangs can be heard as the two men from before wonder if the future empress is using a weapon. Len tells her not bad before Alice reminds him that she is good at handling tools. Len chuckles as he tells her she is right and did well. He then quizzes her about what to do in order to hit the target to which Alice answers to keep her hand steady. He then asks her what about the eyes to which she says that she must keep them on the target before and after firing. Len tells her that is correct and that is also how he handles his problems. Alice is speechless for a moment. Len continues that many things will trouble you in life that are difficult to solve and sometimes you won't know what to do. During those times he has always faced them head on as avoiding them and running away will never solve anything. Narrator interjection here but I needed to hear that and probably Alice as well. Len then says that he will be going now and that he hopes everything goes well for her to which Alice tells him to be safe. He tells her to do the same and to keep the weapon on her as he will be forced to train her again if he finds her keeping it in her bag again. He tells her despite the Empire winning no one knows what will happen and she must have it on her at headquarters and even at the hospital. Alice grips the weapon tightly as she tells him yes. He tells her he hopes she will never have to use it as it means Alice is in the worst possible situation. Fabian asks Louis if they really have to proceed with this plan to which Louis asks if there is a problem or if Fabian has a better idea. He then shouts asking if Fabian has a plan that will make the dogs from the Empire grovel. Just then his scar causes him pain before he tells Fabian to just go grab the decoy to which Fabian says okay. Later in the night we see that First Lieutenant Para has arrived and Louis greets him and asks him if he knows the plan. Pierre says yes he does to which Louis says he wishes he did not have to resort to this but someone has to make a sacrifice for freedom and equality. He then asks if Pierre is willing to die for a greater cause. This scares Pierre who then shuts his eyes telling himself that he does not wish to die. He reluctantly says yes as he knows Louis would kill him anyways if he does not agree. Louis then tells Para that he must do as Louis says. The plan gets told but is kept hidden from the reader. Louis then tells Pierre that he believes in him and to go now. Fabian is later called into the room as Louis asks him if everything is going to plan to which Fabian says that preparations have been completed. Louis then tells Fabian to make sure not to forget their true goal this time. He is referring specifically to the field hospital in Prague where Alice is. A horse gallops through the forest as Pierre is on board. He notes that if he arrives safely to the 2nd Brigade that this plan will surely fail. Some of the Empire's soldiers notice the messenger from the Republic before screaming at him to stop. One of the soldiers shouts asking if the messenger thinks he's getting away before firing and hitting the horse in the leg. Pierre drops to the floor as well with a thud and we see that he is clenching his fist with tears in his eyes. The soldiers shout to grab him before saying wait. They notice a letter and then shout to stop the guy. Pierre holds a weapon and cries as he does not want to die. A loud bang is then heard right after Pierre commits self-deletion. The soldiers stare in shock before someone asks the second lieutenant what they should do as the guy looked like he had important info. The lieutenant says to open up the body to get the letter and that the guy seemed to have just swallowed it so it should still be readable. The other soldier tries to protest this but the lieutenant tells him the info might be important for the Empire and that they must find out what it is. Later someone reports to Lyndon that the messenger was carrying some important info and that the Empire would have been hit unexpectedly if they did not know. The letter wrote to General Leo that the Empire's 3rd Brigade is approaching Vograd as planned and to initiate the joint operation from both sides. Someone suggests to Linden to use this info to counter the Republic to which Linden asks how so. The man says that they can determine the enemy's route with this letter and set up an ambush. This will allow them to hit the Republic with a hard blow. Someone asks where to place the soldiers for an ambush and that the date written in the plan is closing and so they can't call upon the soldiers from far away. Someone then asks about the soldiers guarding the headquarters in Prague and says that the Republic is attacking the 3rd Brigade with 100,000 soldiers and would not be able to attack the headquarters at the same time. The Marshal notes that is true before asking Linden what he thinks as the Marshal himself likes the idea of using headquarter troops. Linden agrees as well and notes to himself that if this works his own plan won't be necessary. He then wonders to himself if this is all they need to do and has a bad feeling about how things are working out too perfectly. 
He also notes that he cannot refuse to send soldiers at such a good opportunity all because of a feeling. He decides to discuss this with Alice but someone tells him she is again away at the moment. Lyndon asks if she is still not back to which Graham says that Alice sent word that there are a lot of wounded so she must stay for one to two more days. As Lyndon walks alone he notes that the soldiers must be dispatched tomorrow and wonders what to do about the plan before wishing he could have talked with Alice about this. He sighs as he notes there is no other choice now. We see Alice with a hood on approaching a horse. She thinks that there is no telling what will happen but running away is not the answer and that she cannot keep avoiding him. She decides to address him head on as Lyndon tells the marshal to prepare to leave. Lady J tells Alice that it is snowing outside to which Alice notes that it must be tough for the soldiers and Lady J agrees. Alice thinks about how hard it is snowing and hopes Lyndon is okay. She shakes her head as she tries to stop thinking about him. She then stares out the window again with a sigh. Someone shouts telling the troops that it is snowing and that they must proceed faster. Lyndon tells the person that they are right before wondering if it is snowing in Prague as well and he hopes Alice is staying warm. He then wonders why she is so frail and thinks that he should request the production of restorative medicine. He decides to do this after the battle before an aide notes that it is odd that the scouts who went ahead have not returned yet. Someone then rides in with a horse saying that they have urgent news for his highness. They say that they scouted their destination expecting to see the enemy's route but the army was not there, and there were not any tracks at the destination where the enemy was expected or on their expected path either. Lyndon notes that they have been tricked before Lyndon realizes that the unprotected Pravu was the target, and not the brigade. He then thinks in horror that it's not Pravu but actually Alice that is the target. He shouts at all his men that they must hurry back to Pravu. He internally shouts pleading that Alice is safe and a loud bang can be heard. Lady J asks what that noise is before someone says it sounded like a cannon and wonders if the guards are training. Lady J then asks Alice if she heard anything about this before another bang goes off and Lady J starts screaming. Someone then busts open the door telling Alice that it is the Republic and that she needs to get out of here. He then shouts that Louis is headed right for the hospital. She asks about the outlook to which the guy says most defenses have fallen and they will hold them off as long as possible for Alice to escape. Alice now wonders what she should do. The guy tells her that there is no time and to hurry to which Alice says she can't. The soldier tells her he understands that she cares for the patients but she is also the future empress and very important. He tells her that her escape is more important than their death so she needs to go now. She clenches her skirt as she thinks there is no way she could outrun them. Another soldier barges in telling Alice to go as Louis is here to capture her. She then stands in horror after she hears this. She then has a stern face before saying that if she'll get captured anyways she might as well do what she can. And there is something for her to do as she holds her weapon. A loud boom can be heard as someone shouts to the commander that they've eliminated the enemy's defenses. He also tells Louis that they have taken all the enemy's strongholds as well. He then asks the guy about Alice to which the guy responds that she seems to be in the hospital near the headquarters. Louis grins as he says good and then says that he will go there himself. Alice now in uniform lets out a deep breath. She thinks about how Lyndon must be okay then if Louis's real target is the hospital. She then thinks about how she may perhaps never see him again. She then starts to cry at what a fool she is as she may die here after finally finding the courage to talk to him. She rubs the tears off telling herself not to grow weak as there is an important task for her to do. She then tells her family that she is sorry things will have ended up this way. Someone in the hospital asks what they should do as Lady J cries saying she doesn't want to die. Alice then reassures her that nothing will happen and that she'll make sure of this. She tells them that they were able to treat patients every day thanks to everyone here, and that she could not have done it without them. She tells them that nothing will happen to them today and what's most important is that they are medical officers who treat the patients here. She then commands them as the medical commander and future empress to not leave this conference room no matter what happens. They try to argue but she tells them she will not allow any questions or objections and tells them again to not leave. The door creaks open as Alice wonders if she can do this. She continues to take multiple steps before coming to a halt. She then tells herself that this is it. The gate doors get kicked down with a bang. Louis walks in asking who do we have here before saying why it's Alice the hero of the empire. Alice tells him she does not remember allowing him to call her by her first name and tells him to refer to her as Colonel Clorence the medical commander of the empire. This stuns Louis before he chuckles and calls her Colonel Clorence and tells her that it looks like she does not understand her position at the moment. He then decides that it is good this way as she is living up to his expectations and that it'd be disappointing if she were trembling elsewhere. Louis notes to himself that she'll understand her position once she's dragged to Simferpol, and that he will make her a war trophy that he will never let go of. 
Then Alice says that as the Colonel Clarence of the Medical Division she would like to discuss negotiations with Louis of the Republic. Louis is confused before telling her she seems to not understand what negotiations are as these are only done between two equal parties or if one party has something to offer. Alice says she does have something to offer before saying she wants Louis to ensure the safety of the medical staff and patients here as well as to not capture the medical unit as prisoners and return them to the Empire immediately. Louis then asks her what she will offer to which she draws her firearm and says that her offer is his life. The men behind him are startled with shock before Louis tells them not to overreact. She then asks him if he thinks a girl can fire a firearm. Louis then points out how her legs are trembling. He says that even if she could it'd be commendable if she doesn't hit the floor or ceiling. He then starts marching forward saying her desperate attempt is amazing and that he wouldn't have thought she was a noble girl, and she tells him not to come closer. He asks her if he does, would she shoot him before asking if she has ever shot anyone before. He then tells her to try now and tells her to target his hand if she can. She tells him not to move and that she will shoot. Louis asks her if she really will and for her to try as he has his hands up. This causes his troops to chuckle. Alice is biting her lips and trembling before she presses the button. A loud bang can be heard as Louis shouts in pain as his hand is seen to be bleeding. He stares at the wound in pain. The troops call for the commander to which Alice yells for nobody to move. She says that if they move she'll aim for the head and that there is no second chance. Alice in her mind exclaims that she really did it. Alice tells Louis that he should get it treated soon as she hit an artery, and that if he agrees with the conditions she will lower her weapon. As he agonizes in pain he says he'll do what she wants before Alice tells him to swear on his freedom and equality as she does not trust him. The Francoin Republic believed in freedom and equality and that swearing on those is important and that Louis would have to keep his word if he swore in front of his soldiers. Louis says he got it and swears on it and that he won't lay a finger on anyone in the hospital and tells her to lower her weapon. She then sighs as she notes it is over as the troops check up on Louis. They then grab Alice and tie her hands behind her back. Just then urgent news arrives that the Iron Prince is leading troops back this way. He shouts at his men to quickly transport Alice to Simferpol. Horses gallop as Lyndon pleads for Alice to be okay. A loud boom is heard before the Republic troops say they are being overrun by the Empire, and should retreat to Simferpol. Inside the hospital people ask where Alice is as she isn't here. Lyndon tries to charge in with desperation on his face. The Marshal shouts at Lyndon that it is dangerous and to not go any further. He also notes that the walls of Simferpol will be in sight soon and that this is reckless to which Lyndon just says to move. He tells Lyndon that he will lose the dame and his life if he charges in now and that he should snap back to his senses. He covers his face and grits his teeth as he says damn it. He then lets out a shout of Alice's name. Someone asks Alice if her stay has been uncomfortable to which she says no and that she is fine before thanking them for the concern. Fabian then apologizes for the improper reception as they are currently in battle. Alice then asks why they are treating her well as she is a prisoner to which Fabian says that she is the future empress and that they cannot neglect the Britier royal family. Fabian then asks if she knows a man by the name of Charles to which Alice sits there confused. Fabian tells her he knew she would not remember as she's treated so many people. Fabian tells her that it was his subordinate, and that he was a prisoner of the Empire when she saved his life. Fabian then says he'd like to take this opportunity to thank her for saving their soldiers even when they were prisoners to which Alice says to not mention it. She then says sir before he tells her to call him Lieutenant Colonel Fabian. She calls him that before asking how Nicholas is doing. Fabian says Louis is in bed after the operation and it will be a while before he moves again. Alice then recalls back to what Louis said about how he won't forgive her, and to wait until they get to Simferpol. She thinks about how Fabian can treat her like this because Louis is in bed and wonders what will happen when he wakes up. Alice then lets out a sigh as Fabian stares in silence. Fabian thinks about what will happen when the commander wakes up as well and hopes that someone will come rescue her. He notes that even if they are cornered the Republic's main forces are here meaning it'd be impossible for the Iron or Sword Prince to save her. He thinks they wouldn't risk their lives for Alice as someone greets Michael. Michael asks the person how Lyndon is doing to which the man says Lyndon is inside. As he walks the halls he notes that Lies was captured and wonders what his brother was doing as he trusted Lyndon to care for Alice. He notes how precious she is to him before creaking the door open. He halts as someone shouts at Lyndon for wanting to give up his role as commander. Lyndon says he's already decided. The marshal asks to clarify that Lyndon is relinquishing this role to Michael, and him so he can go charge into Simferpol alone. Lyndon says there won't be an issue as long as the two of them stay and that they are winning the war anyways to which the marshal says that is not the issue. The marshal says even the Iron Prince will die entering Simferpol alone, 
and that they should just wait to capture the city to get Alice. Lyndon asks if the marshal is telling to wait a month to take the city as Michael overhears the conversation in anger. He pulls the door open as the marshal notices Prince Michael. Michael then asks Lyndon what is with the outfit and jokingly asks if that is his disguise and that he plans to infiltrate as a soldier. Lyndon says this has nothing to do with Michael before Michael tells him that everyone knows what Lyndon looks like and that no one is falling for this. He then notes that Michael has good timing and he hands a sword saying this is Michael's now. Lyndon says he's going to Simferpol so Michael now leads the army. Lyndon says this is an order as commander as Michael recalls Lyndon used to be so subjective and despite being agitated himself does not know what to do when Lyndon's like this. Lyndon angrily tells him to take this as an order as Michael tells him to wait as he tries to get serious. He then notes that there are 100,000 soldiers in Simferpol and tells Lyndon to think of the future and what if things go wrong. Lyndon says even 1 million soldiers would not matter and ask if the future is important. He then says that who knows what Alice is going through right now which even gets Michael shocked. He tells Michael to just take the sword as he has to lead while Lyndon is away as Michael says he's never heard such a ridiculous order in his life. Michael says he does not have to follow Lyndon's orders now as he is resigning. He says he is not in the army and Lyndon cannot tell him what to do as he plans to go rescue Alice. Lyndon says he'll die if he goes there. The marshal then watches as the two princes decide to argue at this moment. Lyndon then asks Michael one last time if he is disobeying Lyndon's orders to which Michael says of course. Lyndon says alright then as Michael feels a jolt. Lyndon's eyes then flash as Lyndon's powers cause Michael to stagger. Lyndon tells Michael to give up as even he cannot fight against a mind break while under one. Mitchell calls this outrageous but decides he must resist. Lyndon then steps forward and tells Michael to rest as he does a whack to the neck. Michael's eyes flash as he recalls doing this move previously and then calls Lyndon a cheap before dropping to the floor before he can finish. The marshal covers his face in dismay at the scene. Lyndon is noticeably bleeding from the nose as the marshal yells at him in concern to which Lyndon says that he's alright and to throw Michael in jail. Lyndon thinks about what to charge Michael with for a moment before making up the crime of attempting to resign without a superior's permission. At Simferpol someone shouts about how his arm will have to be chopped off. Louis says that it's only one bullet and that he was only shot in the wrist before questioning if the doctors treated it properly. The doctor says that an artery was pierced and that an emergency operation stopped the bleeding but cannot save the artery which can lead to necrosis. The doctor continues that if signs of necrosis are seen after a while the wrist must be amputated. Louis tells the man to get out to which the man asks pardon. Louis then angrily calls the man a quack and again tells him to get out and for someone to bring him alcohol. An aide tells him that alcohol will only worsen his two scars to which Louis tells him to shut up. He then grabs Fabian's shirt and asks if Fabian dares to look down on him when he's in this state. Fabian then tells a soldier to bring mild alcohol. Fabian notes in his mind that the war is lost and that he must find a way to minimize casualties. Louis then curses Alice as she made him end up like this and says that he won't forgive her. Fabian then decides to stay near Alice for today after hearing this and notes how frustrating things are. Later he asks Alice if everything is alright to which she says yes. She thanks him for everything as he notes to himself how brave she is despite being a prisoner, and wonders if she is 17. They then hear a soldier shout for the commander to calm down to which Louis says to shut up and move. Alice wonders what that noise was as Fabian annoyedly notes that Louis is finally coming here. He calls for Lady Alice and tells her to not leave this room. Alice is speechless and Louis begins to walk out and he tells himself that he must stop Louis at all costs. Louis asks Fabian what he is doing here to which Fabian says he had some things to discuss with Alice. Louis says he has business with her as well and tells Fabian to move. Fabian tells Louis that he is drunk and should come back when he's sober to which Louis tells him to move or he will get killed. This leaves Fabian speechless before he says he will not move as Alice may be a prisoner, but she is also the future empress of the empire. He tells Louis that it is not polite to visit her at this hour, and while also drunk. Louis then starts to laugh before he gives Fabian a slap in the face. Louis then tells him to move while he is still being nice to which Fabian says even if it is an order he will not follow it today. Louis grits his teeth in anger before he points a gun at Fabian's head saying that so be it if Fabian wants to die so badly. Someone comes busting out the door saying wait. It is Alice who asks if Louis is here for her and if so to let Fabian go and finish his business with her instead. Fabian yells at her to stay inside before Louis slams Fabian to the ground. Alice yells for Fabian in concern as Louis says Alice is right that his business is with her. Louis then grabs her shoulder before saying he will put a scar on her pretty face and cut her as well. 
Alice shivers in fear before someone says to take those dirty hands off of Alice. Alice turns her eyes in tears to see Lyndon standing there. Louis shouts that it is the Iron Prince and wonders how he got in here. Alice is surprised to see Prince Lyndon as well as he calls her name. Lyndon then calls for Alice to come over to him. Alice shoves Louis off of her and then hugs Lyndon crying as she yells your highness. As Lyndon hugs and squeezes Alice he asks if she is alright to which she tells him yes. A loud bang can then be heard as Louis says he does not know how Lyndon got here but this is great since he's basically coming to dig his own grave. He then asks what all of his men are doing not shooting Lyndon but they all flinch. Lyndon is glaring as his eyes flash which even causes Louis himself to shiver. Lyndon waves his hand as he says Louis is the only one digging his grave as a wind slash travels directly at Louis. It swings by him before a large slash can be heard at his shoulder. He lets out a cry as blood shoots from out his mouth. Steps can be heard before Lyndon stands over him surprised that Louis avoided that. Another sensation occurs that causes Louis to flinch before more slashes arrive causing him to scream in pain. Louis lies wheezing on the floor covered in blood before Republic soldiers arrive and start shooting after seeing the Iron Prince. He shields himself using his cape before grabbing Alice and saying that it's time for them to go. He tells her to hold on tight as Alice is scared of jumping out the window. He then takes the leap as Alice has her eyes completely closed. Lyndon seems to be dashing in the air which confuses all the soldiers that are staring out of the window. Someone shouts for all the men to be alert as the prince has no weakness when he uses his powers but also says that the powers are limited, and that they can catch him if they're careful. He also shouts to shoot the pair on sight and that they don't need to be captured alive. Near some castle walls Lyndon asks if Alice can ride a horse to which she says yes. He then hops on the same horse sitting right behind her. She blushes as she says um. Lyndon tells her that he knows she is not comfortable with him but that she just needs to hold on for a bit as they have to leave this place immediately. He then asks her if this is unpleasant to which she says no not at all. She then notes to herself that she is glad he is sitting behind her since he cannot see her face right now. She thinks to herself that when they get to the Empire she must correct this misunderstanding before Lyndon says let's go, and the horse lets out an A. Soldiers spot the Iron Prince and fire as they shout to get him. Lyndon's eyes flash as he covers Alice with his cape. He then activates a move called Sight Shroud which generates a light flash that blinds the soldiers' eyes. Lyndon gallops past them as they shout about their eyes and not being able to see. As they gallop ahead Lyndon tells himself that it's fine if he gets hurt as long as Alice is safe. He also notes that the pair must escape before he reaches his limit. Someone in the distance then yells for Lyndon to stop. Lyndon recognizes the man as this is the commander of the elite unit and an aura knight known as Lieutenant General Hugo. Lyndon also notes that escape from this man will be impossible. The man draws his sword before Lyndon draws his weapon and tells Alice not to worry. Hugo's horse leaps forward as Lyndon fires his weapon. The bullets are ineffective as Hugo uses his aura to shield his body. Lyndon then tosses his weapon at Alice for her to hold and draws his sword out. The two swordsmen then cross swords with a large clang. Hugo tells Lyndon to give up and that he'll treat Lyndon as a prisoner if he does. Lyndon wants to conserve his abilities so they can escape from Simferpol but notes that things will get dangerous if other soldiers join Hugo, and notes that he has to finish this man now. A loud bang then can be heard as Lyndon is shocked as Alice has fired. Hugo says what in shock as he is wounded before Lyndon activates his mind break now which causes Hugo to fall to the floor with a thud. Alice and Lyndon then continue to gallop off. Lyndon asks Alice how she thought of shooting the man at that moment to which Alice says that she thought Lyndon handed the weapon over for her to use to which Lyndon says he handed it to her to hold. Alice then cutely says that she sees and that she apologizes for this. This causes Lyndon to smile brightly and let out a chuckle and thinks to himself that he must have lost his mind as he finds her lovely in these dangerous moments. The pair gallop near the gate as Lyndon notes that only a little further. The gate is closed and Alice wonders in fear at what they should do now. Some soldiers behind shout to get the pair as they are now trapped. Alice yells your highness before Lyndon puts a finger over his mouth and shushes her. He then reaches for the gate and his hand glows as a whirring sound can be heard. The walls begin to crack before they crumble like sand in front of the pair. Narrator interjection here but Lyndon is on creative mode right now bruh this is too opus. The soldiers think the same as they ask how can this be. Lyndon then says let's go as the horse starts to continue galloping forward. In the dead of night the pair ride through the forests. Lyndon then starts to cough up blood as Alice shouts in shock. Lyndon is panting and despite bleeding from the mouth asks if Alice is hurt. He then apologizes for making the wrong decision and putting her in danger to which Alice sits speechless. She then tells him not at all and that he needs to get checked up as his internal organs may be damaged based on the way he's coughing. 
he tells her that he is alright as this is just the effects of overusing his powers and that he will be fine after a while. She tells him that's not enough and that he needs proper treatment before Lyndon then smiles and asks if she is worrying about him right now. As Lyndon stares at her she starts to blush. He then tells her that he understands that she is only concerned for him as she is a doctor but despite this it still makes him feel happy. He then rubs his chin and gets serious saying the Republic will get here soon so they need to move quickly. He notes that the North is a shorter route but they cannot go there since troops are stationed there. Lyndon notes that if he were alone he'd charge through there but right now does not want to put Alice in danger. Since all the troops are near the north the southwest barely has soldiers and is near the Ukra Mountains. He notes the Ukra Mountains are the most rugged terrain in the peninsula, and that it's a bit far but that they shall pass through there to avoid the Republic before heading north. In the morning someone asks about the Iron Prince heading southwest instead of the north. Hugo realizes they must plan on heading north through the Ukra Mountains. He notes that this is a surefire way to avoid the Republic's troops but that he will not let them get away. He notes that this is their last change to turn the tides. He also notes Louis is in no condition to lead as commander and that at this rate the Republic will surely lose. Their only chance is to capture the Iron Prince and that Alice is with him and may be slowing him down so they could capture them if they send soldiers. Hugo then says to send all troops to the mountain and capture the Iron Prince and the Lady with the Lamp. It is snowing as someone coughs while in a cave. Alice shouts your highness as Lyndon says he is alright. She touches his face and notes that he is cold and it must be hypothermia. She stares at him worried about his condition before Lyndon grabs her hand and says that he is alright and asks how she is doing as it is cold in here. She then grits her teeth before Lyndon starts coughing loudly once again. She tells him it's just his power's side effect and that he will get better soon before Alice yells at him loudly for being ridiculous. She tells him he must get treated as who knows what will happen at this rate. She tells him to let her look as she checks his pulse by using the dorsal artery of his foot. She notes that the pulse is 140 beats per minute, and his temperature is 34 degrees Celsius. She notes that he is lucky for not coughing up any more blood before wondering why his temperature is so low and his pulse is so fast. She wonders if the hypothermia is a reaction to an inflammation caused by his powers and notes that his power is in uncharted territory where science can't explain. She notes that she must relive his inflammation and warm his body as best as she can. She rummages through his bag as she wonders why he brought all this medication to which he says it was in case she got sick since she always falls ill. She stops to think about his highness and why he has changed so much. She then gives him anti-inflammatory drugs first to which he thanks her. He gulps them down as he says this is not too bad since Alice is worried about him and wonders out loud if he is dreaming. He then says that if it is he does not want to wake up. Alice tells him to say this after he gets better to which he says she is right, and to not worry as he'll get better soon so that he can protect her. He just needs to sleep for a bit now. Alice notes that Lyndon has hypothermia and that the cave is cold and despite taking medication. Who knows what will happen in here. She decides she must warm him up as much as she can as she wraps white cloth around him. She then notes that this is not enough and wonders how she can make him warmer. She notes that there is one way before wondering if this method is alright. She then decides there is no time to worry about this as she is a doctor and must treat him quickly, and that there's nothing more important than looking after a patient. She then proceeds to embrace and hug his highness. She then thinks of his name before hugging him more closely as she hopes he will get better. She hears a clatter before looking down at Lyndon's chest and wondering what that is. She moves her hands as she notes she's never seen him wear this necklace before. She pulls it out from under his shirt before staring in complete shock at it. She then wonders why Lyndon is wearing the necklace that she gave to Ron. She recalls meeting Ron at the bench and him holding her hand. She then wonders if Lyndon hid his identity to approach her as Ron since she did not like him then. Alice then shakes her head as she thinks about how confused she is. She looks dejected as she wonders why he did that but notes that he will tell her everything when they return to Londo and give her the emblem back just like he had promised. She then pleads for him to please get better soon. At Pravu someone begs the commander to let them go to battle so they can go save Alice. The marshal says they already won the war so why go out there and have more casualties. He also notes the army should not move to save just one person. The soldier tries to protest but the marshal says they shall wait to win this war. Marshal notes that he would have deployed troops already if Lyndon had not ordered him to stay before noting that in half a month his plan will be complete. Someone then comes in to tell the commander that there is something urgent as Prince Michael has escaped. The new commander is shocked as he had made sure to triple the guards on him. The guards say they were keeping close watch but Michael used his power to cut all his bars and rise to the sky only leaving a note. Narrator interjection but Michael be on creative mode as well. 
The note was a short resignation from the leader of the Sword Knights to the new commander's shock. He asks where Michael went to which the soldier says southwest to the Ukra Mountains. Michael told him that he was off to save his idiot brother and the pretty lady and to not chase after him as he is going alone. The commander still in shock shrinks smaller and smaller. Alice asks how his highness is doing as Lyndon says much better thanks to her and thinks to himself that the side effects usually last days. He asks what she did as he slept to which she shyly says nothing much. He tilts his head as he asks is that so? She tells him yes before saying she's glad he is better and to let her know if anything comes up since his inflammatory response may show other symptoms later. He tells her how nice to which she asks pardon. He says it's nice to hear her worry about him and that getting sick for a few more days doesn't sound half bad. Narrator interjection but where did this guy get all this riz from all of a sudden? Also why is he smiling so much all of the sudden when he usually has a constipated look on his face? Anyways, this statement causes Alice to start blushing. She then tells him he cannot keep coming to save her. She tells him that he is a noble and the future of the empire so he can't put himself in harm's way like this. She reminds him that he is the future emperor and must put himself first. She tells him to please not do this again in the future. He responds by saying that he knows his role as heir is important. He then proclaims that his titles and even his own life however are not as important as her. This statement shocks Alice as her heart beats louder. She then says that they should get ready anyways as she turns her blushing face. She then starts walking before huffing and puffing. She notes it as great Linden prepared supplies as he seemed to already know he wanted to go through the Ukra Mountains. Thanks to this they have a few days head start on the Republic and may be able to reach the Empire's troops with no issue. Linden is trying to call Alice by her name until she finally notices him and responds. He asks if something is the matter as she says not at all. She blushes and says she cannot face him properly as he stares at her in silence. He then grabs her chin lifting it up before leaning over to her shock. Lyndon stares at Alice for a moment before placing his hand on her chin and holding it up. She starts blushing in shock as he then leans over. He calls her name as Alice asks herself could it be while her heart beats frantically. Her feet stumble back into a tree which causes the ice atop the branches to start falling over. Lyndon's head is now covered in snow as they both stand silent. After he has wiped it off he reaches again for Alice's face as she says your highness. He then asks her when did her fever start. She brushes his hand off saying she is alright but clearly surprised about having a fever. Lyndon then tells her this will not do and states that they should stay and rest but Alice protests that it's only a cold and they need to keep going. He stares at her for a moment as she stands shivering before saying that it is late anyways so they should rest some more in the cave. He notes to himself he should have been more careful considering how easily Alice can get sick. Lyndon tells her there are no troops nearby so they should not worry and to rest up as they have a long march the following day to which Alice says alright. Back inside the cave Alice tells herself she has to get better before Lyndon calls her. He tells her the floor is cold before trying to get her to sit on his cape instead but she tells him she is alright. He tells her not to worry as he does not feel cold and to just sit comfortably. He tells her she looks unwell but she continues to say she is fine. He asks how she can be fine as she does not look fine at all and also says of course she is unwell considering how cold it is here. He then grabs her to give her a hug. She says your highness before he tells her he just wants to warm her up and to not mind him and go to sleep. She notes that he is warm and very different from before. She had always admired him since her previous life but now does so even more as she falls asleep. Lyndon stares down noticing she is fast asleep before putting his head on hers and mumbling telling her to not be sick and that it pains him more when she suffers. The very next day the sun shines in the cave as Alice tells him she is totally fine to which he tells her not to lie. She tells him she really is alright and to look at this as she jumps around. Right afterwards she starts wobbling around before Lyndon reaches for her with his arms. He bumps his head into hers saying that her temperature is still high and that lying is a bad habit. She starts to blush as he tells her they will rest for another day despite her protest. He tells her this is fine as they are on a safe route and the Republic is likely wandering in the opposite direction. Finding two people in the Ukra Mountains is like trying to find a needle in a haystack and would be impossible unless the Republic knew their exact path. He tells her to rest here as he will go scout. Alice covers her face as she wonders what she is going to do. Outside in the sun Lyndon walks around scoping the area before returning to tell her there are no troops in the vicinity. He tells her he will make porridge and prepare medication for her now. He also tells her he will continue to check for the enemy so she should not worry. Alice then starts to think of his highness and recalls how much of a fool she was for telling him he made her uncomfortable and hurt his feelings. She could not be brave due to the trauma of her past life and that nobody on earth took care of her when she was sick. 
She then starts to stare at Lyndon across the cave before smiling to herself at the sight of him. She tells herself that she likes this moment very much. At the shore of the Black Sea near Byzantium someone asks how much longer to the Crim Peninsula to which someone else responds five more days. The man then says he heard the situation is not good as he notes to himself this war was risky from the start and has no clue the repercussions they will face if they lose. He notes Nicholas who ruled for 30 years may have to step down and that they should balance their losses if they are to lose. This is due to how if they lost by a large margin peace negotiations would not go in their favor. He notes that it is fortunate the royal couple is still here, and that more troops than they needed have been deployed to conquer the Black Sea. If they are to lose they must at least capture the couple. Someone then yells at the captain alerting him of unidentified ships ahead. He is in shock wondering who it could be before the Romanov flag is spotted on the sails. They are now in a critical position as the Empire's navy is here now. He wonders if this site is real as the third fleet should have been in Hindia and the east right now. The crewmate asks for the captain's orders as the enemy fast approaches. He yells to open the sunport and not allow the enemy to get closer. He says the enemy are moving in U-formation and to fire now. Suddenly however the two men hear a loud crash as their enemy ship has already made it here and they stare down the barrel of a cannon. The captain in shock says oh no as a loud boom rings off. Someone asks what their losses are as another person replies some parts of the ship are damaged and getting repaired right now. The man then says this is the prince's order which is to be on standby here and destroy all incoming ships so they can cut off the Republic's supply route. He tells his men that the south of Simferpol where the Republic is are free mountains and that this third fleet will take the south. By the prince's orders the third fleet will put an end to this war. In the snowy forest we see that Mill is wondering where the pair are noting they should be here by now. He calls Lyndon silly as he wonders if Lyndon got lost before staring at the map again wondering if he is the one actually lost. He yells out asking where the hell are they as the narrator box tells us that Mill is the one lost. Narrator interjection but this is the guy who wants to travel the world with Alice lol. He might end up fighting off all the enemies as Lyndon and Alice continue to flirt. Alice asks his highness what that is before he tells her it is a pheasant and will be their next meal. He asks if she is okay with that to which she says she likes it. He is surprised she likes it before she says it is delicious and remembers that it was in many Korean delicacies. She asks if it is okay to light a fire to which he says it will be brief and he can conceal it with his powers. He tells her to just wait a bit as he will go cook it. She then sits staring at him before asking if he is really going to cook it himself to which he tells her he is good at cooking. A fire gets lit up as Alice notes he seems used to this and notes she never thought she'd get to taste his cooking. Later on he asks Alice to try some as he hands her two skewers. She says your highness as he asks her what is it with soot covering his face. She then can't hold it and starts chuckling and saying his face. He starts to rub his face in confusion and notices the soot on his white gloves. He asks if he looks weird to which she says no and that he still looks handsome. Alice then lets out a gasp as she had accidentally let that comment slip out due to being too comfortable from laughing. But she reassures herself that what she said is true and that she has never seen anyone more handsome than him in her life. Lyndon wonders if Alice is teasing him since she's saying this when he has soot all over his face. He then changes the topic and hands her some skewers to try. As she chomps down on it before having a stunned look on her face, she then questions why the taste is so terrible. He tells her it should at least be alright since everyone back in Angeli two years ago said that he cooked well. She then nervously asks who said it was good as he says the soldiers did. The soldiers all told him they loved his cooking. Alice lets out a light laugh while losing all her color. He tells her to let him try so he can make it better but she tells him no as it is dangerous. She then tells him not to worry as she has experience cooking. She notes she won't be able to make a stew but adding some seasoning and cooking the raw parts again will be good enough as she sees Lyndon had brought all sorts of things. The fire starts crackling again as Alice recooks the food. Lyndon later says it's delicious and is shocked at how she could make this while outside. He asks for her to teach him her method as Alice gets surprised that Lyndon wants to learn how to cook. She says she guesses she could teach him once he visits her house. She tells him honestly she isn't that good at cooking but he says that she just told him she has a lot of experience at it. He then says it does not matter as he will learn how to cook himself when they return Londo so he can cook for her every day. This causes her to blush before saying she has to go check up on the rest of the meat. Narrator interjection but I don't think she should be happy after hearing him say that. At the fire the meat continues to roast as she notes how cooking for one another is what married couples do. She then realizes that she's never seen him be picky with food and wonders what kind of food he likes. Footsteps can be seen as the two can now be seen marching before it turns night time, and the pair lean on one another as they sleep. 
Morning returns in the mountains as Alice wonders how much further they will have to go. Lyndon then stops and tells her to hold on. He then reaches and pulls out a telescope to look into the distance to see a banged up Louis. He notes the Republic has found their trail as Alice gets shocked and he tells her that Louis seems to be leading the tracking team himself. He notes how persistent this guy is and how he should have killed him back then before telling Alice this will be tough, but their pace has to quicken. He tells her to hang on a little longer as they will leave the Republic territory in a day as she tells him yes. They then start to dash before they run into soldiers who shouts it's the Iron Prince. The soldiers tell everyone to prepare to fire and kill the pair as Louis ordered and to fire on his signal. Loud bangs can be heard as Lyndon covers Alice using his cape. He starts to feel dizzy from the use of his powers before noting he must protect her at all costs. He then starts to dash with her as the enemy continues to fire shouting to get the pair. Louis asks if they found the Iron Prince to which a soldier says yes they did. He tells them good job and chuckles before saying to kill them both. The soldiers ask if Louis is sure as they could still try and capture the pair to which Louis says yes he is sure. Louis then says that if the pair are still alive once he gets there then his soldiers will be the dead ones. Someone asks a captain if it is alright to leave like this. The captain says of course not as the other man then asks why are they going then since he recalls the marshal telling them to be on standby. The captain tells him they are disobeying orders as the man shouts what. The captain tells the other guy they are the proud rifle knights of the empire and that they are going to save their lord. Len says they are saving the crown prince and the future empress and that he will take responsibility for disobeying orders but first wants to fulfill his duty as a royal knight. He tells his men to move out as they say yes sir. As they gallop he internally tells Lyndon to wait for him and then thinks about his sister before hoping his dear sister does not get hurt. Back at the mountains the Republic soldiers have found the pair and shout to kill on sight. Lyndon then uses a move called Void Creation which causes damage to the soldiers. The bangs continue as the Republic fires their weapons. Later we see Lyndon huffing and puffing. He then starts to cough up blood as Alice shouts in worry and he tells her he is alright. Alice grits her teeth and tells him he cannot go on like this and to escape by himself to which he says that is ridiculous. She tells him she does not want this as he asks her what. She tells him he is hurt and in pain and she hates the fact that he may die here and pleads with him to leave her and run. Lyndon calls Alice's name before someone says it's been a while to Prince Lyndon. He turns to see a guy who says they have not babbled since in Angeli. Lyndon notes this is the three knights and notes each are on par with Hugo and he is exhausted right now. The man pulls his sword and says they will now begin. Lyndon tells Alice to stand back as she protests before he tells her to hurry before pushing her far away from the battle. He is staggering as she shouts for his highness before he starts to dash forward and clash with the knight. The other knights then start to jump in while Lyndon is still busy fighting the first. Alice is worried about his highness as Lyndon notes he does not have much fight left and needs to end this in one hit despite the risk. His hand shakes as he notes he might not make it but it should buy enough time for Alice to get away. He then activates his mind break move on the knights as they all start to struggle and grab their heads. Lyndon continues to breathe heavily before gritting his teeth and uses a spatial slash which strikes all three of the enemy soldiers. As he continues to pant the three fall to the floor before coughing up even more blood as Alice rushes toward him. She grabs him and then starts to ask something before Lyndon tells her they are almost there and need to just cross the canyon. He starts to tell Alice she should go as Alice tells his highness not to leave her and pleads with him. A rustle can be heard as the barrel of a weapon can be seen. One of the down knights points it at the pair as he mutters for the Iron Prince to die and Alice says no. A loud bang can be heard as Lyndon's eyes open wide. Alice is hugging Lyndon as she shields him with her body. Horror comes across Lyndon's face as he turns to the fallen soldier and slices him apart. He asks Alice why as he shouts no. Alice tells herself she was able to block it and what a relief that is. She then tells Lyndon that she needs to tell him something. Her eyes drop as she starts to talk about him and her before Lyndon in tears shouts Alice's name. He pleads with her to wake up as he continues to shout for her. Lyndon is trudging across the ice and breathing heavily as he carries Alice on his back. He pleads with her to stay with him and says she wanted to tell him something so please live to tell him. He also mentions that she'd want her emblem back right. He pants as he notes they will leave the Republic if they cross the canyon and tells her to hang on a little more. There someone tells them that they knew he was coming this way. It is Louis with his whole army behind him as he calls for the Iron Prince. Horror again comes over Lyndon's face. Louis says it's impressive he made it this far and wonders how many men Lyndon took out before asking if the lady with the lamp is dead and what a pity that is. His soldiers ready their weapon as Louis tells Lyndon this is the end of the line. 
Louis tells him it's time to end this once and for all. Lyndon notes that he does not mind dying but he just doesn't want Alice to. He says please before someone shouts that they found it as Louis and his men turn in shock. Louis asks who said that as his men tell him over there. Lyndon recognizes that voice and sees Michael floating like a god. He calls Lyndon silly as he used a strong mind break on him so he was not ready that time and that Lyndon intentionally left him in a humid prison knowing Mill hates mold and bugs. Lyndon asks how he got here to which Mill says he just came. He tells Lyndon he'll handle things here and to go ahead. Lyndon says thanks as Mill tells him no problem. He then tells Mill to make sure to come back alive and this is in order. Mill is a little stunned before he asks if Lyndon is serious to which Lyndon says he is. Lyndon turns to go and tells Mill to be ready when they get back as he is going straight back into prison. Mill notes that Lyndon really is stubborn even to the end. Louis shouts at his men to stop them as Mill descends to the ground asking if they really think he'll let them go. He says he's thought about this moment for a while. He draws his weapon saying he does not know about the others but he personally wants to kill Louis now that he's got the chance. Louis then starts to flinch before asking if Mill thinks he can hit him from over there. Mill tells Louis the bullet will not reach him but only a normal bullet that is as he fires his weapon and eyes start to flash yellow. The bullet heads straight for Louis's head before piercing right through as he screams. His men shout for their leader and then turn to Michael in anger as Michael swings his sword. He tells the soldiers that he'll kill anybody who crosses this line and that he's not as soft as his brother as he gets things done despite his gentle appearance. He then recalls seeing Alice on his brother's shoulder before letting the soldiers know that he is very angry at the moment. He tells them to prepare themselves if they wish to come this way as he will be very rough. Blood drips on the snow as Lyndon says only a little further and tells Alice to stay with him. He then hears someone talk to Fabian asking why he thinks the Iron Prince will come this way as Louis should have taken care of him already. Fabian tells the man that they should just hold this line as his majesty ordered. Lyndon then hides in a bush wondering what he should do before a rustle can be heard as Fabian now comes across the bush. Lyndon and Fabian now stare eye to eye at one another. Fabian then turns to tell his men the weather is cold lately as one of his men starts to talk about how it should be spring now in pairs. Lyndon wonders if the guy did not see them but then surely recalls their eyes meeting. Fabian continues to talk to his men telling the guy he is right and that the Iron Prince and Lady with the Lamp would never come here. He tells his men that they have not gotten to rest yet since they've been waiting here the whole time and tells them to go over there to rest. The man asks what about Fabian to which Fabian says he'll stay here to reorganize his thoughts. Fabian then lets out a sigh of relief before telling Lyndon that it would be better to take a horse from here. Lyndon asks if Fabian is helping him to which Fabian says yes. Lyndon says thanks as Fabian tells him it is nothing before the horse starts to bolt away. Lyndon wonders why a commanding officer is showing kindness but notes he has no time to refuse. As he gallops away he recalls the guy's name was Fabian. Fabian stands alone, noting that he cannot let the lady die here. As the horse continues to gallop Lyndon continues to breathe heavily before his eyes get blurry. He can barely see but it seems a group of men are riding towards him. He cannot tell if they are enemy or ally before they get closer and Len shouts for his highness and Alice. Lyndon then sighs as he tells them they are late. Back in the forest Mill deflects a grenade as it explodes on the enemy. The enemy says this cannot be as Mill tells them it's no use and reminds them to not cross the line as he will let them live. He notes that this is exhausting as he tires faster using his powers and notes that the two should be far enough away by now, and that he's worked hard so nothing bad should happen to Lies. He grips his sword noting she has to be okay. He notes he should be getting ready to leave this place soon. The hospital door is busted in as the staff shout after seeing Alice and the Prince. They shout to hurry and get ready to operate as Lyndon tells them to save her at all costs. They tell Lyndon that he also needs help as well before he shouts back saying he's fine and to worry about Alice first. A doctor says her condition is critical and needs to be operated on immediately before Lyndon asks who will lead the operation to which Dr. Fallen tells his highness that he will. Lyndon says you before Fallen tells him yes. Lyndon then grabs his hand to Dr. Fallen's shock before Lyndon begs him to please save her. He is near tears as he tells Fallen that he will reward him with anything so please save her. Fallen pulls Lyndon's hands away and tells him that his wish is the same as that of his highness and everyone else here. He tells Lyndon that he will for sure save her. In the room Alice lays in the sick and fallen in surgery uniform apologizes for what happened to her. He then squeezes his gloves on and says that he will save her with his own hands. Evening passes and night time sets in at the hospital. Lyndon sits outside the operating room with his head face to the ground. A creak can then be heard at the door before Lyndon jolts upright immediately. He asks how Alice is as the marshal pleads with him to calm down. 
The nurse tells him the operation was successful as no important nerves were harmed due to fallen carefully leading the operation and Alice's wound will not scar as long as it's treated well. She then says everything went well but there was one problem to which Lyndon asks what. She tells him that Alice lost a lot of blood and they supplemented it with fluids but there's a limit. Alice has too low hemoglobin meaning not enough oxygen is getting to her organs. She continues that at this rate she may die from the complications that come from too much blood loss which makes Lyndon stand in shock. Lyndon thinks about how Alice may die before staggering causing the marshal to hold him. Fallen walks out the door saying there is a way to save her which makes Lyndon angrily ask what it is. He tells Lyndon that they should discuss this inside the room. Fallen tells him they could do a blood transfusion which he says is a method to move blood from a donor to a patient. It is very dangerous as it has a high chance of failing and that Alice will surely die if it fails. Lyndon asks why it is dangerous to which Fallen says it's because her body may reject foreign blood with a reaction, and that when this method was tested before the mortality rate was 50%. Alice had actually found a solution to this earlier which is mixing blood outside the body before transfusion. Thanks to this it would mean little chance of rejection but the issue is they have not found any blood that matches with Alice and they have been collecting samples from healthy soldiers and none have worked. He says if they can find one that matches they will inject it for the moment and if a rejection occurs there is nothing they can do. Fallen wonders if Alice knows why this is the case as he feels she knows the answer to this but right now he needs to find a solution without her help. Lyndon slams the wall as he begs Fallen to help her and use any method he wants to find a match. Fallen says he will do his best before we see Alice laying in the sick as Lyndon stands over her and watches. He wishes it was he who was laying there instead of her and if he could give her his blood he'd give it all. Even if he dies as long as she lives it's fine before he stops and realizes something. He turns and asks the staff why they are not testing his blood to which one guy says Lyndon is not in the condition to donate and that his blood probably is not a match anyways. Lyndon tells them it's fine if it fails and to just test anyways. He notes to her that it would be a miracle if his blood matches but he wants to try every last thing he can to save her. Narrator interjection but if Lyndon keeps talking like this I might fall in love with him myself. Dude is really starting to riz up the narrator now. He then notes that if his blood matches then the two of them may be fated to overcome even miracles together. Lyndon later sees the two guys working on something as one asks why the blood is not clumping together. They wonder if it needs more time and decide to check it again. Lyndon hears silence for a moment before the guy says there is no blood rejection at all. He shouts thank goodness and calls this a miracle. Lyndon asks if his blood is a match and they tell him he is right. He then asks if this means Alice can live. They tell Lyndon he is in no condition to donate and even though he is standing he is in serious condition to which Lyndon tells him that this does not matter. He tells them to begin the transfusion even as they protest. They then tell him to let them know if he starts feeling worse at least. He tells them he will and notes to himself that as long as Alice lives he will do this a thousand if not a million times over. We later see Alice in the sick letting out breaths before Lyndon is seen asking if she is getting better. The guy tells Lyndon it was successful and that Alice blushed after the blood flowed through so she will get better. Lyndon smiles as he tells the guy this is great. Lyndon then starts staggering as the boy shouts your highness. Lyndon falls to the floor with a thud as the boy shouts for him to open his eyes and calls for others to help get Lyndon carried to the bed. Narrator interjection but I hope Alice wakes up and can use mind break like Lyndon. In a forest a soldier shouts who goes there before someone says come on and that it's just him. Mill is groaning saying he's home and asking why it was so hard to find his way here. The soldier says Prince Michael before Mill says yes that is him and he says he heard about Alice and Lyndon from another base and tells the soldier to prepare a bath for him and some food. The man who arrested Mill before says he heard Mill did a great deed and will be rewarded. The man then mentions that Lyndon has ordered something before that though as Mill asks what in confusion. Mill then says wait as reality sets in on him and the other man is beaming with a smile. The man tells Mill it is time for jail as Mill calls this nonsense as he just saved Lyndon to which the man says to not worry as Mill will be kept in a clean cell this time. An attack is going down at the naval port in the south of the Krim Peninsula. Someone notes that based on the flag it is the Empire's third fleet and wonders what it is doing here. More explosions can be heard as the Empire soldiers later note they have taken the fort. A man says good and that they will proceed with Lyndon's orders. From this moment onwards the third fleet set out to take all strategic points in the south of Simferpol. Later at the hospital Lyndon opens his eyes and flutters wondering if he had collapsed before turning to see Alice lay across from him. He smiles as he says thank goodness and sits up while still in pain. He walks over calling her name as he recalls she needed to tell him something. 
He wonders what she wanted to say before grabbing her hand telling her to please wake up soon and tell him what she was going to say. He also notes that she must take this emblem back as well. He also notes that he still has a lot of places and things he wants to do with her so he pleads for her to open her eyes. He then hears the words your highness as he stares in shock. He shouts her name as she has awakened. She tells him she had a dream and it was a long and horrible nightmare. She tells him that it is fine now though because she knows. She tells him she had something she wanted to say to him and apologizes because she could not do it then. He grabs her hand telling her it is alright and to just rest some more. He tells her to sleep tight and that she will not have any more nightmares as her eyes droop and she says just for a little bit. He then sits and watches over her as she sleeps. Later in the day the door creaks open as some men walk into the room. It is Alice's family who greets his highness. Lyndon says Lord Clarence before Alice's father rushes in the room and grabs his daughter's hand. He is teary-eyed before Lyndon apologizes saying that this is his fault. Her father says that is not true as he knows what Lyndon has done for her and says he must be thanking Lyndon. He blames himself as he believes he should have been the one to stop her from going to battle. He then tells Lyndon that he will be taking Alice now and will not let her stay in this conflict any longer. Lyndon stands shocked before saying he may do so before her father says the doctor says it is alright to leave with her now. A horse-drawn carriage is seen waiting outside as her father asks Lyndon to be excused. They then ride off as Lyndon notes he did not get to hear what she wanted to say and that he must end this conflict as soon as possible. He stares at the tree noting it is spring now and wonders if things will be different when they meet in Londo again. He stands in the shade saying he hopes so. A time skip occurs and Lyndon's army was aggressive and took all strategic points in the Krim Peninsula apart from the capital. With the Republic isolated in Simferpol with no supply line they were unable to continue fighting when summer came around. The hot summer passed and with autumn near the Franchins Republic President Simon Nicholas suggested a peace settlement which ended the conflict. Due to this loss Simon Nicholas' reputation fell in the Republic. Back in Londo it is now snowing. A lady asks if a man is leaving to which Chris says yes and asks how did she know. She tells him she knows since today is the day Karin's bakery specialty cake is in stock and asks if he should hurry before they are sold out. She is dejected saying she wishes she had an older brother like him as her own brothers are always trying to get her. She also notes that if she had a younger sister like his she would adore her as well. Chris says he will be heading out now as the lady asks if he is transferring to another workplace soon as well. A book is tapped on the table as he says yes as he will soon be working as Prince Lyndon's secretary. Carrying a box of pastries through the streets Chris wonders if Alice will get mad at him for buying her this again. Someone welcomes him back home before he asks if Lies is not here yet. The man tells him that it is an official holiday for her today so she never left the house. A loud sound can be heard as Chris turns and starts running through the stairs towards Lies. He walks in as he hears her shout stop that. Alice tells Yulian that it is too cold as Yulian tells Alice that she started it first though. With snowballs in her hand she tells Alice to come here. Chris clears his throat at the two friends as Alice shouts his name. He brushes the snow off her hair asking who told her to play outside when it's this cold and that she may get sick again. Alice argues that Yulian is finally visiting for once. Chris turns to see Yulian as Yulian flinches before he tells her it has been a while. She tells him it has and that he's back early. Chris notes Yulian is still uncomfortable with him as she is the eldest and next in line for the child of family making her their biggest rival and enemy. He also notes that Lyndon and Michael will soon wage a cold conflict which will make relations strain even further. Yulian then tells Chris that for his information Alice started it and not her. Chris nervously says Alice's name before she tells him it was just a small prank. He then tells them whatever and to get inside as he brought cake to which Alice says yay. Inside the house Yulian notes Liza's tea tastes like the ones brewed in the east, and that she personally cannot brew it like this and calls Alice perfect. Alice is bashful as she says Yulian's name. Yulian notes that there are actually many things about Alice she is amazed at and recalls there was a man in the administration called the Revolver who adores her. It was the aristocrats who called him that and he pushed for many policies that made people suffer. It was Chris de Clarence as she sipped her tea. Alice asks if there is something wrong to which Yulian says it is nothing. Yulian then calls Alice she is amazing and notes Alice was offered the lead professor role in the Royal Cross which is the best hospital in the empire and is also the court medical consultant. Alice is oh before noting she was surprised as well and notes that it is true his majesty is unwell. Earlier his majesty says it is great that she is the court doctor and that Lyndon has been requesting for him to give Alice a present. He tells her this has never been done before and may take a while due to the laws. Alice sits sipping tea wondering what the gift from Lyndon could be. 
Yulian notes that Alice being a lead professor at the Royal Cross will make many famous doctors object as Alice is a lady to which Alice says some people are just like that. She tells Yulian it is alright as she is used to this. She notes some doctors are displeased by her presence but notes that she will work hard so this displeasure disappears over time. Yulian then says that she should get going now. Yulian says she has been here for a while and should go now as Alice asks if she will come again. Yulian says she can but Alice is the one always busy and that she barely managed to get a day off today. Alice tells her she shall contact Yulian on her days off. As Alice whimpers Yulian notes she is just like a puppy. Yulian agrees to visit again but says she wonders if Alice will even have the time to see her next time. Yulian says this is due to Lyndon finally returning home and talks about how it has been 10 months and asks if Alice misses him. Yulian tells her how the story about Lyndon rescuing her risking his own life when she was a prisoner is causing the people to call him a romantic. Alice starts to blush before Yulian stares at her and noting to herself how jealous she is. Not the bad kind of jealous by the way. She tells lies she will be off as Alice says see you. Alice is then seen standing outside in the yard and she thinks about the prince. She notes that before she would only get nightmares about him executing her but lately she has only seen him smiling so brightly in her dreams. This causes her to smile to herself as she notes she wants to see him soon. Alice in uniform says and that's it. Another staff member says they will finish up here to which Alice asks if this is the last patient. The girl says yes and tells Alice they are done before Alice tells them good job and that she will leave the rest to them. Other hospital staff members talk about how well Alice did the operations and call her methods works of art. They then wonder if she will quit being a doctor once married to Lyndon to which the other calls it a pity. Alice alone starts to stretch as she has just finished writing her letters to Len and Mill. She notes her brother has never once written back to her even though Mill always replies. She then says the next letter is for Lyndon and her heart starts to beat. She starts to write the letter and talks about how the weather is cold in Londo and asks him how it is in the Crim Peninsula. She then stops and thinks about how bland it is to ask how is the weather. She wonders if she can say it in a more elegant way. She then says that it snowed here and did you get tons of snow before saying this sounds even worse. She wonders why she is so bad at writing and says it's terrible that she can't even send him a letter. She notes it's been like this the whole time as she still has not sent him a letter or even sent him a reply to his letters. She thinks about what he said in those letters asking her if she is taking care of herself and saying that they shall meet soon. She also thinks he is probably wondering why he is the only one to not receive any letters from her yet. She tells herself this is not on purpose and that she just cannot write to him before she has a light bulb moment. She wonders what if she just sends a present rather than a letter and that she has knitted him a sweater thinking he might be cold over there. She then turns to see the sweater is in tatters before she grumbles about how bad she is at making things and decides to write a perfect letter this time. Side note but I thought she was good with tools. Knox can be heard as she tells them to come in. It is Sir Vant who says he has a message from His Majesty. His Majesty is requesting to see her as he has something to tell Alice. Alice stands puzzled before arriving at the palace and saying greetings to His Majesty. His Majesty notes that he seems to have summoned her while she was busy. She tells him not at all before asking how he is doing to which he says better thanks to the medicine she recommended. Alice wonders what he is suffering from apart from diabetes as there are no symptoms apart from him being tired all the time. She does suspect some diseases that may be the cause. It could be an immune disorder, an endocrine disease, or a blood disease, but she cannot be sure as she does not have tests to diagnose this in this time period. His Majesty asks if she is curious to why he asked her here before he says this is about that gift and notes that she has no clue how much he had to argue with the executive officer for this. She is confused before His Majesty says he'd like to ask her something before that. He asks her in the future what kind of empress she wishes to be. Alice thinks for a moment before saying she is not fit to be an empress. His Majesty is confused as Alice notes to herself what she did in the past was her own fault. She also notes to herself that she has to give up her favorite job to be the empress but has already made up her mind. She says that since she is not fit to be an empress so she will of course try her very best. She will not forget about her flaws and always give it her best effort. She says she will be an empress of the people and never put herself above others. She also says she wishes to be the first lady that makes the empire extremely proud. In her mind she is not confident but knows she will try very hard. His majesty laughs as he says this is what he expected of the lady with the lamp and calls her admirable. He then calls her name to which she says yes. He apologizes to her about everything up until now and how he pushed for the marriage without her opinion. He tells her he just wanted to welcome her to the family but this was not a just reason for what he did. 
He tells her that due to this he has chosen to prepare this gift and tells her to read it. Some rustles can be heard as Alice stands in shock having read it. It was a letter trying to revise legislation to allow the Empress to hold another job only if it does not clash with her duties as an Empress. His Majesty says he did not come up with this but Lyndon did and that he himself changed his mind after seeing Alice's work in the Crim Peninsula. His Majesty personally does not want her to be a doctor but does not want to tie her down this place when she has a passion and it is also what wishes to do the most. Alice is blushing as she realizes that they changed the law of the land just for her. She covers her mouth with the letter as she happily notes she is able to continue being a doctor. Narrator interjection here but ladies, make sure to get yourself a man that changes the law just for you. Alice smiles with tears in her eyes noting that this was from him. Yes Lyndon is officially him. His Majesty asks if Alice likes the gift to which she says she does and she then tells him it is more valuable than any jewel in the world which prompts the Emperor to let out a smile as well. He tells her this is good to hear and that he shall see her tomorrow as he is getting tired now to which Alice tells him to rest well. Later in his bedroom he pulls out a frame in the cupboard. He holds it up asking if she is doing well and that he misses her. He calls her his dear as we see a picture of his former wife. He says that following that day of tragedy he has never been able to be happy ever since. He tells Evelyn that he is sorry and apologizes to Lyndon as well thinking he himself could have been better. His Majesty's only regret now is that he has no way of stopping the tragedy that will occur between Michael and Lyndon. Later in a different city we see someone holding a pen. It is Lyndon who says he can finally leave all this snow behind. He wonders when he will get to see Alice again. He also wonders how she is doing as there is a knock at the door. It is Len who asks if he may come in to which Lyndon says yes. Len is here to report that both units of the rifle knightage are ready to return and that is all. Len then says your highness as Lyndon gives him a stare. Lyndon then asks if Len has received a letter from Alice to which he says he did and questions why Lyndon asks. Lyndon then starts to act childish wondering why she hasn't sent him anything and tells Len to bring his letter. Lyndon wants to quote and quote inspect all mail that comes to the military base for suspicious information. Len acts serious and says he understands. Later Lyndon is seen reading the letter which asks Len if it is as cold in the peninsula as it is in Londo. Lyndon notes that her messy handwriting is so cute and sees that she has written that she is doing well. The letter also mentions Chris is doing well to which Lyndon notes Chris the younger brother is better than the one standing in front of Lyndon. He then finally gets to the part where she wrote about Lyndon which makes his heart beat. Silence ensues as he reads it. Later he is sad as she doesn't really talk about him that much before asking if Len wrote back. Len asks if he has to do so which makes Lyndon angry since Len is getting the letters that Lyndon longs for but Len chooses to not even write back. Lyndon then asks if Len is off duty today to which Len says yes and then Lyndon invites him out for some whiskey. Len asks if Lyndon is asking to drink with him to which Lyndon says it's been a while. Lyndon asks if he hates the idea to which Len nervously says not at all. He then says that he can only drink half a mug of beer. Later we see that he lets out a loud snore as he lays red in the face in bed. Lyndon notes that he collapsed after only a few drinks and also notes that he looks like Alice when he sleeps like this. Low-key kind of sus. Lyndon notes that since Len is like this now he can go try and find the other letter. Later in the night Lyndon walks through the building and hears some noise from a room. He wonders if this is the place as he hears a bunch of people talking about drinking. He then walks in and stands over them before one of them asks what Prince Lyndon is doing here. Nil puts his head up and says brother. He then drunkenly tells Lyndon he hasn't done anything and doesn't want to go to jail to which Lyndon says he is not here to punish him. Mill then asks what it is he wants before Lyndon smiles and tells him to have a drink together. Mill lets out a hiccup as he is shocked and says what. Mill asks what is wrong as Lyndon would not drink with him for no reason to which Lyndon says there is no special reason. Mill notes vodka tastes like saju which confuses Lyndon to which Michael says it is an eastern liquor and he misses it. Lyndon asks if he has to travel east again to which Mill says he will later but with Alice which causes Lyndon to twitch a bit. He questions Mill for saying this and says it's not funny to which Mill says he is not joking as she promised to go with him. He also notes that they are not only going to Ching but the Great Lakes as well. Lyndon tells Mill to stop lying. Mill says it's true and for Lyndon to just ask her in a letter if he wants to verify. He then teases Lyndon as he notes that Lyndon hardly gets any letters right. Mill then says he got one two days ago from Alice. Mill laughs as Lyndon tells him to shut up. He then continues to tell Mill to drink as Mill calls this harassment and Lyndon says it's just a toast from the commander. Mill says to not lie and that Lyndon is pouring this with ill intentions to which Lyndon asks if he wants to go to jail again. 
Mill asks if Lyndon is being serious and if Lyndon knows how many times they've sent him to jail already. Mill then lets out a laugh and notes they have not talked like this in a while, and that it is entertaining. He calls Lyndon's name as Lyndon has the usually constipated face. Mill then asks what Lyndon would do if Mill confesses to Alice. Lyndon is silent before angrily telling Mill to bet his life. Mill smiles at this before Lyndon calls his name again and asks if Mill is willing to give it up and that he is not talking about Alice. Mill is shocked before saying how could he as she is his mother. Lyndon then says he understands before Mill asks how Lyndon feels now about it to which Lyndon says he feels the same way. Mill then smiles before asking Lyndon to pour another glass. The sun flashes over Londo as a maid tells Alice Lyndon will be arriving soon which makes Alice's heart beat. The maid asks if the sweater and scarf are for Lyndon to which Alice says she has to throw them away. The maid asks if she really will do that since she spent so much time on them and notes to herself Lyndon would like anything Alice gives him. Alice asks Marie if she could come with her to the dress shop which gets Marie excited. Marie asks if this is for Lyndon to which Alice says no and it's because her clothes are worn out. Marie says okay and says they will get the most beautiful dress for Alice. At the hospital someone named Lord Lanth has requested for Alice to do a surgery as Rosedale Hospital said they cannot treat him. Alice is shocked as normally aristocrats avoid getting treated by Alice. She asks what kind of surgery to which Fallen says it is a cardiac cancer of the stomach. She notes this will not be easy due to its proximity to the esophagus and looks at her schedule to see when she's available. She then notes that it is full but cannot be postponed for long. She does have one open day but it is the day Lyndon arrives. She notes that there is nothing she can do and will operate on him in the morning and make it in time to welcome Lyndon. She tells Fallen to schedule it for this day as Fallen notices the date himself. Alice says it can't be helped and Alice says she does not think she'll be late. Fallen alone rustles through the paper before noting he has always wanted to be a professor at the Royal Cross. He was scouted for his efforts in the battle and notes that he is happy he can continue to see Alice's skill in person. He notes that since Lyndon is coming back all he can do is watch them from afar. At sea we see Lyndon noting that they will be arriving soon and wonders what took so long. 